Mala Mala ma campo buda I want, yes, I've already sent you the list. I, I, I've omitted, I want to talk. I want to begin to talk. Good morning. Uh, we're all happy that you are able to join us. Good morning. Um, we are all happy that you are able to join us.
Suppose you are asleep. No, where is where is the rest of the participants? Oh, well, Professor, you should be good to go now. Now, where is the rest of the participants, the, the presenters? They have to appear. I, I'll get them on now. Please, um, welcome. We will um, do all sorts of um, opening protocol at 9 o'clock uh, when the keynote will be given. We know that for some of you, the time is too early. Uh, we apologize. This is just to make sure that we can get everyone involved. Uh, we have presenters in this panel. Monty Lee Rice from Asia Pacific, Pacific Theological Seminary. Abibiano from Osmania University, Ajesaje from University of Bonn, Buruya Mohamed, who is joining us from Emi Abdekada University, Chamakanda, the College of Theology at Yonsei University. It's my pleasure to introduce the chair of this panel Professor Sajis Kamga, who is a law professor and a scholar of human rights from the University of South Africa, UNISA in Pretoria. His job is to manage your time to slot everybody in the presenters in one and a half hours and to allow us time to answer questions. He has to agree with the five speakers, the time allotted to them, and ensure that they keep the time. Welcome. Uh, so I've seen um, Montele Rice, Ajay. Uh, where are the other presenters? Are they here? Abebe? Is Mohammed here, please? Mohammed? What about Kaunda? I think I saw Kaunda. Yeah. So we be, we're very good. This is a very successful panel. Uh, let me hand over to you, uh, Professor Sajis Kamga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, great one. Uh, it is indeed an honor and privilege to be chairing this specific panel at this great conference the Nimi Wariboko Conference. Uh, I was already introduced. Serge Kamga is my name, uh, based at the Tabumbeke School of Public and International Affairs here at the University of South Africa. Uh, as mentioned by our great professor Falola, uh, we have five speakers uh, in this panel. Uh, we have a uh, 15 minutes each and we will take after each presenter we will take five minutes for questions we'll look at the questions that are in the chat box uh, we will not delay for more than five minutes for questions and we will stick to time so Forgive me if you go beyond 15 minutes, I will have no choice but to stop you because we need to keep to time to enable other panels to, to take place. So without further ado, I would like to start with the first presenter who is uh, Monte Rice, uh, coming all the way from the Philippines. Over to you, sir, thank you. 15 minutes starts now. Oh, um, hello, sir. Is, um, sorry, you need to click on the unmute button yeah. on your screen. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Can, can I be heard? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Nimi Wariboko and Toyan Poilola for having me on board for this historic event. I also want to thank coordinator Anna Lee Carruthers for all her kind help and fellow participants and audience. Thank you for uh, being with us in spite of our diverse time zones. I am encouraged by everyone's presence here. Working from the, within the Pentecostal tradition, I want to provide a critical review of Nimi Warabako's book, The Split God uh, and Critical Theory, The Split God, Pentecostalism and Critical Theory, with the aim of advancing his ethical implications of a split God via Richard Kearney's sacramental, uh, or rather anatheistic sacramentality. And I hope to do so in a way that contributes to this panel's theme on critical analysis of religion and economics using insights from continental critical theory, especially Marxist Lanconian psychoanalysis approaches to philosophy of religion. Warren Barkle's Split God book provides Pentecostal scholars an innovative diagnostic description of three integrated dynamics he identifies within world Pentecostalism. Number one, uh, daily social existence and perceived needs for flourishing within the context of what Warabogo calls the fragile making of global capitalism. Second, the resultant apparatus of Pentecostal everyday practices. Uh, this term apparatus from philosopher Giorgio Agaben, uh, he defines as anything that orientates or shapes the behaviors uh, or discourse of a people. So I suggest theologically we can liken that to the cultural linguistic ethos of a religious community that shapes our religious experience. And then finally, number three, how these two dynamics, they fund the Pentecostal split notion of God. Now, I believe that this summarizes Mario Barco's broad theme, uh, how it projects a Pentecostal philosophy of God that he calls through his split God model. So he shows how insights of several critical theorists, uh, Giorgio Agaben, Jacques Slakien, Slavok Sazik, Alain Badu, uh, identify and assess the nature problems yet also emancipatory promise of Pentecostalism as a social movement with quote unquote, he says, revolutionary subversive potential. And hence he refers to the healing substance that we can apply to the fragmenting challenges of human differences that plague our world today. Um, Laura Barco concedes that cultural despisers of religion, uh, they may dismiss this vision, but he shows how we can tease out a healing excess that capacitates people for a radical love towards others, especially those we find so monstrously different from us. Let me delineate Robert Barco's idiom, split God, he thus analyzes Pentecostalism through the split concept that substantially characterizes psychoanalytic social criticism operating within historic critical theory. Its basic meaning refers to an infant's trauma, traumatic experience of gapping psychic fracture when realizing that it's self-identity separate from one's nursing mother, thus also perceived as split. And this inaugurates a lifelong desire 
and patent ways of life in hope that this lost union be restored. I believe this briefly summarizes uh, the conceptual premise that critical theory taps on when retrieving Laconian psychoanalysis for social critical uh, critique. And like Warren Barkle, I value this prognosis towards human existence within what he calls the ever new uh, desire inducing machinery of global capitalism. Because it resonates, I believe, with Christian intuitions that we are intrinsically desiring uh, creatures, yet through the, the, the trauma of loss, our, our loves are disordered. And Waterbargo argues that late capitalism interpolates us as consuming subjects of desire, soliciting us to ever new perverse and excessive desires for its marketed products. Yet he radically revises this split concept into a cold word that summarizes the microism of Pentecostalism worldwide what the practices of West African Pentecostals theologically express how they perceive God and the God-human relation. Um, now, also funding this revision is Sazik's earlier conception of God as split through the crucifixion of Christ, thus sacrificially distributing transcendence within imminence. And so tapping on Suzette's partial organs metaphor, Warren Barco explains how West Africans perceive, or West African Pentecostal, uh, perceive God as availing to us his attributes as a decentralized network of detached yet working parts and hence God's miraculous powers that we may consume for our daily needs and flourishing. Now, I also believe that describing God and the God-human relation as split, it really means theologically positing, as Pentecostal theologians have earlier concluded, a deeply passable, eminently nuanced doctrine of God. And moreover, if I'm reading him right, split intimates the crucial role of human action for divine cause towards creation. Now, because uh, we got 15 minutes, I think I'm going to jump ahead. Um, Warren Barkle, drawing on the, uh, the, the work of uh, Frankfurt, um, Frank, post-Frankfurt School critical theorist John Fisk, Warren Barkle notes how Pentecostals are especially adept at reworking theological texts handed down from, quote unquote, the pulpit industry into what he calls text flesh, meaning everyday practices, everyday theology for practical needs. I find myself most enamored by how Warren Barkle likens it to, quote unquote, the divided garments of Messiah at Calvary. Thus, he argues that Pentecostals perceive God not as transcendentally whole, but imminently split, uh, whereby we mobilize for our needs and desires, attributes, dimensions of God to our daily practices. Now, yet, through this Lanconian theme of unsatisfied joy science, Lord Barco, he addresses the problem with grassroots Pentecostals, namely how through their perception to split realities, they unwittingly become enslaved consumers to the desire-making machinery of global capitalism. Yet for this reason, Warren Barco argues, he prescriptively argues that at its best, Pentecostal worship Worship as pure means directs these desires rather from the instrumental logic of late capitalism to rather the glory of God. Yet the question is, what is the glory? 
As Robert Marco uh, explores in his concluding chapter, Ethical Implications of a Split God, this evocative question, it registers the ethical import of Pentecostal spirituality towards today's uh, polarizing challenges of human difference. Because he argues that whether they recognize it or not, the Pentecostal perception into a fractured universe and the God human relation, it actually calls them and us and all humanity to a will to embrace the stranger before us. Now, inspiring Warrebacher is Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenwig's theology of the exiled glory of God. In manners that also perceive the canonic grace of God operative or, or splits within God. Now, Rosenwig, he reiterates themes that are common within Jewish mystical themes, namely how the exiled glory of God in first fractures, splits within God and all creation, and redemptively healing these splits affects the union that we may call to draw on a Jewish theme, the coming glory. I therefore suggest we might further explicate the ethical vision of Demi Warabarkal through another converging stream within post-continental philosophy of religion, namely Richard Kearney's anatheistic sacramentuality. Now, Kirby proffers a materialist hermeneutic that hospitably discerns the eschaton within the actual flesh of daily life. And similar to Jewish philosopher Eric Satner's cycle theology of neighbors that we find strange before us, which funds Warren Barkle's book, especially, Kearney says, in those times of deciding whether to be hostile or hospitable to the other before us. Now this means on one hand discerning the painful unsettling fractures that cause us hostility towards those we find monstrous. And yet through this liminal healing insight comes possibly the deconstructive event of welcoming Messiah before us, causing messianic eruption, eventuating through us the shalomic promise of Pentecost. And I believe that this practice conceptualizes Warren Barkle's envisioned outcomes from the life-forming ethos of worship, Pentecostal worship, and how it should capacitate us for ethical, hospitable action. And yet Warren Barkle, he squarely surmises that before the imperial force of global capital or global capitalist consumer oriented liturgies, worship gradually functions as quote unquote a weak force with little chance of success. And yet, truth be told, Warren Barco is implicitly retrieving philosopher John Caputo's quote unquote theology of the event. Namely, how through the vocative power of sacred call, the kingdom of God summons us to messianically enact for the cause of suffering humanity, especially those strangely different from us, from all the toxic waste products of human progress, the just hospitality of God that we ourselves may enjoy. And yet I suspect that the deeper problem of Pentecostalism lies with how its apparatus, it substantially grounds its eschatological urgency within, I shall say, an otherworldly escapist psyche rooted in dispensationalist uh, rapture schemes and a sociology that is overly nuanced to life after death existence to an imbalanced exclusion of present life creational flourishing. And yet for this reason, I wager assistance from another aspect of Kearney's sacramentality, namely his micro-eschatology, 
to shift our discernment, our discerning gaze from the macro eschatology of apocalyptic ruptures to rather its more quiet yet evocative eruption that suffering human otherness promises on our way to glory. To conclude, let me speak directly to my fellow Pentecostals. If we're to best advance the full ethical promise emerging from our experience that God shares our fractured, split life, I suggest we liturgically recast our eschatological urgency and expectation by discerning within the neighbor before us, the strange one that we find so monstrously different, gateways to the kingdom of heaven, where the spirit of Jesus summons us and summons forth messianic urgency, commissioning us to action as we discern the coming glory exiled, yet calling us home through the stranger before us. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can you raise your chair where you are sitting? We can only see you to the nose. Aha, thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful presentation. A very powerful one. <clears throat> yeah, a very powerful presentation indeed. Uh, we are very happy to have listened to you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Rice. And I'm, I'm checking uh, if there is any question, no, just a comment uh, to just a comment. So uh, simply to congratulate you for your powerful presentation. Uh, without further ado, we should move to the next one that will be presented by Mr. Abe Ano, all the way from India. Thank you very much. Please over to you, sir. Hello. It's listen. Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Please. Okay. Go okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. First of all, I, I would like to thank us, Professor uh, Tayon uh, Fal Ola, and uh, his assistants uh, Anna uh, E, and uh, for their inviting and uh, organizing this. Uh, conference and uh, also welcome for participants of the conference. And by saying this, I would like to introduce my name. My name is Apeve Anno, uh, currently PhD student or scholar, research scholar, Osman University, India, uh, Department of uh, Social Science, uh, Department of History, uh, College of Social Science. Before I joined uh, university, a PhD program, I was uh, a lecturer in Asosa University College of Social Science, Ethiopia, uh, Northwestern Ethiopia. And I was graduated um, BA degree at Saba University in Ethiopia and Adama Science uh, and Technology University in Ethiopia also and uh, many years of experiences in teaching uh, in Ethiopian universities, particularly University of Olaga and Asosa in Northwestern Ethiopia and Western Ethiopia regions. Uh, today, uh, my presentation title is The Study on History of the Shinasha and Economic Life in Northwestern Ethiopia. Is that listenable? Shall I continue? 
Hello, hello, Professor, sir. Shall I continue? Yes, sir, I believe you. Continue, please. Continue. Oh, okay. Okay, well. okay. Yeah, then, um, I know this topic is also it's part of my PhD research work. Uh, entitled, the, as you have said, the study of uh, history of social, uh, the study on history of the Shinasha and economic life in the Northwestern Ethiopia. And under this topic, uh, the major, there is a debate, the debate on the, uh, the place of the Shinasha, this is the Shinasha society. Uh, are they shifting cultivators or not? And uh, Available historical literatures and anthropological uh, sources are debating different views. Uh, therefore, I uh, try to addressing these uh, issues and evaluate and uh, uh, explore uh, by raising uh, three basic questions, uh, research questions. The first one is uh, what was the economic activity of the Shinasa society? Second, uh, as a Shinasha is shifting cultivators or are the use as shifting cultivator or shifting cultivation as the economic basis or not? And the other is what were the of uh, uh, shifting cultivation on the Shinasha society in the Northwestern Ethiopia. Uh, and for this, uh, I will collect data uh, before uh, five to six months uh, with the local peoples uh, in the steady area and I try to uh, cross-check with existing available sources and try to analyze through qualitative methods. Uh, now, the, those people, you know, as, uh, as I've said, the main focus of this topic is about agricultural practice of the Shinasha society uh, in the north, in the state of Shangulgum's region or northwestern Ethiopia. Uh, you know, northwestern Ethiopia or the state of Shangulgum's region is one of the states, one of the regions in Ethiopia, in the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. In Ethiopia is one of the African countries in Eastern Africa or Horn of Africa. And among those states, northwestern Ethiopia region, particularly the state of Shangulgum's region, is one of them. And therefore, those people are living that indigenous people in that part of the country or in part of in that part of the region. Therefore, my focus, the state area is this Northwestern Ethiopia or the state of Shangulgum's region, particularly uh, four um, uh, district, districts, uh, Divati, Bulen, Dangur, and Wambara districts of that area. Therefore, the, those societies, or so the Shinasha let highlight those people, uh, the Shinasha Society is one of the uh, ethnic ma minorities in, in, in Ethiopia with having population of 60,587 population according to Ethiopian statistical data of 2007. And the language is belongs to uh, omotic, omotic speaking language and mostly found uh, in the northern parts of Ethiopia uh, and shared international boundary with uh, uh, Sudan. Uh, then, uh, as I said, uh, those people have the social shifting cultivation is uh, as a method or as economic method, uh, which is known by different names among different scholars and uh, with regarding to those uh, ethnic groups or the national society. Some say that they are they uh, they are uh, or. Uh, hoy agriculturalists, and they were also engaged on slash and burn agriculture system, uh, horticulture, crop rotation, and cropping follow. Uh, they were used one foot with another. Uh, therefore, different writers giving different explanations. Some were considering them as um, hunters or pastoralists. Therefore, which one is the real fact or the, the dominant prevailing among those people, of which economic base is more prevalent among those uh, society, which economic bases. Uh, that, that is uh, my, my point of uh, this uh, argument or this point, uh, this, uh, this article. Therefore, you know, the shifting cultivation is simply the, it is a system of cultivating that planters, plant, planting plotters, which are moved regularly from one farm area, one, one farm uh, land uh, to another uh, with, uh, in order to recovering 
for fertility of the soil. Uh, and uh, depending, this uh, shifting of plantation is depend on the goodwill of the new and the fertility of the soil is matters. Uh, the concept of the shifting cultivation. Then, uh, whereas uh, the shifting, the other thing is they, they were used slash and burn. This means just plants, grasses and other plants were um, removed and uh, they're using uh, farming uh, as a rotation. They rotate and they were cultivating different types of crops. Therefore, this is uh, clearing the land without burning. The others are continue to cultivate their agriculture, uh, clearing the land without burning, and still they transfer to the new areas uh, without retaining the recurring method, uh, recurring method in a given plot. Therefore, the concept of slash and burn is only explaining that one aspect of the practice uh, uh, in any state area or in state communities. Then the other thing is the crop and crop rotation and uh, crop follow. This is shows that various uh, pointers, V pointers, and highlighting among different scholars also in the state area. This is variety of words to that means uh, misconceptions, misperception, or designating that lack of precise. Uh, precise uh, counters on concerning the shifting cultivation as the method in the national society. Some say that those are they were use more engaged in crop rotation and crop follow. And uh, this view are also managed from a uh, lack of the precise uh, thoughtful concerning shift cultivation. The other thing is uh, the um, this um, article delight to the what is the consequences of uh, this uh, classifying or uh, misperceptions with regarding social cultural groups as uh, shifting farmers in some of their workers and others is men shifting car farmers. This is simply uh, the associating or the disparities or differences among the literature, among the scholars uh, on the basis of their economic performances. Uh, I also this. Uh, there are, of course, there are uh, very limited limitations concerning uh, which uh, sources regarding to this clarity of uh, in clarifying the, the shifting cultivation uh, of uh, the Shnasha people or the Shnasha society. Uh, therefore, uh, this is the general co co the concept that, as I say, that. Uh, Today, those people have different historically, let highlight some concept. Uh, as I said, that Shinasha is one of the homotic uh, language speaking people in the Northwestern Ethiopia. And before they are moving into this, uh, the Northwestern Ethiopia, they were living in the different parts of the Ethiopia region, especially in the south and the north of the Abai River or uh, Wolega, Northeastern Wolega. Those nor Northeastern Wolega is the place uh, in, we in Western parts of Ethiopia, Northwestern, Western parts of Ethiopia. And gradually due to different historical circumstances, they were moved to uh, the present locations of Ethiopia and they have their own um, uh, social economic uh, and cultural uh, history. And uh, therefore, let um, today uh, in the present study area, especially in the northern part of Ethiopia, there were mostly those people are found in um, north, uh, especially in administrative two administrative zones uh, or regions in um, Asosa and uh, Metakel area, northwestern area. These are administrative regions. Mostly those societies are live. And the, another point is that the, uh, as I said, the economy is said to be the system of, uh, among the different scholars argue that uh, the economy is said to be a system of management and using of resources. Therefore, um, man is expected to uh, produce uh, their clothes, shelter, and foods and others. Uh, this is, um, or affected or determined by the natural environment or it is a natural resource and the degree of the, the economic um, uh, utilization of natural resources of those community or those societies is depending upon their stage of technological development of societies 
and uh, production of the meters they use. Uh, the way that the meters they use to produce their production is matters. That is why the, those communities are agriculturally, they were not self-sufficient uh, societies. Uh, as I said, for two basic reasons. One is technology, lack of technological advancement. The other is, uh, as I said, the meters of productions is more traditional and archaic. This might, this affect. Therefore, uh, the most important um, economic endeavor uh, or activity of those society is shifting, uh, shifting uh, farming locally called uh, different names. Uh, as I said, they were cleaned the foresters and uh, they used it for certain periods and particularly they used it for uh, the, the three to uh, four years and of maximum five years. And then they were shifted to another in next. Uh, and therefore, the, especially the, the hoi culture or hoi farming is uh, is the most important uh, important expression of their farming activity. That means rotating agricultural plots from the time to time. These plots are maximum flow of uh, plot flow time is five to six years, five to uh, six years. And every year they clear and use the new plots and leave fallows for, for all ones for a certain period. And each year or each year, those Shinasha families were cleaning the forest land uh, and in the local, uh, sorry, and they produce that different type of crops. One of them is millet. And uh, the other thing is the, the, the use the different, uh, under this different, uh, basically there are two important uh, system of plot type. One is freshly, uh, freshly cleaned land, which is a, a seed or uh, finger plate, finger, finger, finger millet. The other thing is they use the, in the after second year, they you can to use sorghum. And the other is on the, when the land is become old, they began to use different types of uh, croppers with uh, intercropping system like sorghum, maize, and prawn. And uh, maximum, as I've said, that the left, the left land, particular land, after this for five, uh, five to six years. Therefore, uh, and gradually, what is the basic challenge of this uh, such kinds of practice among those society is that the, there is shortage of the land because when the people are regularly or in every year are changing the land from one plot to another or searching to another new land. Therefore, it resulted that shortage of the land. This is caused due to uh, two basic factors. One is the increase of the settlement or the population pressure in the area. And the other is the most of the landers were uh, occupied by investors. Uh, investors occupy most of the land uh, without considering the social uh, and economic realities of the local communities. This is also a big challenge for those uh, people who are engaged on such shifting farming system. Uh, therefore, the most important point here is that is that really that the Shinasha are uh, shifting agriculturalists or plow or, or sedentary agriculturalists or cut raisers. Um, this is a debating issue among the scholars. Uh, and the Shinasha is can be taken as a um, uh, different uh, misconception about the cultivation or their economic life based on their participation in uh, production, in exchange, and as well as uh, consumption of the goods. Therefore, uh, you know, the, the different, they were, uh, the, ba the, base, the, the, the base economic activity is agriculture, especially which cover uh, the shifting agriculture, but uh, supplementary agriculture, they have exercise or they have supplementary economic activities uh, according to available sources. And with uh, my interview with local people, like they were engaged in animal husbandry, uh, poetry, in uh, bean keeping, and uh, handcraft, iron smelting. These are what um, uh, supplementary or, or subsidiary agriculture activities uh, uh, practiced by social societies. Uh, without considering this, most of the scholars are debating that, consider that they were not uh, 
Uh, and they're even there also, because of this fact, they will consider them as what the cattle raisers or pro agriculturalists. Uh, but uh, this is, I think, uh, this is lack of, uh, this idea is perception as emanates from lack of available uh, or statistical data concerning their, those uh, societies, I think. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, uh, even we cannot find that people to regard those people or those societies as cattle raisers, uh, those people who are not engaged or milk and milk products are not the regular part of the diet, because uh, especially in the, in the lowland part of that area, there is uh, cattle disease, and uh, therefore milk products are not the stable products, stable diets uh, uh, for those people as the case for pastoral societies. The other thing is the only the use of animal product, especially sheep, uh, cattle, and goats for the source of the meat and for the market to get many, and for the ritual offering of their godly uh, relationships. Uh, no, there is no um, the pro farmers or uh, which can uh, afford uh, oxes for farming purpose, especially uh, in the lowland area. And there are very few limited uh, number of societies in the highland parts of that uh, community uh, areas that engaged on uh, plow farming. Therefore, majority of those societies are engaged on shifting cultivation or shifting farming system. Uh, that important uh, point is uh, generally, as I say, that the uh, there is social and uh, social social organizations, uh, labor social organization among those people. They work their work uh, based on uh, forming different social organizations. This local labor sharing organization is locally they are known as Dawa, uh, which means their local name. Uh, people with uh, maximum number of uh, maximum number is for the ten to for forty, and and minimum number is two to ten. And this meant regularly people who have uh, people who are living in the certain geographical area or in the same in the in the same village area, they organize themselves and uh, perform their agricultural uh, uh, farming. Uh, this is uh, one important practice, and they were engaged on such kinds of activities to produce different types of crops. Uh, and the other important feature of those societies is the type of their the agricultural methods or tools they use or implement it. Hello, uh, Mr. Abebe, like... please wrap up. You, your time has oh. been up. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, you have 15 minutes. You are way beyond time. Just 30 seconds to wrap up, please. Okay. Okay. I try to finish for five minutes. Then, then therefore, uh, this is the nature of their labor organization among those people. And uh, let me uh, generalize. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, as I've said, the basic economic uh, occupation of those people are uh, influenced by several sources of subsistence. Uh, then shifting cultivation is a major source of their source of the revenue for those people. And this is the indigenous uh, farming system of those society. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, they use, there are other subsistences are supplementary uh, sources sources of the revenue, uh, which are including that rain animals, uh, honey collection, honey cutters, smelt iron, local market exchange, sh share cropping, wet labor. These are additional uh, uh, supporting the, the economic sources. Therefore, uh, economy is the most important uh, for any society. Therefore, this shifting cultivation is a backbone for existence of those national societies in the northwestern part of Ethiopia. And uh, the basic problem is, as I said, lack of technology and methods of production is more archaic, which affected the means of production. Therefore, uh, this is clearly seen uh, among different scholars to reveal the economic basis of the society in that part of Ethiopia. Uh, let, I think it is better to stop here. Uh, thank you very much and welcome for your comments and suggestions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Please, I will use the colleagues, uh, the presenters, to stick to time, to time, so that we are able to have 
a, a bit of discussion at the end. So we will not take the questions immediately because after you present, people are still processing and still have comment to make. Therefore, let's make sure that we have some time so that at the end of every presentation or at the end of the entire presentation, we can open the floor for discussion. So please, uh, to all participants, write down the question in the chat. At the end, we will see how much time we have and then you address the question to a particular presenter. Thank you. Uh, we move to listen to the presentation by uh, Mr. Ajay Saje, uh, who is an associate member of the SOS Center for Palestine Studies at the University of London. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, good morning. Can I share now my, because I'm not allowed to share my screen? Um, yes, yes, you, please you please can share, now. please. Just manage the time well. That's only the, my kind of request but to you. Here it, you. Said, it said you cannot start sharing uh, my screen. Oh, then the, there is an administrator who is working. We will on allow this you to share your screen now so you can show your PowerPoint. Thank you. Yes, please, can I try sharing your screen now? No, until, no, still not. Okay, now it's okay now. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me, without further ado, I will go straight forward to my presentation. In a highly secular society, it is often mistakenly thought that global Pentecostalism, uh, including beliefs and practices, is all about anti-intellectualism, uh, esoteric, Isoteris, uh, isotericism and emotionalism, fanaticism and biblical literalism. However, I'm not saying this is not true. Uh, it could be more than false or perhaps it may actually be accurate or inaccurate. Most Western and non-Western scholars contend that Pentecostal beliefs and practices are based on irrationality and esoteric experience. Today, new incipient scholars rejected these stereotypes about global Pentecostalism. With the emergence of uh, transdisciplinary or trans interdisciplinary approach, however, contemporary scholars argue that the Pentecostal worldview is complex, dynamic, and diverse. Therefore, according to uh, Michael Bergunder, Virgit Mayer, and Giovanni Maltese, who is uh, European scholars, uh, the diversity of glo global Pentecostalism must be taken into consideration when assessing and analyzing their beliefs and practices. However, uh, moreover, the recent critiques uh, challenge the dominance of anti philosophical bigotry among Pentecostals. But what comes next? The challenges are to develop a new ways of Pentecostal thought, especially about the anti-philosophical stance of critical approach or critical approach to the lived experience of uh, the Pentecostalism. So here's the Nimi, Professor Dr. Nimi uh, Wariboko's contributions come in. For many pe progressive Pentecostal scholars, like uh, what I uh, see and heard now with the uh, very powerful presentation of Reverend Rice. This present and challenging context is exciting opportunities for contemporary Pentecostal studies and critical theory to hit the ground, so to speak. By allowing high level work in critical theory to serve the global Pentecostal movement, including all the kinds of congregations and faith traditions. In this view, the important question now Questions now are, can Pentecostal think philosophically? Can Pentecostal engage critical theory? Or if yes, what does Pentecostal beliefs and practices have to do with philosophical works of the critical theory, chiefly by Slavoj Zizek, Jacques Lacan, Jean-Luc Nancy, and Gregorio Agamben? Drawing in his book, The Split God, Pentecostal, Pentecostalism and Critical Theory, Professor Dr. Nimi Baribuko shows how Pentecostal scholars could reconcile 
Pentecostal Thought and Critical Theory. In his book, he aims to develop a Pentecostal philosophy of God that is not beholden to theology or systematic theology uh, and guild theologians, but one that emerged out of the serious conversation with continental philosophy and critical theory. He asks how many the insights, critical perspective, philosophy, or philosophies and philosophies of these scholars help us to understand a critical religious study of Pentecostalism. To address this namely timely question, first and foremost, Wariboko took a turn into critical theory and considered it as an ally of Pentecostal philosophical thought. For Wariboko, it is important that those who have responsibilities in the church should understand the ontological and epistemological assumptions of what the generally, you know, the global church belief and practices. Using uh, critical theory, Wariboko successfully demonstrates the failures and arrogance of modern thinking, same as what modern Christianity committed that everything are comprehensible by universal rationalism and subjectivism, modern logic, mathematics, and apologetics, and empiricism, you know, the cause and effect causality. Enlightenment, uh, in short, it is the enlightenment ideology. More importantly, for Dr. Wariboko, he demonstrates how critical theory can be put to the service of understanding Pentecostal lib experience and offer, offers a critical stance toward scientism or an exaggerated trust in, in the efficacy of method of natural science. Uh, for example, reductionist in nature and very scientific or scientific materialism applied to all areas of investigation, especially now in the social sciences approach. For him, similar with the emergence of the school of critical theory, Pentecostalism and their lib experience is quite adamant to the certitude of pre-suppositionalist uh, pre theologians. Like for example, the, 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 the Kyperian tradition here in Europe and also in the US. For uh, Wariboko, critical theory provides an alternative view of human history and human experience in, the, in contrast to the emphasis of orthodox Western knowledge for example, dualistic, reduced to polarities and negation. Like uh, Kevin Van Hooser's argument that faith is a drama. It's a lived experience. It is a combination of mind, heart, action, but not in the individual aspect, but as a collective aspect. For Wariboko, using critical theory, Pentecostal beliefs and practices is not a presuppositions, but it is a before and beyond presupposition. He argued that inform, at least the informed Pentecostal sees that never whole, as Wariboko argues, that God is active and present in their street level, chaotic and messy everyday life. He called this organic whole. Uh, despite the most Pentecostals uh, adherent to concept of traditional conception of God, God as omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. For Wariboko, it is a reverse concept contrary to the popular view that Pentecostals easily succumb to this God's attribution as a quick fix. It is not a denial or a cogn cognitive dissonance, meaning people seek psychological consistency between their expectation of life and existential reality of the world. Instead, their traditional view of God's attribute implied that Pentecostals, as Waribuko argues, have projected their epistemological limitation about knowing God, their knowledge of ontological incompleteness to God. The limitation of their knowledge about God is simul simultaneously the limitation of the very God that they worship. However, Waribuko does not mean that Pentecostal thought and live experience do not have any ontological and epistemological foundations. For Wariboko, our present and critical certitude should not prevent us to correct, reform, improve by what we learn in some. Simply put, like Pentecostal, 
Waribukot contends our current Christian pro presuppositions presuppositions should be open to possibilities of reforming our religious worldviews and practices. Also, he argues Christian need to retreat into the fortress of fixed and immutable doctrine found in the various fundamental uh, fund fundamentalist movements. Thus, for Waharibuko, an examined faith is not worth having and living. In conclusion, the book uh, purport uh, to be a comprehensive overview of the critical theoretical apparatus and its impact and, and contribution to Pentecostal beliefs and practices. This book is designed for general readers, particularly Pentecostal believers, yet it will appeal also to specialists as an authoritative one-volume resource for those who would uh, understand all the basic debates and issues about, about critical theory, does this book more than an introduction to them. Waribuku attempts to articulate the broader background or horizon of the specific arrays of theological and moral crisis of Christian thought and modern thinking. Essentially, this work is a proposal for the appropriation of critical theory to the present. However, Waribuku goes beyond appropriation. He want Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals to be more proactive using their critical, uh, critical theoretical apparatus. Wariboko goes beyond, beyond question as one of the most distinctive Pentecostal or Christian figure or even none in the landscape of contemporary Pentecostal scholars or philosophical theologians. This ra raises a number of issues about whether critical theoretical apparatus can be provided a suitable standpoint from which to give a philosophical critique of modern dualistic thinking, I personally believe that it can, and it generally it can help us Filipinos rethink our Christian theology, for example, theological system or uh, to overcome uh, the, the theological paralysis or make it more relevant, our Christian faith or faith tradition in everyday life or everyday reality uh, that uh, Filipino facing. Not all ideas co covered in this book will be generally accepted, but they do deserve to stimulate continued critical reflection and discussion on the content of philosophical theology, specifically Filipino Pentecostal theology. In my view, Wariboko's proposal tries to offer important insights to non-Western discourses, a constructive criticism and fundamentalism among evangelical Christians, including Pentecostals. He unmasked the dualistic legacies and the controlling discourse of colonialization of modern thinking embedded in modern evangelical and Pentecostal theologies. Through making use the critical theoretical apparatus or critical theory and its critique of modern metaphysics generate new terminologies and theoretical tools to explore the relation dialogism notion of God or to be exact, the split God in the non-Western discourse, uh, particularly in Asia or Philippines. Within emergence of contextual or intercultural theology, Wariboko's proposal would be able to open up spaces for a dialogue with Asian discourse or discourses. For example, why is global Pentecostalism or charismatic revivalism rapidly growing religious movement as a religious movement growing Firstly, in the non-Western context, like Asia, Africa, and also South America. Perhaps Wariboko is right by stating that they are more bibli biblically oriented, post-proportional, post-theological, than many of today's so-called Bible churches. To conclude, this book provides a helpful starting point of those interested in the issue of critical uh, theory apparatus in relation to Christian thought. Overall, I agree with uh, the Wariboko's proposal or invitation, it is a, not a fatal embrace to appropriate critical theoretical apparatus in order to call for a new reformation movement that is responding to the challenges of theological dilemmas and moral crisis of the 21st century. As many, as many Christian philosophers and theologians confidently say, back to the Bible, back to the Mount of Olives, back to the Sinai experience. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Ajay. Thank you for your very insightful presentation. Please take note of the question that you will respond at the end because there, there is a comment that said there seem to be a different ways. We there, there to be different ways we can approach Wariboko's split God model and explicate from it. So please note that and we'll get back to you uh, after listening to other presenters. So without a uh, further ado, uh, again, thank you for keeping to time. I would like us to listen to Professor uh, Buruha Mohammed, uh, ca coming from Amy Abdel Kader University. Um, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. So Professor Mohammed was. He's not to... here. We moved to Kaunda. Oh no! He actually sent a thank video you. for us. Is that what? He sent a video for us to play, so I can play that now. For okay, please, please, video. Good evening, everybody. The title of my presentation is The Impact of Religion on Market Economy, a New Approach of Nemi Wariboku. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, first of all, I'd like to thank God for grace and giving strength to complete this work. I really appreciate your time and effort to contribute to the success of this conference and to work hard assisting us with this task. I'm quite delighted to share with you this brief presentation in this webinar hosted by Boston University Institute of Culture, Religion and World Affairs and the University of Texas at Austin, honoring the philosophy of Nemi Wariboku, enlightened by some astute speakers and researchers from different cultures, religions, and regions. Despite this fact, the human love brings us all together. Thankful to Professor Toyin Falola and his research assistant, Anna Lee Carlos, for, provi for providing me the opportunity to participate in this conference, which flows and shed lights on the scientific contributions of Nimi Wariboko. The study seeks to explore the relationship between religion as a revelation and finals as an autonomous sphere of human practice. The study intervenes in the debates of how religion affects financial transactions. Setting up discussion on this issue is necessary in order to overcome the wrong image of religion that is in unique a specific role is to help humankind to understand the meaning of life and realize the purpose of existence and has no relation with economic matters. Religion in all its forms and components has been the subject of a wide debate among philosophers, theologians, and sociologists. This debate has emerged for a long time but it began to fade away after the fall of social philosophy, which views religion as a social culture. This ideology was based on the idea of the totem that forms the focus of John Paul Sartre's philosophy. The fall of socialist philosophy was followed by the fall of the socialist ideology that Marx has brought, which considers religion to be the opium of the people. Since 1989, the world has faced many incidents that had a huge impact on politics from the collapse of the Berlin Wall to the end of the Cold War to the fall of the European camp. Meanwhile, the gradual return of religion began at all levels, especially at the economic level, but the beginning of the processes of moralizing the economic life shaped especially by the establishment of a moral economy based on goodness, fairness, and justice. I'm one of those who choose to study religions because of my conviction 
that understanding religion is a gateway to understanding life. My conviction is based on the fact that religion rejects three things, extremism, violence, and ignorance, and accepts three things, science, virtue, and tolerance. I later realized and recognized that religion, if properly used, could be a factor in the well-being of the humankind. In the, era of the, in the era of globalization, the philosophy of Nimiro Boku has brought to mind the fact that humanity have overlooked that relig religion task is not restricted to worship rituals and mystical practices. It is furthermore a human heritage. I confess that Nimi Wariboko is a skilled researcher who succeeded in bridging the gap between financial practices and religious beliefs. Nimi Wariboko has written in different areas, theology, philosophy and economy. I share Toyin's Falola point of view that Nimi Wariboko is a philosopher of global stature, a renowned scholar. His scholarship has been very influential in the academy and outside it. He has led to a deeper understanding of contemporary experiences of spir the spiritual economic, showing not only what philosophers can do, but also how those ideas apply to everyday, everyday situations. In his book entitled Religion and the Morality of the Market, Nimi Woriboku has provided clear and deep arguments to strengthen his new approach to understanding the impacts of religion on the markets and financial transactions. This book is not merely a financial study, but broadly a new approach to assessing moral patterns in financial spheres. It shows how neoliberal markets practices engender new forms of religiosity and how religiosity shapes economic actions. Nimi Wariboku's new approach in regard to the impact of religion and the morality of the market can be illustrated in two basic paths. Firstly, how did Nimi Wariboku get the impact of religion on the morality of the market? The main characteristics of Nimi Wariboku's approach in the field of economy ethics can be clarified as follows. It seems to be realistic because it goes beyond the ritual and transitive function of religion to the overall economic and social taxes. It is an approach that focuses on the human commonality that brings religions together for the people to establish and perpetuate moral values in market practices. It is an applicable philosophy evidence from typical experiences that Nimi Wariboko has involved in and improved. The idea of the morality of the market, other, otherwise called market ethics, which forms the main issues in the studies carried out by Nimi Wariboko, is an extension of the theory of the philosopher Adam Smith, who was the first to establish the theory in his research published by Bridgewater State University in Thailand, Adam Smith providing morality in the free market in economy, economy Cambratulli recognized Adam Smith as the father of economics. She picked out some prototype quotations from his book, Wealth of Nations, by assuming that the economic approach to Smith operates under the assumption that Smith's primary concern and contribution is the way in which economic systems are constructed. If the economic institutions are ordered correctly, then morality and politics will naturally develop and will be secondary concerns. There is no need to dwell on the topic of Adam Smith's economic philosophy because it is our it is not our topic. Rather, I'd like to point out that the beginnings of the idea of market ethics were, were based on the foundations and rules laid down by Adam Smith. Our task is to focus on the morality of the markets analyzed 
by Nimi Oriboko, which gives us an idea of the depth and breadth of his insights okay. in his specific sphere. Briefly saying, Nimi Oriboko, philosophy of the market is based on religious, social, and economic dimensions. We are truly so proud of Nimi Oriboko to be one of the famous researchers in dealing with economic issues by using religious mechanisms and perspectives. Nimi Oriboko's approach to the morality of the markets converges with what Kenneth Bodin and other contributors wrote. Here is a sample. It is difficult enough to measure the, accomplish the accomplishment of an economic policy or system in achieving its stated value goals. There is only confusion when we try to measure economic performance in the absence of any value goals, nor is it much help to treat the value goals as things we all agree upon. Nimi Oriboko is one of the few researchers who link religious knowledge to economic knowledge. We agree that Nimi Oriboko possesses a cognitive ability in analyzing religious and economic phenomena. Secondly, monastic economy through an examination of Nimi Oriboko's approach. Monastic economy is a, is a sort of economy where the owners are, are completely dependent on the society for their daily survival. It is an economy which is often related to monks and nuns. Hiroko Kawanami explains monastic members in Burma do not own land or property and are completely dependent on society for their daily survival. They are sustained by donation and alms as well as token fees from attending religious functions and ritual. Both monks and nuns are invited to take part in religious ceremonies. However, in regard to the amount of money they receive, there is a wide disparity. Nimi Wariboko recognizes, recognizes the spiritual role of the religious institutions, but he rejects the pure ritual role of these institutions that make them separate and isolated from society. The rejection of the purely ritual institution in the philosophy of Nimi Oriboko implies also the rejection of monastic traditions which give monks and nuns a favor of monopolizing arms and allocating uh, to the clergy. Access. According to Nimi Oriboko philosophy, the clergy institution must be stimulated and motivated to be a community institution that takes and gives and contributes to economic mobility. At the end, I thank, I thank you. Uh, I give you an idea about my uh, Biography, I'm uh, Mohamed Gourway, professor of religions and uh, theology. I have uh, a huge experience in the sphere of religions. I wrote in uh, deep reviewed uh, magazines. I have, uh, I have uh, written many articles such as Islam uh, in uh, modern American uh, writing. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we are grateful for his presentation or the presentation of Professor uh, Mohammed. We simply have to move to the presentation by Chama Kaunda, uh, who is an assistant professor at the United Graduate School of Theology, Yonsei University in Korean Republic. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you, 15 minutes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I'm grateful to uh, Professor Falalin for this opportunity. And Professor Nim, I recognize your presence here. 
I want to go straight to this and uh, I hope I'll be able to deal with this in the few, few minutes that I have. Uh, it's impossible actually to deal with uh, Wariboko's uh, arguments in such a short time. So I want to begin. Uh, Nimi Wariboko is an interdisciplinary scholar with uh, an impeccable mind, uh, such a beautiful mind where the mystery of the infinity and the uh, finite uh, crisscrosses. He is a towering figure in contemporary Pentecostal philosophical theology who profoundly draws on continental philosophy, social, and all these many others without showing any uh, intellectual panic at all. In his unofficial, they are called unofficial because they are not uh, uh, officially uh, published. Uh, theology, which is spirit God, the spirit economy, the Pentecostal hypothesis. But Iboko Harvest is approached by synthesizing continental philosophy, economics, political, theological, and critical theologies in that he underlines Pentecostal epistemological quest described in his Nigerian Pentecostalism as the spell of the invisible as deeply entrenched in the idea of the spell or uh, the spirit or crack as a condition of being and existence. He underlines that the whole existence is essentially spirit and that, that is ontologically, cosmologically, subjectively, spiritually, and materially. We need to ask some questions here. Is it possible that the spirit should exist? And uh, I'll focus so much on raising some questions in this small paper because it needs a lot of engagement to understand these uh, three books. How are we even, uh, how are we to know that the spirit exists? If we agree with Wariboko that the spirit that in fact does exist, then what causes the spirit? Is it uh, prior to creation or a result of creation? How does it affect or define human action? Or could it be that the spirit is a human creation to manage the process of being making? How are we to define the essence of the spirit in order to avoid the trap of Cartesian? And much of this uh, name actually does a very brilliant job to, to respond to. It is uh, reasonably sure that Wariboko grapples with issues that tend to raise more questions than answers. And I think to look for all answers in his work, it's quite unfair in that regard as well. This is important as one of the main objectives of uh, Wariboko, especially in the spirit economy, was to understand the spirit's logic and dynamics, figure its uh, impact on human lives and develop the ethical frame to properly address it. So let me take you briefly to Nimi uh, Wadiboko's uh, concept of spirit or the abyss, as it were. In constructing this thought, we have heard how he interacts with all these many different uh, Christos thinkers like uh, Zizik, Lacan, and Mayor Bank, and many others. So Wadiboko perceives the, the spirit as the condition of, of the possibility of endless beginnings, or you can even use uh, the singular beginning in terms of understanding the the, the singularity of existence as it were. He builds on the history of Western philosophers to advance this spirit, but then he moves to bring the new idea on with, from within Pentecostal philosophical theology. So the notion of a spirit does not seem to have one distinctive meaning in Wadiboko according to what I saw, but quite a number of them are different ones. In some places he speaks of a spirit and other places speaks of fragmentation. And it's up to the scholars to try and figure out how these are different, are used in different ways. So I want to begin by first of all, specifically for this to give two distinguish, distinctions that Wariboko gives about the spirit. The first is the spirit with a definite article there, which perhaps should have been written with the uppercase S. The second appears to be a spirit with an indefinite article A with the lowercase. Uh, which is sometimes used by Nim Wariboko in a plural sense as in spritz, cracks, or gaps, as it were in, the, in, the, in, in his writing. So Wariboko believes human beings are trapped in an, ex, in an escapable, cracked existence in which social systems have no master signifier granting the harmonious order of reality or of their owners. They are always spritz and cracks in these systems. So this reality is uh, a, this is a reality in which whatever human beings or creation da, do only strengthens the spirit. So there is no way of getting out or ex escaping this spirit. So the, the the human experience is essentially, uh, according to Wariboko, is like a, a traumatic encounter with the real 
or like a shock encounter with a non unknown and I'm using the concept an unknown unknown because that which has been encountered is not fully known or it's not even known in fact or a violent confrontation with the real and real something that cannot be integrated in in any way so the only challenge is how to how do we know that the real exists that's a challenge that comes again can the real be a possible uh, object of human experience when that experience is completely fractured, according to Wariboko? Or how can the humans know that what is the real if they are trapped in an incomplete real reality that cannot be harmonized? Then there is a contradiction that comes in terms of the life that human beings have to live. So Wariboko's spirit, which is a void or an abyss, also has an, uh, an affinity with uh, shielding or uh, Zizik's uh, abyss of freedom, which subsists at the very bottom of a depth of a temporal past, the time before. So we must ask another question for us to make sense. Is the spirit inherent to the notion of reality, which is very important in terms of uh, Wadiboko's argument that the reality is spirit. So if we put that in the postmodern thought, the concept of reality becomes a very notoriously difficult term to define because it's perceived as socially constructed and anything socially constructed is not autonomously real. That challenge comes again in terms of how we understand. So Wariboko argues that the spirit has no origin, no foundational point and no end. This, uh, this eternal or infinity primordial or prim primordial spirit speaks to the primordial spirit uh, fragmented and composite or originally. In some places, um, he, he maintains that Christ as the original spirit. And the, uh, however, in relation to economy, to the capitalist economy, he argues that the primordial spirit is demonic or what he classifies as the sin of a primordial spirit. So somehow, it's, as a brief uh, uh, talk here, the variations in the way Wariboko utilizes the concept or the theory appears to have created theoretical spirits, and that is in a very positive way, he's using it, not in a negative way, that are in essence irreconcilable. For example, if you read the artificial trilogy as they are all, then you are left wondering which is the original or primordial spirit, the Christ or the demonic. And those become very easy for you to understand if you just follow one uh, trajectory or one book. So the Pentecostal, let me take you briefly on uh, Wariboko's uh, theology in terms of Trinitarian to just try and figure out how he tries to use this concept. And uh, other speakers have spoken about these elements. So I'm not going to dwell much on them. But uh, Wariboko uh, deals with three, which is in the Trinity level. First, that Pentecostals interact with God from a spirit perspective, which is very important. And, and, and here I can just enlighten one aspect. It is important to mention here that the Pentecostal spirit, uh, God, is not the same as Portilic's abysmal God, who is the ground and uh, abyss of being. Or Iboko clarifies the issue is not what God is, and that is important, but what God Pentecostals want. And uh, the essence is that they detach parts or attributes of God uh, uh, from God's self and deploy them for utilization. So they, they, they kind of uh, engage the odd in the very present, but in a very different way as it were. The second element from God then is the Christ, who is also reimagined as the spirit. And I like the way Wariboko comes here. Wariboko argues that Pentecostals conceive Christ as the crack in the world a creative space of nothingness that energizes the world and is emblematic of a crack. However, in the process of exchange, the Pentecostal believers, I want you to, to, to look at that one very critically, the Pentecostal believer becoming this gap, having an embodied stance in this gap in a way to mimic or mimic Christ, who is the original gap again. But look at the next one, as Wariboko argues that Christ is the original spirit, he also believes is the Pentecostals that, that transpose Christ into this spirit. So the Pentecostals are doing the doing. This spirit does not appear, it seems, prior to Pentecostal action in the way that it comes. So the third element is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is, is in the economy of a spirit. Reboko makes a very interesting argument that the Holy Spirit is the interruptive and inaugurative power of a spirit. For Wariboko, the Holy Spirit is a freedom to initiate something new amid automatic social processes. 
So the Holy Spirit is a subject and principle of holy deflection, that is, of all the forces. It retains the Holy Spirit is active in principle of its renewal, that is the spirit. The substance of a gap is constitutive of freedom, the capacity to begin. It is the Holy Spirit that is inherent Pentecostal principle as the capacity to begin. And so let me move quickly now to what I want to say briefly on what Adiboko says. So in order to understand the spirit theory in a systematic and coherent way, we have to begin by defining God's original action. I've done a lot of, uh, on, on this one, but I want to be a little bit fast so that you get to brief what I'm saying. So I believe that creation is God's prime, primal, primordial, uh, original, perceptible, and the materialized action. That is whatever God was, we don't need to waste our time to know because that is unknown, unknown, but we can know that the action of God begins at the very time that God creates all things uh, as it were. So we can also argue that the spirit does not exist prior to the original action of, of creation because if it right. did- uh, Please, Dr. Kanda, sorry to interrupt you. Please kindly conclude so that we have time I, to- No, no, please. I have five minutes more. I have five minutes more, I'm timing myself. I, you, you are actually stopping I, five minutes we, more. We are stopping, we are stopping the panel you can um, give him his five in minutes. five minutes. But, okay. but I have five minutes. Oh, okay, others, go ahead, five. go ahead. Go ahead with your five minutes. Yes, I think that's just fair. Go ahead with your five minutes, please. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so we can also argue that the spirit does not exist prior to the original action of creation because if it did, it is located in a non unknown existence. Therefore, it is safe to limit the discussion to the non and to the non unknown. In the known unknown, it is God's action of creation that appears to have created the primordial spirit. So the abyss of uh, divine freedom to act. So the moment of creation as a moment of spirit. Genesis chapter one brings us here in terms of telling about the formless and all those things that comes. So the original spirit brings this complete incomplete in creation which at the very beginning. The complete incomplete becomes the inherent condition of creation as the abyss of life and existence. So this inherent complete incomplete gave rise to the divine creative dialogical action, which you'll find in Genesis when God begins to talk, let there be and creation responds in terms of becoming materialized as it were. Thus every proceeding a speech action of God, if we talk of talking as a speech act as well of in Genesis, uh, also in chap Genesis chapter one from all that was necessitated by God's perceived complete incomplete that comes back to name Waliboko as well. So Genesis uses a repetitive phrase in reference to God's perception of each phrase. God saw, culminating into the God's finality uh, as it were in, in that regard. So it appears God's initial core of creation out of the spirit was not intended to close the spirit. And that comes very good in from Waliboko. That are to initiate the process that is just fill the earth and give form that creative action that starts and it becomes that uh, locus of participation in divine creativity. So creation is an open totality, perpetually transcending itself and incessantly becoming. The complete incomplete is the eminent impossibility of impossibility within the creation itself. So the spirit drives creative action. The primordial spirit is a possibilizing grace of God, as Richard Kern would argue, observe, which renders all things possible, which would be not possible uh, uh, otherwise. So let me go uh, briefly and then I'll be ending. So the human ability to act is contingent upon the primordial action and the response to the original spirit. One might be tempted to describe human action or creation action as the little spirits within the spirit. So they are micro spirits to the extent that they are mimicry of, of and rest on the standard of macro spirit of God. So human beings act because God acted. The human action is a mimetic action. That is a mimic action. The mimetic action is inherent in the condition of creation as it were. So every action, in other words, is a spirit in the original spirit because it's potential initiates something new out of that. So how do we talk about the, the demonic in this all um, thing and that we go? So in Pentecostal demonology, the demonic cannot act in the world except through material hosts. So this means that the demons have no direct action in the world. Thus they possess, entice, and tempt 
material host through whom they act. So it's a secondary action that happens. The embodied demonic action seeks to negate or corrupt the original spirit. So it creates demonic spirit, which it gives rise to decreation, or to borrow the word from Simon Will, as undoing or creating authority and inauthenticity in creation. This is antithetical spirit that negates creation and it create, it's its creative participation into the creator as well. So however, since the demonic spirit arises through the material host, it can be described as a mimic desire for that which is possessed by, by the imitated, such as in Genesis, you will be like God. So it is demonic because it forces those imitating to define themselves apart from and above the rest of creation. In other words, it tempts humanity to undo its creatureness thereby decreating de 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 in authenticity in creation as well. So how do we end here? Jesus becomes the model or God, the incarnation is seen as a God's response to this in authentic and authority in creation. It's, it's God's reaffirming, it's God's imperative reaffirmation, reinstatement and reconstitution of the original action of God in creation as it were. So let me end there so that uh, I give the, the other the time, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kanda. Very passionate, very insightful presentation. Very impressive. I'm sorry we had to rush you because we wanted to engage. Uh, me, I'm not a, a, theo a, a theologian expert, but through your presentations, I will be looking for the books written by Wariboko. Definitely, I have to read his work. Really, 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 sorry, very impressive. I'm sorry yes. to stop you. We have just two minutes. So please mm -hmm. send your questions on the chat because mm -hmm. the presenters, are, they can see all the questions. And the next, we will, we will, the next panel, we have less people. So we are going to have more time. So what we are going to do is to roll the questions for this panel to the next. Uh, on behalf of the, my team, uh, the organizers of this conference, I thank Professor Sages, I thank um, Professor Montali, Abebeano, Ajesaje, Professor Mohamed, Chamakaunda for all these wonderful points. Uh, our understanding of the split God and Nimiwari Boko's work, uh, they have been enhanced. And I took one phrase for one of the presenters, an amazing phrase, which is Professor Wari Boko does not exhibit intellectual panic. Uh, it's the first time I will be introduced to that phrase. And I'm very grateful. Let me now welcome um, Professor Sabelo Ndlovu. Please tag him. The chair of this panel is um, from the University of Bayreuth, is the most preeminent decolonial scholar now. Uh, the University of Bayreuth moved him from the University of Pretoria uh, to, to occupy the chair of decolonial studies in June. We are very, very proud of him. Of, um, he's not aware I'm writing essays on him. Welcome to chair this panel. Professor Additional is unable to join us. He's very ill at this time. We wish him speedy recovery and God's blessing. Aleke Matthew, are you here? Aleke Matthew. Mam Dele Amuda, are you here? Amuda, what's going on? Are they not able to join? Yeah, sorry. It seems like um, uh, Miss Aleke Matthew is here, but I think he is getting ready. Yes, I think. Atere, Ogunto Imbo Atere. Is Atere here? Vincent Adepoju. I saw him. Is Vince? Can you tag Vincent? Up? Okay. So well, this is this is blessing because it now allows us to check for the presenters in the first panel to answer some of the questions they've asked them. 
please, uh, Chair, your job is to manage this time. This session must end by 7 o'clock our time. So you should give them 15 minutes maximum. That way, we have a lot of time to answer questions from the first panel and the questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes? Uh, um, sorry, before we start, Mr. Matthew, would it be possible to get like um, some headphones for your um, for your audio? It's very loud, I think. You want him? We can't even hear him. Oh, yeah, sorry. I had to mute it again. He's talking. Hello, Camilo. He said, do you have a headset, headphone? Like um, something to... Yeah, I the so I can Hello? Can you hear me now? Oh no, sorry sir. Unfortunately it's it's breaking up. Yeah, you can what do you want him to use? I th I think if he has the like, earphones, that might be a Hello? You have your phone. Oh. I have no No. No, no, sorry, sir. I think it may also be a connection problem. Can we start with the... Yeah. Can you... Um, I believe we can start with um Miss it's uh I guess we can start with somebody else, Mr. Amuda, if possible. Is Amuda here? Um, I do not believe he is, actually. Let's start with Vincent Adeboju. Uh, Aleki, can you send us your speech? Because we can then arrange to read it. Can you send us your speech? We can read it. Obina. Kindly correspond with him privately. If he sends a speech, we'll read it. Let's go to Vincent, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes, clear. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for this magnificent opportunity to share my love for the work of Nimiwari Boko, which I was privileged to be introduced to by Tony Falola's superb description of this intellectual giant. What is my purpose here? I want to make a claim which is quite unusual. Yes, I have read through most of Wari Boko's books. I have not read all of them word for word. I aspire to do that. Magnificent writing, superb expository prose, fantastic conceptualization, great architecture. Structural like creating of concept. I am of the opinion which has best work is his acknowledgement pages. Yes, those pages. This is where he thanks his God. He thanks his family. He thanks his fellow scholars for their contribution so to me. his life. Now, his acknowledgments cannot go beyond everything he has. essence, as I would call his greatest achievement. I, would, I hold that view because I see those writings as concentrating his greatest strengths, his capacity for, for linear ratiocination, for being able to develop ideas in terms of logical sequences, 
in terms of linear logic, exp in expressing expository prose, his capacity for imaginative thinking in poetic form. So what happens in his acknowledgments is that he brings these two aspects of himself, the expository personality, as well as the imaginative and poetic personality into tandem and fuses them in terms of his, what you may speak of as his religious genius, his relationship with an ultimate reality. Do it in such a way that you can relate various themes, various images, various concepts to various orientations in the various books he's writing. What is my best example of this assertion? He has a very moving expression of this vision, of his vision in acknowledgement pages in the split God, one of the best pieces of writing I've ever read. What does he do there? He speaks of himself as a scholar of the boundary. And he describes the character of this boundary, a boundary which is a confluence of disciplines, a confluence of possibilities where humanity and the divine interact. And in doing that, he engages in what you may call an a sonic prophecy, looking into the future in terms of the power of sound, where he speaks of hearing the footsteps of the coming generations and describes their influence upon him, their inspiration upon him at this point point in time and space. In relation to this kind of description of his intellectual orientation as a scholar of intersections, a scholar at a point of correlation of time, past, present, and future, he is also very good at describing the natural context of his thoughts. He thanks the birds and the trees outside his house for make beauty the project he writes and in doing this the aesthetic forms in the charismatic text he speaks of possibility second which he cannot afford to take for granted because it is made possible by other centers centers created by other people, by family, by friends, by fellow scholars, and by the creator of the universe. Now, in some, so that I don't get carried away. This description of self, this center, where other cent where other, a center in which various circles constellate, a center generated by the infinite and the finite, the infinite being God, the finite being his fellow human beings. A center where also various disciplines intersect. Is it possible for one to develop a style of thought from, this, from these expressions, from these poetic projections? Can we integrate his total body of work in terms of this? basic structure of ideas. And I would say, why not? May we not visualize Wariboko's work ultimately in terms of a circle, referring to the circle of infinity. That same circle he invokes in various works in speaking of the human being as directed towards the unanticipatable, the absolute infinity. But an infinity which is best understood not in terms of transcendence, but in terms of immanence. Leading us to one of Wariboko's favorite expressions, what he speaks of as transimmanence. A transimmanence where the immanent and the transcendent are correlative in terms of human interaction, in terms of interpersonal relations, in terms of economic, economic exchanges, as well as in relation to the construction of community, the building of cities where human possibilities may flourish as a medicine in the charismatic city. Moving forward from this point, 
I anticipate constructing a system from Wariboko's work as filtered through his acknowledgement pages in such a way that one can distill these fundamental ideas in a few lines, which anybody may read for inspiration. And along with that, add to that an exposition which enables you to ask yourself, how can I apply these ideas in my own life? How can this concept of circles of possibility relate to me? How can I relate to the infinite, the finite, in my own way, drawing ideas from Wariboko's work? In sum, one may look at his acknowledgement pages as projecting an imaginative vision, distilling the monumentality of ideas painstakingly articulated in his body of work, but distilling this in terms of poetic expression, imaginative forms, images that crystallize this totality. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, that I have to do your job. Mr. Dr. Aleki Matthew, can you, try, fine, <laughs> can you try again? Can you send your paper to us so we can read it for you? Okay. Can you send your paper to so, me by email? Can you send your paper? I will read it for you. Who should I send it to? Just send it to me or to Bina. Just send it to my email. Okay, I will send it to Bina. If you send it, right. to, we will present it to you. So, uh, let's go okay. back to... Monteli Rice, please can you tag Monteli Rice? Monteli. Obina, please can you tag him? Can you unmute him as well? Monteli, you've been making a number of comments uh, as people are presenting. Okay. So can you can you tie all your major points you have been making? Tie all my comments together. I've been reading your comments on the chat. Right. There are several random comments. What would you like me to do? It's up to you because these are fascinating comments you have been making. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. There are, there are two things. I want to start with the split term that Wari Borko uses. Uh, maybe I talk about my research journey in trying to understand uh, Wari, what Wari Borko means by split. Because as I listen to the presentations, it seems to me that there are many influences, there are, there are many ways we can interpret split. But let me, let me try to outline the journey I went through, the research journey, in trying to understand what Waterbarko is talking about. Um, I think I spent almost two months trying to understand this book. And I tore it up. The book is falling apart, trying to grasp what in the world does he mean by split. I concluded uh, that the, the best way to get into this is from its basic Lanconian meaning, what Lacombe meant by split. I, I found that that was the, uh, the doorway, the gateway. Even though Waterbarkel doesn't really refer so much to Lacombe, Waterbarkel refers more to uh, Slavok Sazik, but Sazik is primarily influenced by Lacombe. So I have concluded that we should really start with what Lacombe means by split, the psychoanalytical uh, meaning of split, which is that basic childhood trauma, realizing one's self identity apart from one's mother. I have concluded 
that that is crucial to understanding what Warren Barco, what, what, what is funding his, his basic idea of split. Because Warren Barco deals a lot with uh, the, 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 how we are interfaced, how we are integrated with the global capitalist economy. And it seems to me that uh, if we start with, with uh, Lacombe, then we understand something of the problem. Uh, of course, I work from, I, I guess, a very Augustinian understanding of the human as a desiring animal. Uh, of course, my language reflects James K.A. Smith. And so Lacombe helps us be a water broker, helps us understand that our, our, our problem is that in order to resolve the split, the fracture within us, is we are on a lifelong search to heal the fracture. And uh, we're, we're trying to, to, to find this union restored that we, we feel lacking in our life. And that's where, uh, so, so, so our, our loves are disordered and, and, and capitalism taps on that basic human problem of unsatisfied desires, of disordered desires. So what I'm trying to say is, I think we have to start with Lacombe's understanding of split. That's the first thing that I would say. Um, and then the other issue is, uh, I, I feel that Warren Barkle, uh, okay, I'm coming, I'm, I'm attacking the problem of Pentecostalism. Pentecostal studies is trying to move, trying to engage more uh, uh, philosophical disciplines. But in the United States, and you know, I don't mean to, to, to uh, privilege American context. I am American, but I haven't lived in the States for half my life. But in the United States, the, uh, the American Pentecostal scholars, they are, they, they are trying to privilege, they are trying to push analytical philosophy. And I feel that they are misunderstanding continental philosophy. They're misreading it. They're misunderstanding it. And Warren Barkle's vision, his project, his labor is crucial to bringing the the continental voice to the forefront of Pentecostal studies, but also uh, helping us to understand what continental philosophy is really about. It's not about, in my opinion, nihilism. Uh, it's about justice. And Warren Barkle, the way that I read him, uh, and I wanna support him, is uh, trying to bring clarity uh, to the, the promise of continental philosophy to Pentecostal studies. Uh, so these, these are, I'm trying to summarize some of there's my a thoughts. Question, there's a question for you. Okay. From, um, one, uh, Professor Adelakun. I don't know whether you can read it on the chat. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to skim through. It's how to, how do you find the otherness? Pardon me? Uh, he said, he said, you said we should embrace human otherness. Right. But how do you define this otherness? And how do we reconcile the embrace with the imperative of resisting otherness to maintain a distinct Christian identity? Right. Good question. Um, what immediately comes to mind when I read that question is Miroslav Balf. Because I think Miroslav Balf directly addresses that question in his book, Exclusion and Embrace. I think Balf uh, well attacks, well addresses that very question. Balf talks about the need for boundaries but he also, you know, he firmly uh, uh, affirms that there is need for boundaries. It's, it's boundaries 
that make us gifted. And actually, James K.A. Smith makes that same point. You see, human beings are different from God. What, ena what, what enables the giftedness of a human being is having a physical body because it is the body, the boundaries, the physical boundaries of a fleshly existence that give us a, a unique perspective. And that unique perspective is what gives us our unique giftedness, each one of us from our different cultures. And yet both talks about the journey of human life is developing what he calls a Catholic uh, personality. And what he means by a Catholic personality is that we recognize there should be definite boundaries because those boundaries give us a sense of giftedness and yet growing in giftedness uh, requires a, a, a nurturing of a Catholic personality which comes by learning to, uh, to be enriched by the otherness of others. So I, I don't have the book right in front of me. I don't have a ready answer, but I would refer to Miroslav Volf and uh, he addresses this issue of, on one hand, there's a tension we want to in, indeed keep intact our human otherness. And yet on the other hand, growth requires developing a Catholic personality. And that comes through learning to embrace the other. Dr. Kaunda, please, can you tag Dr. Kaunda to respond? Because I can see some tensions between his arguments and that of um, Professor Rice now. Where's Kaunda? Can you tag him, Obina? Please, can you respond to Professor Rice? Because I can see some tensions between your arguments. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Rice. I think there is a way that we can agree from on one hand that uh, Nim Wariboko is, uh, is, uh, should be understood from uh, Lacan's perspective. But I don't fully agree with that because that would be a complete reductionist of what he wants to talk about, in fact. If you follow all the three books, Nimi uses different concepts. And I think that is important for us to pin on that. There are some anthropological concepts in his work, like liminal, uh, liminal spaces, in terms of understanding Pentecostalism. That brings a completely different understanding. I think that if you want to understand some of the concepts, you have to move from Victor Turner with uh, his study of African rituals, especially in Africa, where he brings the concept of liminality. In fact, what I was thinking that was missing in Wadiboko, when you look at it from that perspective, is that he didn't go a little bit further into the permanent liminality, which he left out. So he, he, he left himself before he went into what he called, if there's a concept that he uses that, that the Pentecostals must lock themselves in between. I can't remember exactly what he said. When they, they transport this Christ into the liminality and Christ becomes that, uh, um, that uh, spirit, then the Pentecostals themselves also become that spirit themselves and they have to, st to station themselves in the in-betweenness so that they can engage God, the reality of God, but they are also engaging the reality of the world. But at the same time, they are not food in the spiritual, but they are not also food in the physical. They are trapped in between. And if that is the case, if I, you agree with Wadiboko, then you can argue that this is a permanent liminality that Pentecostals goes into, where they completely move from the structured society and, you, and they, they are not, in, but they find themselves in between. That is one aspect. There is another aspect, I think, in what, okay, uh, you want to... Please. Uh, let him, I've been joining let him, uh, uh, the response, him. but it's a bit Monty, fast. Let, let him finish. Please, Kaunda, go ahead. Okay, so on that one is, is, is one angle that we can look at it, but Nimi is going still much further than uh, Lacan in terms of uh, his understanding of a concept because he's not just looking at this spirit subjectivity, which he brings into, in fact, when he's talking about, but he's gone far beyond that. Because when he moves into this, he brings another dimension in the concept, which for him is not just the negation that is happening. The spirit for Nimi is not negative, that which we should even try to close up. In fact, he's arguing that the more you close up, the more it opens, because you cannot close it up. It's the space 
of possibility. It, that is necessitated by human action that drives creation. I, I understand that. that. I understand yes. that. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, yes. Professor Rice, go ahead. I, I understand that. Hold on, hold on, Without Professor Rice. Let's finish. Forward. Go ahead, so come. I think it's these. <laughs> go ahead, please go ahead. So my argument is that there is not just one way of saying that we claim Wadiboko is rock and, and that's it. I think that's a complete reductionist if we do that. They, they, okay. There are more tentacles in the spirit in, in, in Wadiboko. I think you need to read all the different books, the Pentecostal hypothesis, the Pentecostal, uh, the, the spirit God and all this. And then you will see how these many elements actually are interwoven. And I felt that these were even too much for Wadiboko that you will see how they are failing even to hold together. So that within, there is a spirit within the theory of spirit within Wadiboko because of the too many elements that he tries to put together and then he cannot form one gear out of it. So in different books, you, you read the spirit economy, it takes almost a complete trajectory of a spirit. You come into the Pentecostal, uh, the spirit God, it takes almost a complete trajectory of it. You come into the Pentecostal hypothesis, it takes almost a different trajectory of it. And the naming, and that becomes important in, in terms of his struggle to try and say, where is the origin of his spirit? Is it just essential in creation? Who, where does it come from? And Nyaribuko, I, I, I like the, the struggles that he brings in his own work. Rather than trying to say that they are straightforward answers, he brings this struggle. Where is the origin? Is it in, in human? Is it in history? Where does it come from? And I care, on that one, I felt the fear that I had Prof. Wariboko on that one, is that the, the challenge of leaving it hanging like that, then you can create another divinity, which is the spirit itself, may end up becoming God <laughs> competing for divinity. And that's a challenge that I found in Constant in the books that is creating a new God in the space that he's bringing. So how do we push it outside? I think we need to look at all these elements to, to attend and figure out- Please, what let's bring in, uh, okay, Professor Rice, hold on. Let's bring in Sajay because Sajay, can you tag him? And because you, you, you are making the different argument regarding moving beyond critical, real, critical theory. What's your intervention in this ongoing debate we're having now? Dr. Uh, Wayola, who are you addressing? Sajay, Sajay, you. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, my ma What's your intervention in, in this ongoing debate between Kaunda and Rice? You can't hear us? Can you speak? Sorry, sorry, you're, you're muted now. Ah, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the way I... Because I try to absorb, you know, the works of... Uh, specifically the book of the Spirit of God... Uh, Professor Waribuko in the Philippine context. Uh, basically, when I read uh, his book, I find uh, the way he uh, defined terms and concepts is not fixed from what uh, the critical theory is trying to uh, explain and to deliver. Actually, he go he used critical theory as a tool, you know, to escape. Well, actually, critical theory in general are trying to avoid these fixed concepts and, uh, you know, these concepts of uh, very scientific, very exact. But uh, I absorb, uh, the way I understand is he goes beyond with this afterward explaining the importance of dealing, engaging with the critical theory. He go beyond with these categories. And I think it's, for me, it's an open door for, that's why his work, especially the book, Split God, is very important work to introduce to Filipino Pentecostal scholars uh, because he, he helped this Pentecostal uh, dilemma, how to deal with this, you know, very critical uh, knowledge that basically challenged or even misinterpreted or misjudged uh, the, the, the Pentecostal lib experience. So this is the way I understand the works of Professor Waribuku. He goes beyond basically to 
after discussing the importance of critical theory, engaging the, uh, the critical theory, he goes beyond with these categories, especially when he value the importance of the grassroots lived experience. Thank you. Sorry, Sabello, that I'm taking over your role. If there's anyone who wants to make a specific contribution to the idea of the split God, can you please raise your hand or, so that we can unmute you? Meanwhile, uh, the chair, I'll be asking you a question. We cannot reject um, Christianity or Islam. How do we decolonize them? I'll be asking you, to, so make, begin to make your points. So uh, Montelli says he wants to talk back, he wants to reply. And you know, once you reply, Kanda has to reply. We'll grant him a response. Just, just a quick reply. I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Kaunda, Kaunda. Yes, I appreciate uh, his comments and, and they are needful. And uh, there is a danger, I suppose, uh, I, I might tread on in terms of uh, reductionalism. That's not what I meant. I, I can comprehend, I can appreciate that Wari Barco is going beyond, is going beyond original meanings. He's going beyond critical theory. And I appreciate that. Um, I have read the Pentecostal Principle. I have read that book. I have not read his other books. I have not read uh, Pentecostal Hypothesis. I've ordered the book, it's on its way, and I've not read The Split Economy. And obviously I need to get into those books to see how he further develops the split concept. I appreciate you, uh, the way that you have integrated split, how it actually leads, it backtracks, it leads to Pentecostal principle. The split releases power. It produces new Pentecost. The split re, uh, produces new energies and new potentials. And I think you have, you have clarified that for me and I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, back to you, you want to respond, please? Thank you so much. I, I, uh, I also appreciate the, the presentation that uh, Professor Rice gave. It's, it's such a, a rich presentation that came up and uh, so many other issues that uh, he clarified in my mind. You know, um, there is a, a, a proverb in uh, Rwanda. They say that it takes one mind to become mad, but it takes two to, to find a bride. It sounds sexist, but uh, it's a Rwandan one. And I think a space like this, then you begin to, to clarify the ideas that you are reading before you get mad with uh, Nim Wariboko's ideas of the spirit that uh, he has written all over the place. But I think what I appreciate so much about Nimi's uh, conception beyond, I, I, I was asking myself, me having coming also myself from Assemblies of God and the pastor in the church as Assemblies of God, I was asking myself, would uh, people, Pentecostals, recognize themselves if they were to read through Nimi Wadiboko? Would they find themselves at all? Would they be mirrored in what he says? And uh, that is an empirical question that we have to look at. But I think the spirit just brings this potentiality in terms of uh, how the movement could be conceived, how the philosophy of within Pentecostalism is being reconceptualized. I think it, that makes a very rich uh, contribution to the, all this system. And uh, I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you. Let me just end there. <laughs> thank you. We have many distinguished people among us. I will not be mentioning all of them, but I will just um, notice uh, Matthews Ojo, who was one of the pioneers of this subject. Uh, with his PhD in London, uh, was one of the very earliest to write on, on this movement. Uh, he's here with us. And he served as the president of Bowen University before moving to Ghana. There's a question for you, Dr. Kaunda. Uh, can you read it on the chat by the Lacun? Saying, you call the idea of the split the creation of a new God. She wants you to talk more about that and who is this God serving? Is it serving you as a pastor or is it serving the movement or is this God serving theory? It's a difficult question. Obina, you have to unmute him, please. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. What what I I was trying to say on that one, I was referring to Nimi's argument that this spirit has no origin, has no beginning. So then I was saying that uh, that 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 creates almost a danger of creating the spirit as God itself, because then the spirit becomes infinity or becomes uh, the divinity by itself. It has, if it has no no beginning or no ending, it it, it is almost like a, an endless system that uh, is being created. And in that, then it can compete for divinity. In that, uh, so that. I was saying that becomes a danger rather than that the spirit is actually God in essence. It's not because Nimi doesn't mean it as God as, as such. So I was just talking about in terms of terminologies that are used in referring to, to the spirit at, at, in, in that regard. So I think that's where we should. Obina, point. can you please unmute David Steele's Okran? David Steele's, can you please unmute him? David Styles, is it Styles or Styles, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, <clears throat> I thank uh, you for for giving this opportunity. I, have, I, have, I couldn't join from the beginning. Uh, I'm speaking from Norway, uh, uh, Oslo, Norway. Um, just completed my PhD, uh, waiting for my defense. Uh, was actually invited by Abba and Itansa. But the, the, the later discussion, I'm looking at the, this concept of the, you know, um, split God, you know, uh, in our uh, situation in Ghana, which I've been reflecting uh, upon for some time now, um, where this split God, where does he belong? Does he also create confusion at the same time? Because we have serious prophetic battles this one says that uh, I have seen right, and this one said, no, I have seen right, you know, regarding political, um, you know, rallies, um, and then political figures uh, who are going to die, you know, sometimes we call prophet of doom, and this one, we say, no, I said it. Is God, uh, can he be splitted in this regard? How, I don't know who will respond to this question, because this Kavima, <laughs> I am battling with coming from Ghana myself and um, having done some study in, in um, um, neo prophetism in Ghana um, in around 2004, but now it is more pronounced than what I used to. Yeah, so if um, maybe Professor Kaunda, who had presented, can say something about it. In, in his splitness, is it only the possibilities or is it also? Can it be re related to this concept of confusion regarding the voices? Well, uh, to just answer that one, I think we need to move even a little bit further when we are looking at uh, what Boko's uh, arguments. I, what I was uh, thinking much is that um, if you go within the Nigerian worldview, you can also find in terms of the concepts like Orish, I think the professor Zeke, I'm not from Nigeria, can actually agree with me on that, that the concept of uh, Orisha or the exact, the exact pronunciation is, is a God who breaks in pieces and is found all over the world. And then people can in fact engage these fractions, which um, Kwame Bidiako calls uh, fractional monotheism, because these pieces, according to the argument, coming from the same system, and then they are divinities. So in, in African worldview, there has been this understanding where that one single individual cannot possess all the spirituals, all the graces, to, for them to administer the, 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 the grace of God. So people tend to go in the old tradition, they'll go to different shrines, the shrine of fertility, then they'll get the, the, what they need, the shrine of money, and then they go to get all, all this. So these different uh, specificities form the spritness of the existence of God. That is at, at a traditional level setup, which Nimi doesn't engage at all. And, and I think, I hoped he would have done that engagement. So the, the, then, what I'm, I say that just because there is this spiritness of the divine, it doesn't mean that what the people do with that spirit is the, the problem of this divine. I think it's a problem of people. 
And I think that we can also take it to Nimi's uh, conception of economy when he talks about uh, that this spirit, which uh, for me is a secondary uh, action of demonic into the world, is, is actually demonic. And I think there is a possibility that every system that is governed by human beings can become corrupt, can become individualized and empower one aspect, those who claim to have more power than others. And in doing so, creates now not the spirit for good, but inauthenticity within the system. So there is a possibility that these ministers, most of them are actually creating this inauthenticity in the system, which is negating the whole system of creation as well. So we have to look at it from different angle. And I don't agree that these people should be plundering and uh, stealing money from people. That is negation of a system. And I think we cannot stand for that. Yesterday I was giving a, 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 a speech at uh, Desta University. One of the concepts that I was appealing to is the crystal capitalism that has taken over our churches today. That Christ has been reduced to market. Christ is essentially the commodity the capitals that people are using capital good for the pastor and members are clientele who are actually being buying the Jesus and then the Jesus, the, the pastor is becoming rich in marketing, the whole system. That is a negation of a system. It's not the, the positive element, I think, the, of a spirit God that Nimi was talking about, not even within the system, within the Orisha system of uh, Nigeria and the traditional system of Europe. So that I think should be completely differentiated in that terms, I think. Okay, uh, we have time. Uh, this panel ends at um, seven o'clock. So we are very blessed because we, we have um, 40 minutes and important conversations are ongoing. Uh, so let me call Sabello. How do we, how do we, so we can't treat Christianity as a foreign religion in Africa. In fact, people make that mistake over and over again. Now, even before that, Judaism penetrated them, um, uh, Africa, part of Ethiopia, um, mm -hmm. and so on. And if you look at the the early history of Christianity, the mission of Christ, the locations of apostles, where they wrote some of the, the gospels as in, the, as in that of Mark. Uh, Africa from the very beginning had been integrated uh, into, the, into the Christian world. Some places came later via the Americas. But that's just um, how religion spread. So if it's going to remain with us, can we, and if we see projects like Pentecostalism as decolonial, mm -hmm. because independent churches, we have to interpret them as decolonial. Yeah. Where does this leave us? Okay. How do we integrate Christianity into a decolonial project. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Prof, for, for putting me into this deep end. And uh, indeed, I've been listening to these very interesting uh, philosophical engagements on the court split, which, uh, and it attracted me now to read the work of Professor Waribogo, which I have not read and I must admit. Uh, but uh, your question on the on Christianity Islam, I think the first fundamental move which we need to take, which is a very simple move, is to move from religions to spiritualities. And I think I think that will solve a lot of problems uh, if we move from religions to spiritualities, because spiritualities have the room for pluralities, and they already you have uh, also given us another indication which we can move if we are doing it in a decolonial way. Of course, we need to historicize correctly that uh, Christianity is not only something which comes with, uh, with colonialism. They, are, they were actually Christians in Africa. And the, the third part of it, which I want to, to talk about, it relates also to Islam. And I want to think here, uh, 
maybe moving away from uh, the current subject of, 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 of discussion to other thinkers who have, who have also helped us to comprehend these two uh, uh, spiritualities, Islam and Christianity, that perhaps if we go to the work of Edward Blyden, uh, we go to the work of uh, Kwame Nkrumah Consciousism, we go also to the work of Al-Mazuri, Triple Heritage, we can begin to see some, some ways of actually uh, reclaiming uh, Christianity as part of African spirituality. And the, the idea which actually comes from al mazuri which is more interesting, is that one of saying, uh, God Muhammad is not actually supposed to be geographically located in Arabia. Because there was a time when Arabia and the North Africa were one before the, the tectonic split, which actually created Arabia. So there is, there is also need to think about the borderings of, uh, of spiritualities and therefore giving them a geography when in reality they are actually atmospheric in its content. So that, that to me will be the few remarks which I will say in terms of how we can uh, claim Christianity, Islam, and, and, and as part and parcel of the plurality of spiritualities in Africa. <clears throat> Kaunda, there's a question for you from Samuel Nkrumah Pobi that if Pentecostals find themselves between liminality or thought space, are they mimicking Christ? Is Christ, does Christ fall within this space? And Samuel Nkrumah's uh, Kobe cites John 1, 12 and 13. You can read the question on the chat. Do we have any person who wants to make a contribution so that we don't slight anyone? Okay, Kaunda, do you want to respond? I think I will respond it, uh, from to this question again, taking uh, the, the the question back to uh, Wariboko's argument, because Wariboko in fact argues that uh, the Pentecostal is baptized in the spirit. That's what he argues. Every believer who, who, who comes to Christ is baptized in the spirit. And by doing so, that believer gets into the spirit and they become a spirit themselves. So the Christ is the spirit. And I think that's why I was doing this distinction that probably Wadiboko has not done himself in terms of distinction between the macro spirits, which is the small ones, and then the, the, the micro, sorry, and the macro spirit. So the macro spirit is the spirit. And then there are these small spirits that are actions or spirits within the main spirit. So Pentecostals themselves, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit bringing a, a little bit confusion even in uh, what Boko's thinking himself a bit in there. Because it's almost like you ask a student to write uh, uh, a key research question and then they provide it and then you ask them to ask four or five questions to answer the key question. So then the key question is the macro and then the small question are answers to the main question, but yet they are questions as well. So that kind of thing that comes in Wariboko, in terms of these uh, Pentecostal, they become imitators of Christ. And that's why Wariboko says that they are trapped, in fact. They are trapped within the spirit because they have to be almost these little spirit Christ. They have to exist to mimic Christ. So they become imitators of Christ in that sense, according to what, what Boko says. And I think that makes a lot of sense when you, you push it for, to that angle, because that's what people want to say. Maybe what Boko can help on this one as well. <laughs> the, the, the main man. <laughs> I'm resisting the temptation to ask him to talk. IJ said, should I ask him? No, let's let him enjoy the conversation. Uh, and he can talk in the evening. Do we have people who want to have other comments? Um, God knows Igali. 
Igali ask a question here. Ambassador Igali, you want to, can you unmute him so he can ask a question? Obina, are you there? Can you unmute Igali? Please. Zona. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I, I think my question is my question is my question is quite clear. But you can uh, say listen to the very exciting uh, debate. Mm -hmm. Can you can you hear me? Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Go okay. ahead. Yes, the debate the debate and the, the debate and the expositions are quite clear, exciting. Uh, but but I have a problem. The problem is that Pentecostalism in many climes, many domains has come to stay, particularly uh, not only in West Africa, but all of Africa. And I'm happy that we have a lot of uh, contributions from the experience in the Philippines where Pentecostalism is very strong. The, the question is, to what extent do we have a trickle down um, realization of this debate? Uh, on leaders of the Pentecostal sects, because Pentecostalism affects hundreds of millions of people. And people need to understand this problematic and the conflict that we're trying to discuss. If we speak among ourselves, then it ends with ourselves. So I would like to have uh, some thoughts, uh, hear some thoughts on to what extent uh, we are here, <laughs> we don't have uh, perhaps maybe apart from uh, uh, Professor Count Hewis and Assemblies of God, the minister, we don't have any of the big uh, uh, Pentecostal leaders, particularly in a place like Nigeria, uh, the, the, the uh, ones that control millions of people. We don't have any of them or their top level people here to take part in this conversation with us. Uh, how do we have uh, a trickle down effect uh, of these thoughts so that uh, leaders of the, the churches, leaders of the denominations uh, will understand that uh, there is a, a conflict here. That, that is basically what has been bothering my mind. Mm. Oh, if you frame it along Thank that you. line, can we shift it to personal interactions between you and I human beings and the state uh, because there are various layers of mediations. It is not just a spiritual mediation. Um, part of this plate is also interactional at various levels, humans and humans, humans and gods, humans and the state, um, and in some other writings, you see transactional agencies. The arguments in terms of how we see God as our brother and how, just as you're asking Buari to serve you in Nigeria, to give you good roads and good health. People go to church for God to do exactly the same. And in that transactional relationship, they are making this project far more elastic. And if you see the argument by Rice and Kaunda, it is this elasticity that is shaping their thought system. I don't see much of a disagreement between them. I, 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 I really love the argument. But the, the connections that spiritual agencies are making to, to uh, existentialism, the bigger debates on survival, and the projects of elevating poverty do produce, in my own thinking, complicated thought systems. So sometimes they can, they, they, sometimes where I say is, 
sometimes you just can't stand on their own because my minds in their complications are connected not just to the spirit but to just daily realities of living and i'm glad that um both monteli and kaunda they double as scholars and as preachers and because they double as scholars and as preachers they are interpreting they are interpreting words of god in a context in which human beings are also asking god to do things for them so when kaunda brought in the epistemology of the yoruba i thought that the could you respond to that uh defining the notion of orisha in terms of that which you fragment that which you break into pieces and it brings in the example of you want children you go to the goddess of fertility you want money you go to the god of money you want power you go to the goddess of uh, osiris for power you you can see how as we construct our ambitions and expectations we are also complicating this project of the split because we are also speaking for god and interpreting ourselves in this process um that will be my own reflections on this on this multi layers uh, because it it is multi layers simply because the variables one of you said it doesn't fix that variable does not fix its categories how do you fix categories if the variables are complex and plastic so rice and counter you want to respond i'm complete oh you are not you can hear me i'm sorry kaunda you want to respond yes i totally agree with what you have said prof i, I think that is important and then i want to also make just a brief response to um to 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 prof and the question that is raising about how do we bring the reality i think this is a very complex question i I, Professor Rice uh, said that I think we, there is a need of uh, trying to condense, uh, summarize Wariboko's ideas, and then probably doing that, putting them in some form of a handbook for ministers, so that uh, they move from just a platform of scholarly to, to begin to reach people on the ground. I think it's imperative. I think one of the tasks of, 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 of African scholars today is to move ideas from uh, the abstract dimensions because then they, if they remain at that platform, they become God and inaccessible to the people on the ground. So we need to, to, to remove the God aspect out of scholarship and push them on the ground by making uh, these, I think uh, Prof Wariboko, uh, this, that's where we can be helped, trying to condense these ideas so that uh, the, the ordinary person in the rural area can try to understand what is going on and trying to focus on translating some of these ideas as well into the local languages. I think that the African scholarship has been very weak in that regard, uh, very, very weak in fact, because uh, most of the people don't understand what has been going on. African churches are not informed by African scholars, are informed by scholars who are saying other things. I think it's high time well, the ideas from uh, our scholars started informing the church in Africa, shaping the mindset and the struggles of a conventional African pastor as it were. So I think the Pentecostal, to, to just go to the last aspect, the Pentecostal is itself a split in African spiritualities. Because as you can see, it's, it's, it's such a large movement that uh, we have now, thousands of people following uh, ministers all over the place as well. So we, we have to, 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 to reconfigure how is this movement making a difference? Because if we just let to its own devices, the danger is what actually the other uh, prof talked about. Uh, we continue to having the mess and the challenges that we are having. So I believe that the variables are so scattered and uh, Prof. Wariboko tries to bring some of those elements together. So we need to also condense them so that uh, they can filter to the ground as well somehow. Professor Rice, you want to talk? 
on muting, please, Obina. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Dr. Uh, Balola, I, let me first say thank you for engaging us Pentecostals and taking interest in um, our problems, yet also recognizing our promise. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think there is a, another tension in Warren Barco's Split God book that we are touching on. And the tension is, I can't find the exact quote that I was looking for, but all through the preface and the introduction, Warren Barco keeps stressing how he is observing grassroot Pentecostalism. He's looking at us at the grass roots, specifically West African Pentecostals. Now I have spent time in Africa. I spent, I have uh, uh, lived in both East and West Africa, not much, just a little. So I appreciate that he's trying to describe Pentecostals at the grassroots, what we are like in our daily life. But, yes, uh, he is using uh, critical methodologies, which kind of complicates things. But he's actually describing the primary theology, the experience of Pentecostalism, but he uses critical theory as his method, his lens. So it's like a, a cycle, a circle. Water Barco starts at the bottom. He starts with us in our daily life. And he looks at us through the microscope of critical theory. And then he has translated that into a book. So when I look at the question from um, Dr. Uh, what, what is it? Ba Balote. Is that right? When exactly. I look at your question, it's like now we have to retranslate Dr. Wariboka. We have to translate him back into the grassroots. I think the only way that we could uh, 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 translate this to Pentecostal leaders, that's the question you're asking. We have to retranslate the book now. We have to retranslate the concepts. I think the onus falls actually on Dr. Nimi. <laughs> he, he now needs to retranslate it into uh, ordinary language that we can understand at the grassroots level. Thank and you. That is my response. Thank you very much. Uh, Obina, can you please tag them um, Chukugoziam Onyangwa, you see here, because I want to begin to uh, hand this panel. Obijole, can you tag him? And um, Daniel Shishima. Andrew Adega. Butisi. Butisi and Amisha, we need to know those who are here. This is there. Can you tag him and begin to untag um, Kaunda and Rice and Saje? What is this here? Welcome. Is Obijole here, Obijole? Pichola is not here. Shishima, Adiga, not here. Amisha. I think some people are confusing the time zone. That's, I think, what is going on. The time zone is creating problems for some people. Because I got that. 
I got an email by someone a moment ago. Obina, can you check the list and see who is here? Chukugosia is here. Chukugosia is here. She's, I can see her name here. Yes. Can you tag her, please? Ah, thank you. Uh, can you locate another person, please? Do you see someone else that I can that I miss? Did I did you see anyone? No. Please. Abebe, should I give you a few minutes to say something? Abebe, before we move to our next panel, Abebe, please. Can you unmute Abebe? Abebe is on. Abebe is here. If... Okay, okay. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah, please. Okay, uh, I think uh, there are two questions Two questions are raised from participants uh, that I seen from chat chatting. Uh, the first question says that how the economic misses, especially agriculture by shifting cultivation of uh, uh, northwestern Ethiopia, peoples of Ethiopia, over time impacted uh, of whatever the religions they practice at the present. It says, uh, you know, of course. Uh, the religious practice of the people have uh, it is it is an impact on uh, economic activity. But uh, here my article is to focus it on um, on especially on what we are identifying or exploring the economic activity of those Shinasha society in the northwestern Ethiopia, and uh, uh, how are they are really. Uh, the debating issues, whether there are some scholars are saying they are not shifting converters, but rather they are sedentary agriculturalists, uh, and others are not. Therefore, I'm debating or analyzing that available sources and evaluating those uh, issues. And the other point of our, my presentation is what are the, what, what are the effects? So what was the effect of this shifting cultivation on on the society in that part also of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, therefore, uh, of course, those societies in terms of religion, they are, they were, uh, they are followers of uh, Orthodox Christianity and uh, the religion itself had its own different uh, impact, which means a number of uh, holidays, which not allowed people to practice what uh, different kinds of uh, agricultural activities. In those times, uh, people were not allowed to cultivate or engage in economic basis or economic activity. Therefore, this had its own impact uh, uh, affecting the, 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 the economic activities or level, the level of productions. Uh, having this says, uh, I proceed to the second questions uh, raised by uh, participant is the place of the woman, uh, Shinasha woman, in terms of access to farmlands uh, in Ethiopia uh, or the, in that part of the region, and what are the roles and the contribution in the in the composition of the labor forcing or the labor organizing in terms of shifting cultivation. Uh, this is one question that raised it. 
Therefore, uh, in Shimasha, you know, shifting cultivation is uh, the main occupation of the both men and women. Both of them, both and women are actively participate or involved in uh, shifting cultivation. Uh, therefore, during this time, there is a clear division of labor uh, to follow, uh, which, co which causes gender differences in terms of participation, which means men are working uh, during shifting cultivation actively in clearing of the big trees acquired for the new plots of land, whereas uh, women work on transporting, transporting pro producer products after cultivation or after farming to, uh, to grain stores. Therefore, what we understand here is that there is a clear division of labor um, of uh, gender-based labor divisions between uh, men and women uh, in, in those particular societies. Uh, another important point is that there is uh, uh, gender issues, which is more relevant, uh, especially in the labor organization, where, when the labor sharing organizations, which means uh, the la labor sharing is one of important activities, um, which is more, more, more uh, predominant among those society. Therefore, uh, in the reciprocal activity, the, the, there is a reciprocal labor sharing activities. Uh, during this, you know, the, uh, these activities are performed with availability or ability of the women because the labor sharing organization is required that different uh, materials like uh, refreshment materials like food, drinking and others. Without having this, no, no one in those societies can conduct the labor sharing uh, activity among those societies. Therefore, the role of the woman is very important uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this aspect. Therefore, uh, today or recently, uh, the, the farming practice of the Shinasha, one can determine that uh, the absence of uh, the woman in household activities equal to just uh, non-existence of agricultural activities, which means that uh, the role of the women is very significant and very important uh, for agricultural performances in the, in the society. Therefore, they were not passive uh, participants, but simply which is follow the orders, but rather they are part and parcels of uh, and pillars of the family to uh, for the formation of the family itself. Therefore, they have the great important, but but the problem is that in um, in Shinasha in, in, in society in northwestern part of Ethiopia, uh, and men, men or and females, men or and females are not allowed to have their own holding of the land until they get married. Uh, therefore, after marriage, they have right to own their own land and their own to they have right to own their families uh, and other issues. Therefore, this is uh, what prevalent in uh, uh, in Shinasha society concerning the role of the women in relation to division of the labor and as well as labor organization. That is all uh, that I want to say. Thank you very much. That Thank you, thank you for the comment on Ethiopia, uh, which is undergoing um, a serious crisis as we speak. And the question for Ethiopia and for Egypt is, why are those biblical societies not doing well? This is, this is societies created before Jesus Christ. Um, the argument that we make with respect to Ghana, Nigeria, is that these are new formations, these are new democracies. Some people would defend them. West African governments will say, you are in a hurry. This country just became independent 60 years ago. But what do you say about Ethiopia? What do you say about Egypt? that had existed since the Pharaonic times, still battling with issues of democracy. Thank you so much. As we move to this third panel, 
It's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce um, the chair, Professor Samuel Salanga of Bethel University. Uh, we cannot be luckier than to have him as chair because he's one of the most um, engaged and talented in the analysis of development issues in relation to culture, to religion. And he's made so many profound arguments, tying them to leadership and even saying that maybe we should be trying some alternative models of development. We've gained um, 12 minutes and I will ask Professor Samuel Salanga to use those 12 minutes in a long introductory remark, reminding us about issues of religion and development, issues of how plural societies, it comes from a society of Christians and Muslims and is a minority. How do they become part of our understanding of the African project? And to what extent do we deal with issues of religion and development? What happens if you are a minority? What happens to you if you are a Muslim in India? What happens to you if you are a Christian in China? And as in his own case, what happens to him as a Christian in Islamic Bauchi? Welcome, Professor Salanga. Please, Obina, can you unmute our chair, please? Yes, I think I've been unmuted. Ah, thank you. Please. Yes, Go ahead. Sir. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, be invited to chair this uh, panel. I am very humbled by the comments of Professor Toyin Falula, and I know there are many erudite scholars here uh, that I know. Um, so I consider it a great opportunity to just be invited to chair this um, panel. Uh, my, the brief comments I would like to make about religion is to start by saying that I never, even though I was born a Christian and in a very, in a predominantly Islamic part of Nigeria, but I never took it very serious in terms of development until when I did my uh, doctoral research where I compared the role of ruling elites coalition in development policy formulation and implementation in Malaysia and Nigeria. So I was just collecting the data, but then when I was in Malaysia, I found out that, oh my God, you cannot really understand development without taking religion very seriously. And in that case, of course, it was uh, Islam under when Malaysia was under Mahathir Mohammed. And I had the opportunity during that time to compare Islam in Nigeria, especially Northern Nigeria and Islam in Malaysia. And I found out that it really played a very important role in shaping development. So from there, I became very interested, even though when I was in graduate school, I never took any course in religion. But subsequently, when I started teaching, I started teaching a course of religion in society. And over time, I became very persuaded about the role of religion in human society. And in terms of how religion shapes development, I think one of the things that I would like to say in general is just that many people tend to think religion is just either good or religion is either bad. But I think when we look broadly in the literature, we're going to find out that um, there are a lot of things in religion that can inspire people to contribute to development and to recognize the humanity of other people. And it was indeed because of uh, my teaching of that course that all, always when I start teaching a course, I would ask my students to bring the answer to these two questions. What does it mean to be human and what do we owe each other for being human? I understand that in the kind of modern world that we live in, uh, many people's sense of meaning probably may come from other sources, but by and large, for the majority of people, when they think about making meaning out of their lives, which is something very, very important, religion is one of those things that they cannot escape. So for that reason, if we're going to uh, shape Africa's development, the issue is not like, whether we agree with what people believe in or we do not agree, but that's the place where we have to start because 
for a lot of people, this is what gives them the broad sense of uh, meaning in this world and how they engage the how they engage social reality, how they engage nature, and how they relate with each other. So this is why this topic, in my view, is really very, very uh, important for us in terms of understanding the contemporary uh, issues that relate to Africa's development. Now, we know, for instance, that uh, religion never remains the same, uh, even though sometimes uh, people think that it is just fixed. Just uh, yesterday, I made a presentation at a church here, I was invited to make a presentation in the colonial church in a diner, Minneapolis, on the relationship between capitalism and the struggle for social justice, which is something that is also very important. So religion can contribute to the study of social justice, but it can also be a means that people really justify indirectly injustice, because I was focused on the comparison of, between um, evangelicals of the right and evangelicals of the left. They read the same passages in the Bible, but they come up almost with diametrically opposed interpretation. So um, I wouldn't want to take so much time uh, introducing myself on the subject matter. Um, I know the panel is supposed to start at seven o'clock. Are we supposed to proceed now or do we have some? We can proceed, which is good for us. But meanwhile, yeah. Let me introduce um, Dr. Tami Danagogo, okay. who joined us. Um, he used to be secretary to the River State Government uh, and the former Minister of Sports, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thanks for joining us, uh, Tami Danagogo. We are very grateful. Uh, we have... Um, Three members of the Opana are here. Okay. Chukugoziam Onyangwa, Andrew Phillips Adega, and Analisa Butisi. So you can give them 20 minutes each, and we can um, thereafter begin to take questions. I okay. yield the floor to you, sir. Okay, can I get the names of those present? Because I have a list here of those present. But Onya, Onyawa, you can see them. You can see them oh. on the screen. Okay, okay. Onyawa, Butusi, and Adega. Okay. Onyawa, Butusi, and Adega. Okay. Um, okay, in this case, let's begin by... Uh, having Onyawa and let me see, I'm just trying to see. Okay, we're going to begin by him, but before I do that, I would just like to just make one statement or two about Professor Wari Boko because- Please go uh, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have five something, minutes. Okay, there's something I want to say very important to me about him because um, I first came to know him through uh, Professor Emma's Young, who was my colleague at Bethel University. And uh, initially when I was introduced to him, <laughs> I was a little bit uneasy because of the politics in Nigeria. Sometimes if you get somebody from another region of the country, all those kind of things. So, but since that time, um, we had very close uh, interaction. And I'm sorry to say, but when I read, when I exchange emails with people or things like that, I'm very careful in seeing how <laughs> they communicate. And one of the things that I found very, very profound about him was just the way he carries himself. Um, many people who have accomplished so much in life like him would probably make you feel like you're nobody, you're not important or something like that. But the humility that comes across uh, in the way he interacts with people in spite of his accomplishment for me is what compels me to have just great respect and admiration for him. And I remember last year around this time, we met at uh, Boston when I went for the African Studies Association and I was so humbled by the fact that he took some time to spend with me. We went to a restaurant and ate. So it's, it was a very profound experience uh, for me. So Professor Wariboko, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that you continue to be an inspiration an inspiration for a lot of people, not just me. Thank you very much. So with that said, um, let's start with the first uh, speaker, which would be uh, 
Professor, I don't have the information, but that would be Professor Onyawa. Is that correct? No, I'm not a professor. Thank you very much. Jeff. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So in that case, since we have three people and we have one and a half hour, I think you will have up to probably 20, 25 minutes or something like that. All right. Thank you. Uh, 20, 20 minutes because we have to have the conversation as well. Okay, 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 okay. 20 minutes. Thank you very much. I want to, first of all, uh, say thank you to Professor Falola for creating this uh, atmosphere and uh, 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 calling this conference. And uh, I thank every one of us uh, participating, honoring uh, Professor Nimi. Prof is a personal friend of ours. So I'm coming from a personal, not necessarily academic or theological perspective. Nimi and I, first of all, met way back in 1993 uh, over a conversation, an argument. Nimi loves debates, uh, intellectual discourses. Uh, over uh, then, uh, MQ Abiola had won the election in Nigeria and uh, at the cost of being pronounced the president-elect, uh, the thing was cut short and then we had all kinds of crises. So in Nigeria at that time, most, most, most discussions were focused on that. So I remember meeting him uh, at All States Trust Bank where we were uh, So we can hear you. So I guess he has connection problem. Okay, yeah, I noticed that we are not hearing him so. Hmm. You see, he's off. <laughs> Maybe you will join us again. Okay. So in the meantime, then we might have to proceed to the next speaker who is available. That would be Patuti. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's on. I can see him. Oh, is he back? <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, back. He's, he's back. Oh, okay, okay. I cannot see him, that's why. Can we unmute Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see him now. Can see him. Yeah. yeah. He should be unmuted then. He's still mute. Uh, Obina, yeah. you, can, you can unmute him. All right. Check me. Oh, no. Am I the person supposed to unmute him or somebody else? I thought somebody else would unmute him. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things uh, I want to say about uh, Nimi uh, is his, of course, everybody knows uh, of his academic uh, uh, interests. Uh, and so, he, Nimi is a consummate academician and very much at home on any subject matter. So most times uh, I, I, I pick his brains whenever I have very serious uh, challenges on any matter. Uh, I, I ask him questions and he answers. And then Nimi was very instrumental in assisting with a book, the first book I published, uh, which is on uh, Amazon. Uh, I, 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 I gave it to him because Nimi is also a, a theologian. I gave it to him to, to read, and he read. And of course, if you know anything about Nimi, you never give Nimi anything, and he returns it to you the way he gave it to him. Nimi will see things from different perspectives, and he will add uh, a lot to what you gave him. So Nimi add a lot of depth, added a lot of depth to what uh, became of the book. And... Uh, uh, Another thing I enjoy about Nimi is that he's a very focused and serious-minded person. Whatever Nimi does, he wants to he wants to know everything about that. And uh, I give two or three examples. Uh, Nimi started uh, first of all uh, when he became a banker. Uh, even though he had a first-class degree in economics, University of Port Harcourt, 
But now he was a banker, but he felt that he needed more. He needed to know more uh, in terms of banking. So he went for an MBA. And in going for an MBA, uh, at, he chose Columbia University because I asked him why Columbia University. He said, he said Columbia University uh, was the number one business school in the world and in the US in those days. You know, So I mean, you can imagine uh, that thinking, what he stands for. So he went, he chose the best and went to the best. And then in doing this master's, probably he didn't feel challenged enough doing an MBA. So he did a double MBA and the master's in accounting. And then he came back, continued his banking career until God called him to full-time ministry. Now God called him to full-time ministry again to show the kind of person Nimi is. Nimi felt, look, Reading the Bible is not enough. Let me go and study theology. So now Nimi starts another career, another profession entirely. Now he has left uh, banking and uh, Wall Street, uh, banking and etc. He now went to do, uh, first of all, he started BS, a bachelor's in uh, theology at Ora Roberts University from there to master's and then to PhD. And I look at this guy, I'm also a pastor. I'm also preaching, but I mean, it, it, it speaks to the person that Nimi is, that Nimi wanted to excel in what, in his calling. He chose to go to Ora Roberts University and uh, he did a PhD. And then from there, as we can see today, uh, not only is he in theology, he's also in ethics and, and stuff like that. And again, uh, to speak to the kind of person Nimi is, whatever Nimi does, he, he does it to the best, the very best of his ability. Whatever he believes in, he gives it his best. He, he pursues it irrespective of uh, whether he is against popular opinion. And I give an example. In 2014, in Nigeria, the president was somebody from the South South, the Jo Nation, uh, where Nimi comes from. And uh, Everybody would have expected that Nimi would have uh, thrown his heart to his at his corner, but Nimi believed in what was coming up, and uh, he pitched his tent with the opposition, and and did a lot of research for the opposition. It was it became like their engine room, and he came out and told me something that he discovered. He said. To be president in Nigeria, you have to be very rich because he broke it down. He broke it down to every word in Nigeria. He told me there were about 14,000 and so words and the 774 local governments. And if you needed two or three candidate uh, persons to oversee your election in every world, and you are gonna give them 20,000 Naira, he did the maths and told me that it's gonna cost a lot. So uh, me pays great attention to details. One of the impacts Nimi has had on us at Embony Technical Services Limited, because Nimi also uh, is a consultant. Uh, he has been consulting for CBN in Nigeria and the Nigerian government. Uh, so Nimi, at his spare time, whenever he was in Nigeria, did some consulting work with us at Embony Technical Services Limited. And one of the things he taught us, he talked about excellence. He said, Nimi's definition of excellence is, excellence is doing the next small thing. Mm -hmm. Excellence is not in big things, but in the next small thing. He said, you come into an office, you look up, you see the clock is low, it's late, mm -hmm. it's low or fast. There's something wrong. Somebody's not doing their duty right. And, and he said, in those little, little things. So I begin to wonder, doesn't our country need this great thinking mind to come and look at some of the fundamentals that are wrong with our country and uh, and help us, amen. Again, uh, some of the other things I, I want to say about Nimi, Nimi plays, lays a lot of emphasis on education, education. And I give a personal, a personal uh, example. When our twin boys were born five years ago, one of the things Nimi told me and encouraged me to do was to open uh, an education trust fund for them. And since then, every year, 
Nimi gives us a check. He said, look, this is for the children's education. And every year he gives me a check. He says, put, put in the account for their education. So that, that speaks to the kind of, uh, the kind of thinking. And uh, on a personal level, Nimi is a very, very, I don't know if people know him that well, but I thank God for chairman. You said when you visited Boston, he took you off uh, to the restaurant. You guys had time together. Nimi is a very compassionate person. Uh, Nimi will not see anybody uh, going through any any challenge without lending a helping hand, uh, you know, and uh, and, and that, that 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 is quite touching, you know, that is quite touching. Uh, anytime uh, I I remember when I personally came to Boston uh, uh, to to Harvard Business School, Nimi would pick me at the airport anytime I was coming. He's, in spite of his uh, busy schedules and lectures, he would pick me at the airport. We'll go home. We'll eat and then he'll take me to school and uh, on on Sundays or weekends when I had the time you know he'll come pick me and uh, we'll hang out together etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, of course I enjoy all those uh, academic uh, discussions and again Nimi is research minded one of the things I learned about Nimi is that uh, knowledge is never wasted whatever whatever catches his fancy he pursues it for example for example, Nimi was in Liverpool, and uh, for a, for a for a seminar that he was speaking at, and then at his spare time he went to the slave museum. He went to read about the slave trade from West Africa, and in one of the interviews he had with Professor Falola that I listened to, uh, he he spoke about some of his findings, uh, and uh, one of the things. Uh, uh, when he talked about uh, the people killed their gods, their god, how the sharks used to follow the slave vessel and get unsure. So, so where, where I'm talk, where I'm going to is the fact that the me was in Liverpool, and Liverpool was known uh, played a very major and prominent role in the slave trade. So he decided to go to the slave trade museum to to learn about this and. Uh, Another thing that has also impressed me about Nimi, on a personal note, Nimi used to come to Nigeria and uh, will spend some time with us. I noticed that Nimi, even though he's a professor of theology, but Nimi has a very strong relationship with God. So uh, Nimi is not a good singer, but Nimi, as poor singer as he is, will, at 4 a.m., between 3, 4, and 4.30 in the morning, you will hear Nimi's voice shouting and singing praise to his God, to the almighty God, you know? And, uh, and that, that touched me, you know? That touched me that in spite of the fact that he doesn't have a very good voice, a singing voice, but he sings praise to God. Uh, Nimi has a very close relationship with God. And one of the things, uh, maybe later when Professor Falola will allow Nimi to talk, I would like to know, uh, because uh, sometimes in, in the Pentecostal uh, uh, segments of Christianity that we belong to, uh, we know that we lay a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Now, many of us Pentecostals, we have tended to lie that it is the Holy Spirit when we know that it's probably not the Holy Spirit. I, I, I would like Prof to speak in that regard, you know, if uh, uh, as Pentecostals, where where do we begin to draw the line when you know you know when people begin to do some outrageous things uh, in the name of the the spirit, you know? But we we should also remember that we Galatians five sixteen says we should walk in the spirit and not and not the flesh, so that we don't fulfill the loss of the flesh. Because if we if we, for example, uh, do what we want to do and blame it on the Holy Spirit, we are fulfilling the loss of the flesh. But the Bible says we should walk in the Spirit, and the one that is led of the Spirit cannot fulfill the loss of the flesh. I will want Prof to speak to that and see how we can uh, bring some correction to some of the so, to some of the errors we see in Pentecostalism. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I will yield my time in case there are there are uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Chair, 
uh, Professor Salanga, please notice that uh, we are now five, two other members have joined so that you can follow our, our advertised schedule. Obio, Obio, Obi Jole will be the next person from our list. Do you have the program? Yeah. Please unmute. Uh, please unmute. Just can't unmute the... yourself. Okay. So it means they would have probably about, because we have 90 minutes for the yeah. session, right? And if there are five people, then they would probably have lesser minutes in order for everybody to get enough time to speak, if I am correct. So let's have some discussion about or questions or comments about his presentation for about four minutes, five minutes, and then we proceed, please. Are there any comments or? Sometimes you have to look at the chat. Sometimes people make comments on the chat. Yes, yes. I was trying to look at it, but I didn't see any question that was written on the chat. I have the chat by the side of the screen. I would like to, on my own, make a comment before somebody makes that. One of the things that really brought my interest very close to that of Professor Waribako, Waribako, Waribako was that when I was trying to look at the relationship between capitalism and religion, I was just checking online and then I found his books. It's so amazing. It's very rare to get a theologian who can speak on both sides, both talking about religion and both talking about uh, economics. And I appreciate what the speaker, for instance, really said about how uh, he wants Professor Wariboko to talk about times when religion can go a little bit off kilter in terms of bringing about development. I appreciate that very much. So that's just what I want to make an observation in commendation of the presenter. Is there any other comments or question? Okay, if there's none, I think we will proceed to the next presentation, which is titled The Politics of Immanence in Nigerian Pentecostalism and African Traditional Religions. And the presenter is uh, Professor Butichi at Georgetown University. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. <laughs> okay. So you have 10 minutes. Hello. Or oh, mute her. She's, she's yeah, yeah. I'm Obijale. Can I speak? Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Whom do you want? I am Obijale. Oh, um, um, did you call? Oh, I, I call. am Obijale. Okay, let him Obijale continue. Let okay, let, let continue. You have ten minutes, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah. my dear professor. So in Falola, I want to thank you immensely for the privilege to take part in this conference. I am Olubayo Obijole from the University of Ibadan, Department of Religious Studies. My area is New Testament studies. And um, I'm interested particularly in Nimi Wariboko's Pentecostalism. He has worked on many areas. But one area I have not seen much that he had done is in the area of women leadership in the church. And so in my paper, I'm looking at uh, leadership of women, particularly female gender leadership in the um, Pentecostal church in Nigeria. And what I've done is to create a base from the Bible I do that women leadership in the Old Testament. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You are hearing me. Oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, so I begin by looking at women leadership in the Old Testament, uh, women leadership in rabbinic Judaism, women leadership in the intertestamental period. New Christianity of St. Paul. And um, time would not permit me to go into all those details now. But what is important to note is that women leadership did not just emerge. It took quite a while. 
First, women were in a patriarchal society where society is male dominated. And so women were not allowed, they were seen, but not heard. However, in the Old Testament, women were known to uh, participate in the temple and uh, to burn, to put on candles and to lead festivals. And in, 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 in Hellenistic period, women became very prominent, particularly in the Roman world. Uh, and they too had some leadership in the society. And that can more or less be the basis for leadership uh, when Christianity started. But it's important to mention that Jesus himself never endorsed any female leadership. Among the 12 that he appointed that as apostles or disciples, he didn't appoint any woman leader. But by the time Paul came in as an apostle and planter of the church, he was very ambivalent. On one hand, he allowed women to be prophets or prophetesses to speak and to prophesy. But at the same time, apart from when they prophesied, women were not allowed to speak in the church. Now, when you compare that with our own African indigenous situation, women too are not seriously recognized in the African world. On one hand, women were seen and not heard too. They could only uh, uh, be obedient to their husbands at home. Uh, but the, the revolution is that when the church came to Africa, the established churches did not allow women. But when the Pentecostal church came, particularly the classical Pentecostal churches, uh, mainly the Apostolic Church and uh, First Core Gospel Church, they allowed a measure of women leadership in the Pentecostal church. But when the indigenous Pentecostal now came in, like maybe Redeemed Church of God uh, and some others, it became uh, the practice for women to become uh, leaders of the church. They either became uh, primates or prelates or archbishops or bishops, or they also uh, became assistant superintendents under their husbands, where the man is the superintendent. They became the AGO, uh, operation officer, and she great in the And so we found in this paper an array of women who are given opportunities to become female uh, leaders of churches. Here in Ibadan, where I am, there is a, a Agbala Daniel Church, which is uh, headed by uh, Archbishop Dokas Olaniyi. Uh, is on the expressway towards Ojo here in Ibadan. I'm sure that uh, Professor Toyin Falola must have known him, known her, because uh, she was a prominent uh, a Pentecostal leader here in Ibadan. And there is a um, at, there is Archbishop Margaret Odeleke of Power Pentecostal Church. Another example, based here in Ibadan, and also with branches in Lagos. There is another woman um, who also happened to be in a church on Akure or War Road. Uh, in uh, Akure. You can even talk about many others in Eastern Nigeria and many parts of uh, Western and Midwestern Nigeria where women have taken top, top positions mm -hmm. in the leadership. This can be seen in my abstract, which is already in your hand. But what does this show us? It shows us that the Pentecostal church in Nigeria and in Africa have truly lived up to the unity of the human race 
particularly the uh, unity of uh, gender, and particularly that there are no human discriminations, no male, no female, no bond, no free, as we have in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 28. Women leadership in Nigeria is a practical demonstration of gender equality in the new life in Christ, and that women are also called to preach the gospel with boldness. Hence, some of them have planted churches and have served in local, national, and global churches. The church in Africa must continue to listen to the spirit and accord women their rightful place in the ministries of the church. And I think that bit is what I want to actually mention. I've written quite a lot on this. I've written on female leadership in the Old Testament, female leadership in the intertestamental period. I've written widely on women leadership in the New Testament, women leadership in the thought of St. Paul, and women leadership in the African indigenous um, Pentecostal, and even in the Aladura movement. Here in, uh, in Nigeria, again, women have taken the upper hand. There is, used to be one late Captain Abiodu Akishomo, who was head of the Cherubim and Seraphim Church. Um, authorities like uh, Professor um, Aki, uh, Professor Aki Omoya Jowo had written widely in this area. Um, he had written on KNS. And so women have played very prominent role in the life of the church. That in bit is the summary of what I want to present in this paper. And that is a major contribution to Wariboko's scholarship, uh, an area which he himself had not done much work yet, which we are advancing in this conference. Thank you and God bless you, sir. I will welcome any questions or comments on this uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the presentation and thank you very much for keeping to time also. I really appreciate that that gives us a lot of time for discussion. So I haven't seen any question or comment on the chat, but I would like to give some minutes for any question or comment. Is there anybody who has a comment or a question to We'll, we'll can come later. Okay. One of our presenter we can also come later and tie everything together. Okay. Then in this case, we're going to move to the next uh, presenter. And I noticed that as Professor Falola said, the other presenters are now here. So I'll just go by the list. So we have uh, Professor Shishima who is a Christian and the grand patron of Lordship of Christ Family Ministry in Makodi. And he has had position in various Nigerian universities. So uh, Professor Shishima, this is your time now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to first of all thank Professor Falora for this uh, opportunity and in particular, Professor Waribiku, Waribuku, sorry. Um, I've come across him on several write-ups. Uh, particularly, I think this contribution will help uh, because in this area of traditional medicine, I'm not seeing him so much. So I think that this will be a noble contribution. So I'm going to talk on African traditional religion and contemporary functionalism medicine and health is something which everybody needs and is paramount for well-being of all human beings uh, so because of this everybody tries to achieve health and goes to whatever length to be sure to be well now in this paper i've tried to look at the concept uh, traditional medicine, concept African religion. 
then the types, the HeLa, and then we have looked at the contemporary functionalism of traditional medicine, the challenges, and then we have tried to prefer a way forward. Now, what do we mean by African religion? It is a religion by the Africans, for the Africans, and it is practiced on the African soil. Though not written, it is written on the minds of the Africans. Traditional medicine is the botanity medicine, or you will call it indigenous medicine, which evolved within the people and the Africans use it here and there. And it is uh, uh, different from orthodox medicine, or which is sometimes called uh, Western medicine, or uh, European medicine. It is different from it. Uh, this is more or less herbal medicine, so to speak. Now, the people believe that the herbal medicine and African religion are intertwined because the religion and medicine are buried in the same culture. So based on that, you cannot separate African religion from traditional medicine. So it is characterized by beliefs, by myths, by symbols, and by rituals. Now, what do we mean by medicine, by traditional medicine? We mean the medicine that evolved from the African soil and it is practiced by the Africans. The concept of medicine in African beliefs is different from that of the orthodox medicine. Medicine for Africans is a recipe of herbal mixtures, which can be used in meeting different needs of human beings. The basic ingredients would be herbs, would be plants, animal fiber, animal dons, or bats or trees. These are the basic ingredients. We have two types of medicine. There is good medicine, that is which is used for socially approved goals, and then we have bad medicine, those which are used for socially disapproved goals. This could be to kill, to harm, or whatever. Now, at the center of traditional medicine is the traditional healer. There are different classes of traditional healers. But principally, there is who, the person who is called the traditional medicine man. He is the one in charge of healing. He is derogatorily referred to as juju priest or witch doctor. But that is not his role. His role is mainly to heal. Although he performs other functions, and um, some of these functions include the healer, he's a diviner, he's a success maker, he's a protector, it's a judge, it's a custodian of the people's culture and religion. Now, apart from the medicine man, there are other healers. We have psychiatrists, we have physicians, we have wonder healers, we have herbalists, we have bone setters, and then we have diviners. Diviners are very important in the healing system because unlike the orthodox medicine, divination tries to explain what is hidden which the need some explanation. Divination also tries like a laboratory in orthodox medicine. So the diviner sees into the seed of time and tries to explain certain complexities, complexities in human life. So the healer is very important in the healing system. Now, why is African traditional medicine still functional despite the challenges? African traditional medicine is still functional because it is easily accessible. The people, the Africans believe in it and they also use traditional medicine. It is part of the African culture and it also looks at both the people's beliefs as well as their own health conditions. For instance, there is a belief that Somebody cannot just be ill. Somebody must be behind it. And this is what the Africans believe, which is against the beliefs of orthodox medicine. Again, because of the shortage of personnel and drugs in the orthodox uh, hospitals, 
Traditional medicine thrives a lot in African societies. Other issues include poverty of the Africans, particularly Nigerians. So many of them cannot afford uh, drugs. So all these make traditional medicine very useful. Uh, however, traditional medicine has a few challenges. Uh, some of these challenges have to do with uh, secrecy. The, 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 the medicine is shrouded in secrecy. Then some of them operate in unhygienic conditions. The problem of dosage is still there. Other issues concern globalization, Western education, Christianity, urbanization, and climate change. All these have some problems concerning um, traditional medicine. However, despite all this, traditional medicine is still making inroads within the up to this 25th uh, century. At present, traditional medicines are put in sachets. Uh, they're also bottled for sale. Uh, some traditional healers use modern equipment uh, like hand gloves, scissors, razor blades, and so on, in carrying out uh, their healing uh, processes. Also, there's a little bit of regulations of uh, dosage. So all this help traditional medicine uh, to continue to be used by the Africans. The way forward, we need to document traditional medicine for those yet unborn to read. And also for, because, uh, sorry, because the, some of the practitioners are passing on. Again, traditional medicine needs to be demystified. Some of these beliefs in incantations and so on, we need to demystify them. Again, the area of infrastructural development still has to be looked into so that we build modern hospitals for traditional healers. Training is also very important for traditional healers. Not only that, traditional medicine, we believe, should be integrated into modern, will be integrated with modern medicine for holistic healthcare. All this will put traditional medicine on a sound and better footing. Conclusion, we have seen that traditional medicine is still making some inroads, although it has some challenges um, in contemporary times, but it is still useful because it is accessible available effectively and afford affordable. So we now conclude that it should be integrated with orthodox medicine for holistic healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shishima for your presentation. And thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, as Professor uh, Fadola said much earlier, maybe we should leave the questions until the end so that, because I noticed that all the presenters are now here. So I want to make sure that all the presenters have the opportunity to present. So if you have a question, please uh, comment, just uh, jot it down somewhere and then later we can uh, have that. Um, our next presenter is um, Dr. Adega. Um, and Dr. Andrew Adega is a senior lecturer in the Department of Religion and Cultural Studies at Benue State University in Makodi, and his doctorate, his doctorate is in African traditional religion. So, um, Dr. Adega, if you are ready, it is now time for you to proceed. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I wish to first of all. Uh, thank the organizers of this conference, uh, Professor Hopalula, whom I heard and also read. Uh, I consider it a privilege to be invited to participate in this conference. Uh, uh, following this, I, I wish to express my <clears throat> My ignorance, perhaps because I'm in the area of African religion, 
I've not been so conversant with uh, Professor Wariboko's uh, write-ups, but from what I've heard from the proceedings of the conference, I think I've learned a lot. Uh, coming back to the main issue, I'm supposed to present on secret societies, fraternities, witches, wizards and sorcerers in African religion, uh, African religion cultural beliefs. And I, I want to start by acknowledging the fact that for the Africans, secret societies, fraternities, witches, wizards, and sorcerers are realities. Africans believe that these are real. And for those who say that they don't believe, of course, they do so at their own peril. Because for the Africans, these are realities in their own worldview. Now, secret societies, fraternities, witches, wizards, and sorcerers have one trade in common in African societies, and that is the perpetration of evil. Secret societies, fraternities, witches, and uh, uh, sorcerers are classified under mystical powers or, uh, or spiritual forces. They use the mystical powers in their possession to cause harm, including death to victims. Their activities are often under the cover of darkness. That is beyond the, 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 the physical here. Yeah. And the activities also go beyond scientific explanation. This is the preoccupation of this paper, which we will see in the succeeding uh, discussion. Now, in terms of uh, conceptual matters, we we'll begin with uh, secret societies. And the word secrecy is an ambiguous term which could mean so many things like mystery, privacy, hiddenness, results, silence, and unknowability. Tishma opines that the keeping of secrets is a characteristic of both culture, of both cult and religion. Definition-wise, secret society can be said to be, or a secret society can be said to be an organization which is known to exist but whose members and place of meeting and its general activities are not uh, publicly known. Uh, they, they can be classified into two, that is fatalities, which are male dominated and authorities, which are women dominated. And Civil societies have existed in Africa and Nigeria for long. That means it's not a new phenomenon. We have examples such as Oboni court among the Yoruba in Nigeria, the Poro among the Menda of Sierra Leone, and Okonko among the Igbo, Igbos of Nigeria. Uh, coming to institutions, Secret societies are known to operate uh, even to the uh, secondary and perhaps primary schools now in Nigeria. In 1952, the Pirates Confraternity was started by Professor Shoinka. After a period of 10 years, there was a break which brought about the sea logs, the Buccaneers. And the list is on ending. We have black brazier, uh, black cats, and the Amazons, and what I feel. Coming to witches and wizards, generally a, 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 a practitioner of witchcraft, male or female, uh, is a witch. Though uh, some scholars distinguish between uh, the, the, the male witch and the female witch. Uh, that is a witch for the female and a wizard for the male. Uh, however, 
in the consumption of this copper, a, a witch is a witch, a male or female. And by the activities, they are able to leave their bodies at home on their beds at night to travel for nocturnal meetings in trees, on uh, mountains, and so on, while their bodies are asleep. However, if anything happens to the witch while he or she is away on nocturnal meeting, then the body at home is harmed because it dies. Witches and wizards use animal familiars to carry out their activities, such as dogs, cats, bats, and the like. One can become a witch by either buying and selling. One can also become a witch by coercion from the witches. Or it could have, uh, the person could have it transferred from the parents uh, to the children. On the other hand, sorcerers, they are even practitioners of bad medicine. They prepare medicine to hurt others. That is why in my introduction, I said, future societies, witches, wizards, and sorcerers have one trade in common, and that is the perpetration of evil. And I, like I mentioned earlier also, these are realities in African cultural, religious cultural beliefs. Their existence, their activities, and effects are not in doubt at all. If one is doubting, it could be because of maybe his or her religious orientation, or that he or she is not an African. Now, it's also been not, to be noted that the activities of witches, witchcraft, uh, wizard, and sorcerers go beyond scientific explanation. Now, come to the role of secret societies, fraternities, which is wizards and sorcerers in African uh, societies. Basically, uh, this, these societies perform two functions, that is functional and dysfunctional roles in the society. However, it would seem that the dysfunctional roles overwhelm the functional roles. Talking about the dysfunctional role or role, secret societies, fraternities, witches, wizards, and sorcerers are able to cause harm, injury, and death to uh, their victims. They can send flies, snakes, and some other dangerous uh, animals to attack their victims so that even their spirit can be invoked to attack and possess their victims, whom mm. they eat spiritually, they eat the soul spiritually. Among the thief, the sorcerers could cause a person to appear in a mirror where he or she is stabbed and then is killed. So, these are some of the dysfunctional roles that they, they, they perform. Coming to the functional roles of which is civil societies uh, in African societies. The, their operation provides a framework for the explanation of evil. Uh, but this is the a way happenings occasioned by these uh, uh, spiritual powers and able to the Africans to explain why things are, are the way they are. Also, uh, uh, spiritual forces, uh, in the case of, uh, like witchcraft in the, in, in the case of the tea, is used as a means of social control. Students can be scared. Ask, don't go out, to, if you go out, something will happen to you, or you will see one dangerous animal there. Uh, and because of that, the, the children take caution. Secondly, uh, witches can apply their powers uh, into medicine. That is in, in cases like fracture, the treatment of fracture. Where yeah, a chicken, uh, ch uh, the part of a chicken will be broken. And as the healer, uh, 
the parents of the healing or the chicken, the person that uh, is affected by capture automatically gets sealed. Uh, so the secret societies perform religious functions like in the rise of passage for both adults and adolescents. Then we move the effect of secret societies, which is wizards and sorcerers in African society. Of course, uh, there's no gain saying that these uh, spiritual powers have caused a lot of havoc in African societies. Several have died. Many have been injured. Many have come to harm. So uh, some have been uh, bewitched. And there's fear in Africa so that uh, uh, most people spend considerable time trying to look for medicines to counter. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Sorry to interrupt this, but we're running out of time. So I will appreciate if you can summarize. <laughs> yes, Prof. And this has brought about on the development also. And uh, generally, people are even afraid to, to, to mingle with the people who have these spiritual powers. They are previous to their, the kind of people they mingle with. Now, mitigating the, uh, these societies, the paper calls for Africans to discourage the use of these uh, mystical powers because they create a lot of instability harm and death. In conclusion, these spiritual powers have their own role, but we are saying that those roles that are functional to be used far and above these ones that cause harm and death. They could be channeled, uh, they, I mean, those with mystical powers could channel their forces to looking for a cure for maybe Ebola, HIV, and now COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adega, for your presentation. And I will encourage all the participants to uh, write their comments or questions later on. We will have the time to go over them. Um, our next presenter is um, Dr. Anna Professor Annalisa Batichi. I apologize if I pronounce it incorrectly, please. But she is an assistant professor at Georgetown University, and the title of her presentation is The Politics of Immanence in Nigerian Pentecostalism and African Traditional Religions. So, Dr. Annalisa, it's now your time. Yes, thank you very much for organizing this uh, great conference in honor of Professor Wariboko. I would like to ask uh, to technical assistance to share um, a screening. So one of the hosts should help me to share the screening. Olusegun, maybe you can help me. You can authorize, yes, thank you so much, thank you. Okay, so um, just a few words. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly happy to be here today to, to be in your, in your company. And uh, there are one thing that I would like to say to the organizer, Professor Falola. Um, I remember a few years ago, I sent him a copy of uh, the book uh, Nagod, Aesthetics of African Charismatic Power. And he sent me one of the most beautiful thank you email that I have ever received in my life. So Professor Paula, thank you so much again for that beautiful email. And then I am particularly happy also to see uh, Professor Matthew uh, Ojo. Um, I have to thank him for so many things. And first of all, because uh, he was the one who introduced me to uh, Lagos and Pentecostal churches in, in, in Lagos. And he was the one who took me for the first time to the Mountain of Fire Miracle Ministries in uh, the Agege branch. I still remember that. 
so I always carry him in my uh, research and I am still so much grateful uh, to him for all his assistance and support. Thank you again, Professor Ojo, thank you so much. Um, so today um, I, I wanna present um, a little bit of my work and I wanna show how my work intersects with the work of Professor uh, Nimi Wariboko. I hope uh, he doesn't mind if I call him Nimi. Uh, because uh, we have been exchanging our ideas uh, for several years and he has, the been, he has been one of the most uh, uh, important uh, partner in conversation that I had in, uh, in my work on Nigerian Pentecostalism. So let me start reading about a little bit about my field work in Lagos. So there are moments of my field work in Lagos that will always remain on my mind. Please check your audio. And the intensity of the sound of human voices. Nimi, who um, uh, collaborated with one of his uh, essay, along with also Professor Ojo to this uh, very nice group, book. He also uh, described it, the prayer, described the prayer in this way. Prayer is a dynamo of excess energy, leaping like flames in a dry season, burning bush and heading straight from heart to the throne room of God. This na prayer, he writes. Indeed, in speaking with Pentecostals about their sensation, they describe the perception of a presence of an immanent, real and tangible power that touches them, presses them down to the floor, talks to them and speaks through them. This intense moment of immanence or perceived real presence, as I call it in my work, are, as Wariboko argued in his uh, book, Nigerian Pentecostalist, the engine of Pentecostal spirituality, as well as is Ashil Hills. It's straight and it's weakness at the same time. Nimi analyzes this moment of manufacturing the spirit in Nigerian Pentecostalism by focusing on the emotional energy that feels this being exposed coming to existence or a coming into presence. He argues that emotions are the engine of this moment of intense imminence or as we will see trans imminence. I definitely agree with Nimi, but in my work, I observed that there are other elements that generate this intense moment of presence. So in my books, I um, talked about the aesthetics of real presence to describe the combination of gesture, object, images, material form, and sensuous bodily regime through which people feel and perceive real and tangible supernatural presence. The Pictures that, you, that I am showing are part of my field work in Lagos at the Mountain of Fire Miracle Ministry, Redeemed Christian Church of God, and the photographer is Andrew Eziebo. And in these pictures, you can see what I, um, what we both, both Andrew and, and I tried to capture as this object, this body gesture, these sensations that generate this perceived real presence, this uh, um, um, experience of a real tangible God. This is uh, um, also in um, the um, headquarters of Mountain of Fire Miracles uh, Ministry in, uh, in Yaba. So in my work, I focus on the metaphysics and politics of the immanent as they address important existential questions and shape the political subjectivity of the people that experience them and also shape this extraordinary human divine connection. Um, 
In this book, I, I highlight how this prof the relationship between the fabrication of the divine and the supernatural and the conscious and the unconscious political claim of this religious community. So I try to show how this immanent presence contribute to the shaping of political subjectivities, to the shaping of a certain understanding of the role and place that people have in the society. Um, these aesthetics of presence are, um, are definitely um, can change over time and can include or exclude new object and subject. And here, for example, you can see also the role of technology in creating or shaping this, uh, this real presence or this immanences that I try to study as political devices that shape political imagination as well. So, um, how, how did I found um, Nimi works so intriguing and so revealing? Because when I was trying to understand um, that power, that kind of life force that was exuding from this moment of, of imminence, I also found that Nimi had a similar reflections why he was talking about the question of freedom and power in the Calabari religion. So I found this wonderful story that he also repeat, by the way, in the book, The Speed, the Speed God, and in two other books, one is the, on, on ethics and time and the other one um, is ethics and society in Nigeria. So he tells the story of the Calabari people that kill the shark uh, god. Um, and it has a specific name as is the Owo Akpana cult. So what happened? That people, when they feel betrayed by their god, in that case was a shark, what do they do? They kill the shark. This story, as Nimi linked it to the question of religious and powers, made me deeply reflect on what I was observing at the Mountain of Fire and Miracle Ministries and other churches as well, also in the Nigerian and Ghanaian diaspora in Italy, that by materializing God, by making God imminent, visible, and tangible, people were redefining their cosmology and they were redefining their sense of freedom and power. They were kind of getting rid of the trans, uh, uh, transcendent God so far away and they were, I wanna say the word, reducing God to a sort of human or tangible entities. So in a certain way, humanity was um, getting close to God and God was getting close to the humanity in a way that was liberating the African Pentecostals that I was observing from the limits of their human condition. And this is certainly is not a sacrilegious, um, sacrilegious act, but is an act of extreme freedom. The images that you see here are some of the images, uh, as I said, from the field work where you can see how this big, immense crowd of people that were so impressing and so moving in so many ways were trying or were somehow, I want to use a word, downloading divine and supernatural power. This is the, the blessing of olive oil. Those are the pictures that people bring at the prayer camp or in, in the churches as a healing uh, catcher. Um, when they want their beloved to be healed, promoted or helped. Those are the um, other images from events 
from prayer. This is the famous slapping of the head seven times that was so impressing and so powerful. This was Powers Must Change and in, in, um, in Lagos. And here again, some of these images of this shocking power, this excess of life that it's so um, spiritually, socially, and also politically important for the Pentecostals um, people, women and men that I observed. Um, again, I, I'm concluding. Okay. How I'm, yes, how I'm concluding this. Nimi Wright, in his work, Ethics and Society in Nigeria, Identity, History, Political Theory, that uh, there is a transformation in this moment of imminence from the theological to the political that happened when there is an overturn or an overbearing of supernatural or natural forces. Indeed, and I want to quote him, the coexistence in a state of almost radical equality between human being God and their gods. So among humans and between human beings and gods carries a high voltage charge of disrupting possibility. And I conclude here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this also very interesting presentation. And I appreciate all the uh, images. <laughs> they remind me of um, Pentecostalism in Nigeria. I used to be attending a Pentecostal church in Nigeria before I came to the United States. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to proceed to our last presentation. If you have a question or a comment, please just write it down after the last presentation. I think we will have enough time to have some discussion about that. Um, our last presenter is um, Patrick Kofi Amisa, who is an associate lecturer at the School of History, Archaeology and Religion at Cardiff University in the United Kingdom. And the title of his presentation is Philosophical, Theological and Analogical Foundation of Social Justice in Africa. So uh, Dr. Patrick, uh, Dr. Amisa, it's time for you now to proceed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair, for um, drawing attention to my academically decorated topic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you um, very much, organizers, especially um, Prof. Alola, and all those who have worked on this to bring us together. And hey, wonderful to see you, uh, Prof. Nimi. I, I, I am only in touch with him virtually, by email anyway, because um, I got to know him through Professor Kwabena Samwajedu in the Trinity Theological Seminary in Ghana when we were work, working on this. Um, and now we are also working on um, a volume in honor of Prof. Asamwajedu. Um, I'm hoping that the um, results or the, the, the outcome of these proceedings will be put together in honor of Prof. Nimi um, for all the wonderful things that um, He's done. He's a man of many parts, and I'm taking a lot of inspiration from him. I ask permission to share my screen. So if um, host can enable me to share, I will do that quickly. Um, yeah, OK. Thank you. So I hope you can see my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, OK. So yes, that is my academically decorated topic out there. Um, <laughs> I should say that looking at the time we have, even though I aim to propose three approaches to social justice in Africa and to locate the three approaches in Nimi Wariboko's comprehensive view of historical African social ethics, um, and also to go ahead and demonstrate the approach in a triangular model and to explore an analog analogy that draws attention to social injustice in Africa. Um, I know I will not be able to do all that because of the time we have. And again, that is where my hope is that we will have the opportunity of putting the proceedings together um, in honor of Prof. Wari Boko. So I want you to take a um, few seconds to look at this image. And in fact, I will be very comfortable if all the conversation we are going to have 
is going to be on this image. Um, again, if there was time, I would have asked each of you to tell me what you think of the image before I tell you what I think. Um, unfortunately, again, time will not permit us for me to ask you um, those questions. And so I will move on. Um, it is interesting that um, even though my um, familiarity with Prof. Nimi's work, it's mostly on the depth and destiny of work. Um, just this morning, I took time to read his um, paper in this uh, volume. <laughs> and I realized that I would have made a big mistake if I came here this morning without having to re read that, <laughs> that document because he totally comes from a different angle in, in, in his article in the Pregrave Handbook of African Social Ethics, totally different to what I had understood him in the depths of destiny of and destiny of work. So um, my, to, my summary of what Prof has done in both works that I've just read is that he is an African who probably might have begun from the tint, tinted glass view of an Afri African um, community life and social justice, where we all believe that we want to protect who we are, what we have been, and showcase African social justice, African communalism, African community life um, to the world as the ideal for everybody to um, kind of um, emulate. And then also comes to tell us that, hold on, um, we have not always been communal without being individual. So he, he combines individuality. I mean, he talks about the fact that there is individuality, um, self-actualization, self-achievement, in um, which also coexists with African communalism. And I'm very, very um, thankful that I took time to read um, those papers before coming here. So in, 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 in his article between community and my mother, Prof is challenging the tinted glass view with which most African ethicists paint African communitarianism as the only authentic way uh, to describe pre-colonial African way of life. Indeed, the argument is that there had been the coexistence of individual achievements and communal um, promotion of communal values. And together with other um, writings that I've read from African ethicists, I think there is a cause for me to authenticate a research that I did in Ghana, um, 2013, 2014, when I was writing my PhD, where I think that there are general, we may have to look at uh, social justice in Africa in three um, approaches, even though those two, those three approaches are not mutually exclusive, but then there is the need to. So there is this traditional cultural focus where there is communal living and responsibility for each other. And close to that is the religious um, approach where every African, whether Christian, Muslim, uh, traditional list or whatever, have a sense of divine responsibility of taking care of um, the needs of the community and of other people. But also on the individual level and on the governmental level, there is this socioeconomic level where everybody is looking up to the government to perform their duties, to build roads, to um, build schools and give freebies to, to help people who are in need. And I think that from what I've, I've read from Prof. Nimi, if we dovetail the understanding that there is also drive for individual achievement and governmental performance in Africa, also as another aspect of social justice, then putting the three together means that individually, we feel that we have the divine responsibility to improve ourselves, improve our community, and to challenge our government also to improve um, the life of our people. So I have tried to superimpose 
uh, these three ideas on this triangular model. I should point out that initially, the triangular model was for the first part of my thesis, which was on the book of Amos. But then quickly, as I did my field work in Africa, I realized that, oh my God, this is exactly what we see in Amos, and this is exactly what is happening in, in Africa. So to conceptualize social justice in Africa, we are looking at the religious angle where the God or the gods are giving the mandate and responsibility to individuals to work together with their communities to ensure their own welfare and the welfare of other people in the community, whilst also holding governments responsible for taking care of the people. And that is what brings me back then to my image. Probably if I have a little time, I may want one or two people to tell me what they think of this image, then I'll conclude. Chairman of the panel, what do you think of the image? <laughs> please unmute him, please. Shago, <laughs> unmute the chair of the panel. <laughs> Uh, the standpoint position or what some people call standpoint position. And sometimes I tell students that if there's somebody on top of a mountain and somebody halfway exactly. on the top of the mountain and someone at the base and you want them to be honest in what they are seeing, <laughs> each one of them will be very honest, but they will tell you something different and you can't question them because they're just being honest. So for me, as a subaltern person who grew up really uh, poor and I will see this as being, <laughs> being on a powerless. <laughs> yeah, did you say a goat? A goat. Yeah. Ah, okay. Is that what you said? <laughs> a, yes, a goat, I said. Okay. That's, my, that's my perception of what it is. Okay, yeah. Can I, get, can I get one more perspective so then I'll, I'll quickly conclude? All right, so for the sake of time, let me just go on. But thank you very much, Chairman, for at least helping me have the interaction I needed. But um, I, in part, the artist who did this for me, after I have given him the concept, told me that intentionally drew um, a ruminant that you cannot pin down to only one ruminant. So like you are saying, good, some people have seen this as a horse. Some have seen this as a, a sheep. Others have seen this as a, a cattle, a cow, or whatever it is. And in fact, that is exactly the intention. So that wherever you come from, you may be able to associate this animal with at least a ruminant in your culture. And so for me, coming from uh, Ghana or Africa, I am calling this the grazing sheep and the screaming fowl. So there is a sheep that is grazing. The sheep is grazing the, um, the grass. There is this fowl following the sheep. And those of you who grew up, those of us who grew up in village life, village setting, you will see that in those days when the sheep or the cattle or the goat were grazing in the fields, there were these white birds. Um, some people call them flamingos. I don't know whether that is the name. But these birds will be following the goat or the sheep or the cow. And as they step on the grass and the stir and the scare will cause the insects in the grass to start running away. And these birds will be picking on the insects. So call that bird a fowl, uh, a bird, uh, a turkey, whatever you want. But this is a bird that is following this sheep not interested in the grass that the sheep is eating, but interested in the byproduct of the grazing of the sheep. That is the insects that are coming out and running away. Sometimes in dry seasons, um, the, the bird may be picking on the droppings, the feces of the sheep. So whatever it is, they are not actually in competition with the sheep for what the sheep is eating, 
but they are in competition with the other environment for the byproduct. But this sheep, and that is where probably Prof. Nimi's um, coexistence of um, individualism and communalism should be looked at again. Maybe Prof. would want to help us to understand that if this sheep will let this bed alone, the bed will not be competing for the grass, but only for the byproducts. But there, there are a problem of individualism that we have, we have today, probably not as we used to have in the pre-colonial days, would be that this sheep, even though he knows that the uh, fowl is not in competition with him, will still want to stop this fowl from even enjoying the byproduct of what he's doing. And for me, this image is a, a perfect example or representation of what we have in Africa today that we can call social injustice. That when people are up there and they have what it takes to improve themselves, even though they may not want to help anybody, they may not also even want people to just run behind them using their byproduct also to um, prosper and get out of poverty. And that is where um, we will need as Africans to stand against and speak to our community that yes, we want individuals to progress. We want individuals to improve themselves. We want individuals to be the best, but we also need to think about those who for no fault of theirs, they cannot be like those on top and they need a hand up. I am not calling for handouts. I am calling for the hand up in order for the poor also to get up the, the property ladder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very helpful. <laughs> okay, I think we have gotten all the presentations now. Um, we're going to open the floor now for uh, questions and contributions or comments. I think there are important themes and issues that have been raised, and I hope we will engage the topic in a very uh, critical and inspiring manner. So are there any comments um, or questions, please? They can also check the chat. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat, chat now. With, uh, okay, there's a question for, I think, Dr. Annalisa, a question. The image of the church where they use a media as part of the process of curating a spiritual experience is an interesting one. In your assessment, what does the nature of new media, such as the internet and social media, contributed or not to the materialization of the spiritual experience? Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this nice question. Um, well, I, the, the materialization, the experience to, uh, of the divine through media like TV, radio, um, or other social media is not new. Uh, we know very well the reality of tele-evangelists um, and even another uh, one of our colleague, um, Professor Asamoa Ajado from Ghana, he wrote a lot about the anointing through the screen, uh, what kind of spiritual power people can access uh, through, through the screen. But what I noticed is that uh, the people who access more to the social media uh, are in the diaspora. The diaspora make an extensive use of media. And when I check, for example, MFM power must change ends, um, they stream it online. There are chat and messages coming from all over the world from Nigerians and members following uh, powers must change hands in search of that anointing. Certainly, we need more research, eh? comparative research, and, and ask people, is it the same to get that experience in the church when your pastor is there, when your community is there, when you can feel them, or 
when you are alone at home staring at a screen. I think that the aesthetics is different, but nevertheless, it's still there and seems also powerful considering the large number of people who connect to the social media of Pentecostal churches all over the world. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, response. Um, I do have a question. Am I am I allowed am I allowed to yep. ask the question? Yep, please. Yes, I have a question for Professor Shishima. Yeah, I would like. Uh, we saw that in time of um, in this time of COVID nineteen, there was a big debate about the use of. Um, African or local herbs and the, the, the case of the Madagascar um, vaccine Sorry. became an, an international an international issue, right? And at the end, it turned out that the, what they were doing in Madagascar was using Artemisia with other herbs, which is a very powerful anti-malarian herb. But there were, there were also a lot of critique because, of, because Africans were promoting their herbs and people were questioning this. They had, they had this kind of colonial attitude of questioning African herbal knowledge. What is your, your thought about it? Okay, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, you see, the, that is one of the challenges of traditional medicine. The, there's a lot of competition between orthodox medicine and traditional medicine. The, those who believe in orthodox medicine believe that traditional medicine cannot work except orthodox medicine. Now, the issue is, well, those of us who believe in traditional medicine, I will see it working. What we are now just advocating is that why it should be integrated. Not that we are saying it should be brought together, but we are saying that in the same hospital, you should have department of traditional medicine and department of orthodox medicine. So that when orthodox medicine cannot solve a problem, they will send it to the traditional healers the traditional department. That is what we are advocating. Because there's this strong belief by the orthodox practitioners, especially the scientists, they say that is barbaric, uh, that is archaic, that is, uh, they give it all kinds of names. And so they don't believe in traditional medicine, and especially Christianity. Well, Christians believe that anything to do with human sacrifice, uh, all those ones are, are bad aspects of traditional medicine. So it shouldn't be used. So in one of my papers, I argue that there should be a dialogue between traditional medicine and Christian faith so that we come to a common table and so we now learn to believe in traditional medicine. So that is why the Madagascar solution, which you are talking about, many people do not believe in it because they don't believe in anything herbal. But I tell you that here in Africa and in Nigeria, we still believe in herbal medicine and it's still helping. There are some areas like bone sitting where traditional medicine cannot, I mean, orthodox medicine cannot heal, but the Africans put it through the traditional way. Um, at present, issues like uh, impotence, snake bite, and so on, are watching stronger in traditional healing than uh, orthodox medicine. So I think that is one of the challenges of traditional medicine, which up to now is still uh, going on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, Reverend Dr. Patrick Amisa. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what um, um, Daniel has said. Um, I mean, I don't want to say much, but as far as COVID, and African traditional medicine is concerned, I just want to say that I am a testimony. I'm sure you understand. Thank you. Okay, can I, let me just ask a question here. Um, I teach introduction to anthropology and I 
saw some documentaries about medical anthropology. So some of this aspect of traditional medicine that uh, Professor Shishima just described, to me, if it doesn't involve some spiritual forces, it is just herbs or whatever, it's just part of science because all we need to do is just to go to the lab and just analyze the material or whatever. It's just part of science. I don't see it as anything different. And then the other point I want to make is that if one looks at the evolution of Western civilization, there were times they encountered this problem, but they would still persist that they would have to continue to investigate what is the reason why this is happening. And over time, they were able to come up with much better explanation. If they had abandoned it and just said that, well, it is just because of spiritual forces or something like that, uh, it's, a, it's it might be a problem. Because I was reading one book where in Zimbabwe, for instance, uh, the one reverend said that in a Pentecostal church said that when he prays, people get money in their wallet. Okay, so which means if we want to solve the problem of poverty in Africa, we don't have to, we don't need any kind of public policy because he can just pray. Okay, and here is what makes this interesting. The governor of the central bank had to address a press conference, national press conference, side by side with this pastor to convince that this money that is coming into circulation, not produced by the central bank, is not going to interfere with the monetary policies of Zimbabwe. <laughs> okay. Now, doesn't this sound like, <laughs> and Professor Wariboko has studied finance. So now you get this money that is coming into circulation <laughs> because of miracle that is not produced by the central bank. So they cannot regulate the economy in that respect. So I really don't know. I, to be frank with you, I feel very ambivalent about this. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to resolve it, but I don't know whether somebody has a, uh, a comment about this. <laughs> okay, any other question? I know the next program is at nine. Um, I don't want to talk. Okay. No, no, somebody has a hand. Oh, um, no, the one of the members. Let me give him the floor. Oh, no, what? I'll give him the floor. Yeah, thanks, Professor Falala. I asked two questions, and I think uh, the chairman uh, may have alluded to part of my question on traditional medicine. You see, I, 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 I do not know much about traditional medicine, but I know, and Prof uh, Nimi may want to uh, comment on that. I know that most times in Africa, when they collect these herbs, there are some kinds of incantations, right? And uh, just like Chairman said it, 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 a little while ago, uh, if it is just to take the herbs into the lab and analyze them, and, uh, and there is no invocation of spiritual powers, uh, it's fine. It's just like uh, pharmaceutical medicine uh, and any pill that the, pharmacy, uh, the pharmaceutical companies make. But if where, where it involves the invocation of spiritual powers in gathering the, the herbs, then it presents a challenge because uh, the person that takes that uh, may be uh, also uh, opening themselves up to uh, uh, penetration by those spiritual uh, demons, those demons uh, that give the, the power to. So, so my question is, where do we draw the line? when it comes to traditional African medicine? That's the first question for the traditional African medicine. And uh, a similar question I asked, I put all these questions on YouTube, a similar question again, where do we draw the line uh, on spiritual powers? Uh, uh, the professor that just talked about spiritual powers. Are we not venturing into dangerous territory and exposing ourselves to evil demonic powers? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed um, all the presentations and I just want to make um, a few remarks. Uh, the first presentation uh, by our good friend Chuku Onewa, um, which is um, a personal biography of his friend And I love the personal biography. I will make two contributions from that. When he buried his mom in Port Harcourt, I wanted to be there. 
I knew how to get to Potakov, but I didn't know how to fly back because of the way uh, the airlines were organized. Because I was also coming from Cameroon to Abuja. Uh, some cultures, those, we are friends from Ghana, and we just lost Rollins. I've been to Ghana a few times on funeral ceremony. In fact, in my house, I have Ghana funeral clothes. <laughs> they, are, they are kind funeral, funeral dresses, blue, the black and the red that we wear. Why do we spend so much time talking about the dead than the living? Because part of what I'm doing with this kind of conference is to begin the process of reversing that orientation. What do I care if you talk nice about me when I'm dead? I'm not there. I can't listen to it. The words have no meaning to me. I'm already buried. Why can't we begin a process of reversing it? Uh, I'm beginning to do more and more of this. I'm beginning to descale, to descale the funeral. Uh, for, for us to descale the funeral, I know the consequences that those are going to have on the imagination of cultures and imaginations of these ideas. But every generation defines the values that govern it. So when people speak in terms of the crystallization of these values, as if they are set in tone, my counter argument is that we can begin to redefine some of these ideas, uh, begin to redefine it. Why can't we spend more money celebrating the bad day of Wariboko than spending more money on his funeral. At least the person gets to enjoy the party, gets to enjoy everything, gets to see anyone. Uh, that example, I'm not saying, is, I'm not wishing him dead. For those of you who are religious, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, so, and we have this, conception, don't talk ill of the dead, but we like to talk ill of the living. You'll be lucky if Africans don't talk bad about you. So why can't we begin the process of rethinking our values and, and begin a process of rebalancing? I'm not saying we shouldn't bury the dead, or spend, but rebalancing things. To the paper on witchcraft, I don't know how to move that discipline forward because the narrative activities, power of witchcraft practices, they appear to me to have reached a dead end. So, I'm close to 70, and many of what you said, I had them 50 years ago. What I mean is, is it that we don't have new data or we have reached the limits of our theoretical sophistication? Or is it because we don't know how to connect these ontologies to alternative densities of epistemologies? Or do, have we reached the end of our capacities for imaginations? For instance, in the, ha in the hands of um, somebody who writes scientific fiction, this will be terrific. And would you say, okay, let's do what um, the Black Panther people did take these stories of witchcraft and convert it to a movie. But not the movie cast in traditions, but the movie cast in Afrofuturism. In other words, begin to milk them. I don't want to abuse my privilege as a convener, so let me move to the last one. I've never been persuaded calling it traditional medicine. I've never 
been persuaded about the use of that terminology because many elements of those medicine are actually not grounded in time. They are modified. So if you see the schnapp from Netherlands in a medicine, that comes with time. So when you break down many of these traditional medicine, you are going to find imported items in them. Uh, in terms of how they, they are put together uh, and how they are repackaged. In fact, you'll be surprised that some of what you call traditional medicine now has paracetamol and tanalol grounded in them, uh, which is fine. I don't have any problem with that. I'm not persuaded that we should call it alternative medicine because it's not, it's not an alternative medicine. It is Western medicine that is alternative, not uh, those medicine. And if you interrogate many of these things carefully, as um, the chair said, these are other medicine with efficacy. All me most medicines are based in plants. And today you now had plastic into it. So my colleague here, wrote um, a book on six African plants that Western pharmaceutical companies converted into tablets and they resell back to you. Uh, if you go to Nigeria now, you see many of our friends drinking Origins. Origins is bitter. They just renamed it, repackage it, call it Origins. Or if you go to gas stations in Nigeria, they will sell all sorts of uh, virality medicine to you. All sorts of um, uh, sexual medicine. They're just repackaging them, giving them alternative names. Then you have a whole category that people don't interrogate. Our tremendous capacity to use food as medicine. People don't interrogate that. Africans have been using food as medicine for a long, long time. If you see cultures where they eat spices, hot pepper, they are medicinal. So if you say the Yoruba, they love pepper a lot. You are not connecting that to issues around bacteria. If you go to area of Eastern Nigeria where they put a lot of bitter leaves there, Bitter leaf is medicine, it's, it's good medicine. If you go to where Nimi comes from and they mix um, unripe plantain in good broth with fish, that is medicine. Is you calling it food? Well, it's actually medicine. Uh, because if you, if you look at those plants very well that they convert into the broth, they're actually medicine. The problem, first of all, the underdevelopment of um, our own universities. If you are interested in many of this, you have to go to Brazil, where many of the plants we have, they also have it. In Brazil, that bitter leaf has been converted into enormous use, including when HIV broke out, that which was take as bitter leaf in your bono soup they are using it against HIV. So, or the palm oil, the research, Western anti-fat, call it bad and bad and bad. Now, if you now go to some Western pharmacy, they now convert palm oil into tablets for you. Because Brazilian researchers said they don't see anything wrong with palm oil. Now, what is wrong is that you fry it and you bleach it that if you don't over fry it, it's actually <laughs> anti-fattening, the opposite of what you have been told. So the, the, first of all, we have issues of, around definition that we don't work out very well. We have issues around usages that we don't work out very well. Now, one more, last point, saying they should not do incisions. Incisions are fascinations. That's what they are, basically. You have just been fascinated 
they just use it. How do you get fast to the blood vein? Oh, they, they cut your body with blades and they put medicine. It's, it's, the Western medicine is using the noodle to deliver it and they are using incisions. And COVID has revealed many of these tensions because they began to do a lot of misrepresentation that they don't understand that Africans have been doing vaccination. They don't understand that Africans have been doing quarantine. It's not new. They don't understand that Africans have been doing social isolation. That's how they have been curing leprosy. They have been curing all forms of diseases. And there are virus courts. There's no part of Africa where there's never been a virus cult for centuries. If you are Yoruba, the god of small portion, it's a virus cult. Virus is not new in history. It is just the formation that it has. If you go to Zimbabwe, South Africa, virus cult has so much developed. So when this thing broke down, broke out, with, and you eventually you see how, whether it's in South Africa or Nigeria, People revive this local medicine to boost their immune. So in South Africa, they discover that if you mix beets with carrot, with apple, and you drink it every morning, it boosts, boosts your immune system. In Nigeria, they say moringa. They take black oil pepper. They take bitter leaf. They combine them. These are immune boosters that actually work. There's nothing traditional or magical about them. They just work. Uh, and finally, I'm not a religious person as Professor Nimiwari Boko. I am not a preacher. But fundamentally, there is no community. And for those of you who are in, in religion, you can put God there, that God created, that does not have the resources to feed itself and take care of his health. The problem is not that actually. The problem is when you inject, introduce, when you externalize the conditions that govern those communities. Because when you go to any communities, you see the plants, they, they, you find their food. A community has a disease regime in which their doctors over time, develop the capacity to cure their citizens, given the number of diseases they can have. The Chinese got that, created the concept of beer food doctors. That how many diseases can you have? When I was growing up in Ibada, if you don't have malaria, you have um, cholera. If you don't have that, what else can you have? Stomach trouble. That exhausts almost 70% of what we had. And, 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 and those three, your community already invented the capacity to handle it. Well, we're running out of time. We have 15 more minutes. Chair, let me hand over to you because we have to give people time to prepare for the keynote. Yes. And I think at this point, we should probably be closing. And the only question I wanted to ask, and I don't need an answer, but if somebody can answer it to me privately, is just... I've been reading about religion very, very much, but I reached a point where I feel like there is just so many conceptions of God and understanding of God. And even for myself, when I started reflecting about my life, I found out that the way I'm thinking about God now is different from when I was an adolescent. And if God prolongs my life, maybe when I'm in the nursing home, I'll be thinking about God differently. So um, I really feel like it's a deep abyss that when I look into it, it's just difficult to figure out. And I live in the southeastern part of Nigeria for almost one year. And uh, I had an encounter with some of these traditional things. And I just feel like there's something out there that I cannot really lay my hand on. There's just throughout history, I don't think there's one single conception of God. People have been competing. There are different visions of who God is or whatever. And I consider that to be an important issue of concern. I wish we have the time then some of uh, the presenters could have responded to this, but I think we should. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah there were, um, I think Dr. Um, Egali and Dr. Luboye has had their hands up all oh. this while. Oh, yeah, I did. If, if you're looking at the chat or the hand stuff, the, um, 
Dr. Gali and Dr. Olubo. Yes. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can continue, uh, Dr. Uh, who, which one of them, Dr. Gali or? Yeah, maybe Egali is here already. I don't know, Olubo. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah, Dr. yeah I, I can talk if you. Yeah. I can see that you have muted me. Okay. Yeah, yes, what, what, I, what I wanted to uh, comment was on uh, Professor Falala's uh, okay. comment with regards to the situation with burials. Yeah. Uh, you know, in most of our societies, the world view is that the dead are living with us. They are dead, but they've just gone to another realm. Yeah. Uh, it is not only African, uh, but it's uh, in most uh, societies that uh, uh, could, uh, could be termed the societies that believe uh, which uh, the uh, primordial and anthropologists call the primitive societies believe that the dead are living. So there's a valorization of death and the process of uh, the translation of the dead into the next level. Uh, this has been, uh, this has continued into modern society where people still believe somehow and uh, the veneration and th that high level of, uh, uh, so some extent even deification of uh, the dead, uh, even with the most urban elite uh, exists because people believe that we must treat them carefully. They, they are here with us. So, Prof, I think that that is my own thinking on that matter because I've tried to, uh, I don't believe in it. I've tried to interrogate it. Uh, uh, and I remember when I had to bury my father, my father made it very clear. He said, look, when I die, make sure you bury me within a few hours, within a day or two. Then the old community told me, no, you can't do that. Go, go somewhere else and bury him. But if you are bringing him back here, we're going to celebrate him. This man died very old. And I remember, uh, Prof, it would interest you all to uh, hear this. I remember when Professor J.P. Clark died recently. And Professor J.P. Clark made it very clear that when I die, I must be buried within, within uh, three days. And he prepared his burial chamber everywhere in his house, showed it to me. And when Professor J.P. Clark died, it happened at the time when in the Niger Delta, we are flooding. There's flood water everywhere, and it's impossible to bury. And um, the communities and the people decided that we cannot bury him. We must wait until the flood water goes down. But gladly for us, some of us insisted this professor is a global citizen. He had told everybody he must be buried in three days, and we must bury him. We insisted against the community, and uh, at last, we, we prevailed uh, just by uh, a stroke of luck. So in conclusion, um, it's, it's something we need to discuss about, uh, but people believe that uh, and until as long as we have those traditional thoughts, uh, there will still continue to be uh, a high premium placed on how we regard our dead and uh, how we value uh, what, what happens to them in the life hereafter. And it comes from the pyramids of Egypt right down to modern times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, I know we have only 10 minutes left before the next uh, session, which is the keynote address, but Professor Obijole seems to have something to say. That would be the last thing. Can we give Hello? him- Hello? Yep, yeah. Are you, are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Oh, very good. Um, let me first react by asking this question. If all medicine comes from plants, what is wrong with tapping powers? What is wrong with tapping powers, whether good or evil? Isn't that a major contribution to to world medicine, if it is possible to tap powers, <laughs> tap power, tap medicine, healing from powers. 
when we pray, I will not tap him from powers. When we pray to Jesus or other super sensible powers, I will not tap him from powers. So as long as it's going to be for healing and it's not going to be for evil, I think tapping from powers, I don't know what Professor Falola thinks about that, but I don't see anything wrong with it. That's the point number one. Number two is my reaction to Annalisa. Now, I'm worried about the way we pray in churches, like Mountain of Fire, Christ Apostolic Church, people pray heavily. Has the prayer any impact on bad governance? Has the prayer any impact on Boko Haram? Has the prayers any impact on social economic problems of our society? Even though the prayers are so energetic, full of energy and uh, whatever, if it has no impact, of what use is the prayer? It's not, I mean, it's not, the, the prayers have no impact on existential problems. So okay. I think we need to re-examine that. <laughs> it's just my own thinking. Thank you very okay. much. So quick, one minute or two minutes to uh, Annalisa to respond quickly to. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, thank you, Professor Abidole, for the question. You know, I asked the same questions to the geo Daniel Olukoya. And I asked, I told them, Daddy, Daddy Gio, but, you know, Nigeria needs some strong intervention on corruption, on poverty, of oppression. Why are you doing, what are we doing? What is, what is MFM doing for those things? And you know, he's very, he very candidly uh, answered to me and say, you know, I am not a politician. I am a pastor. I take care of the soul of the people, not of politics. So, so his answer was, was very candid, but there is one thing, Professor Abidjali, that, um, and I take it from um, Colonel West, when he says that if we want to keep our community together, whole, we have to keep our soul together. So... I wanna, I wanna leave. Uh, okay. I wanna leave it like that. Okay. I wanna leave it like that, and maybe we can think more about it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is starting to be a very engaging conversation, but unfortunately, <laughs> we are out of time. Uh, we have only five minutes to transition to the next uh, program, which is the keynote address. So I would like to say on behalf of Professor Toyin Falola, who organized this forum, I truly appreciate the opportunity to listen to all your presentations and then get all the insights. Uh, let's continue with this conversation, please, in different ways. Thank you very much. Well, I, I thank you all, uh, yeah. members of the panel, the chair. Please don't go. Uh, we'll start the keynote in a moment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Am I on?
Yeah, but yes, you are humble. Hold on. Okay. It's not nine yet. I know. It's, I just thought I'd get on to make sure everything was clear. Yeah, yeah they would tag you. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, what's going on? Shoot. Sorry, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Well, let me welcome all of you to the keynote session. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite um, Ruth Marshall, uh, University of Toronto, to direct this keynote session. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So sorry for the delay. I am having technical issues as usual. Uh, I, so I'm delighted to be the chair of this illustrious panel. Delighted to be among you. Welcome. Greetings to everybody. Greetings, uh, Tony and Nimi. You're looking very fine. And, oh, shoot, what happened? Hello? Okay. <sighs> I don't know what happened, one second. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, right, so I have to introduce the, um, sorry, I had a very hard time connecting and I'm a little scattered, please bear with me. Um, I had to have help from Anna Lee to get connected. Um, one second. Right. Um, there we go. So um, I have the delight and the pleasure to introduce. Uh, the, yes, hello. The to introduce the um, the four participants on this panel for very illustrious participants. Um, the, there's a maybe you could do a little wave. Uh, if um, if when I when I introduce you, I'm just going to do a very quick introduction because Annalise sent me very brief. So Mary Elizabeth Moore is the um, current dean of Boston University, and she is also a very well known educator and writer. Um, Tim Longman is hi, nice to see you. Uh, is the uh, director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs and the African Studies Center at Boston University as well. So welcome, Tim. Tony Falola hardly needs any introduction. He is the, the convener, the organizer, the um, Jacob and Francis Mossaker chair, and he, too long a name. 
doing humanities in the University of Distinguished Teaching Pressure, professor at University of Texas, Austin, and we all know his wonderful works. And the keynote speaker is uh, Mark Lewis Taylor, who I'm delighted to be able to meet for the first time myself, is the Maxwell M. Upson Professor of Theology and Culture at the Princeton Theological Seminar, Seminary at Princeton, and really um, needs no introduction. And I'm very delighted to be ch chairing this panel of such illustrious group. And I will hand it over to the first speaker, I believe is, uh, I'm not sure actually, I'm just <laughs> the program in front of me, forgive me. I believe it's, um, Don't you help me out now, help, help out the sister. I can't remember the order because I don't have the program in front of me. Uh, yeah, Mary Moore, Dean School of Theology. Boston. Yes, I think, yes. So I'll hand it over now to Dr. Moore and thank you for your patience with my rather uh, loose and free introductory style. So um, please, uh, so I believe everybody has 15 minutes, am I right? Is that correct? I'm a crappy chair, I'm sorry. Oh, they don't, they, you know, is that is correct, am I right? They yeah. less, they, they can spend less than 15 minutes. All right, or less, I see. So I will be uh, the um, the timekeeper and I will, I think what I'll do is if I feel you're getting closer coming over, I will just text. Is that the best way perhaps, Tony, not to interrupt? Or I can just go like this and make crazy gestures for time or something. I'll figure it out. I haven't actually worked it out. So please, uh, with no more ado, uh, please uh, welcome Mary Elizabeth Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and um, and welcome. I'm sorry it was so hard to get on, but it's good that you're here now. Um, I'm going to be much less than 15 minutes because I don't want to detract from the substance of this quite amazing conference. So welcome to this conference that unearths the philosophy of Professor Nimi Wari Boko and the networks of intellectual work represented by the presenters. Welcome to Worlds of Wonder. The conference invites you into the worlds that Professor Wari Boko inhabits, uh, which are many. The worlds of social ethics, economic ethics and finance, African religious and social traditions, Pentecostal theology, philosophy, and philosophical theology. Such an amazing range. These are worlds named in the book that we celebrate today, edited by uh, Professor Toyan Falola and penned by participants in the conference and others. The book brings worlds together within its covers and brings us together all of us to engage Dr. Rory Boko's work. As I read his book, his work over time, I'm amazed at how with every new book, he turns the gem another angle and you see new facets of knowledge, new facets of questions. Um, today, we will be privileged to have uh, the participants do deep plunges into Nimi's work, yielding patterns of thought that dazzle the mind and disturb it at the same time. Jarring readers with insights, charming them with erudition and evoking questions that haunt the worlds of philosophy and the worlds of life practice. With thanks to the convener, Professor Toyan Falola and to the University of Texas for its lead, lead sponsorship. The Boston University School of Theology is delighted to participate in the Worlds of Wonder, opened by our colleague, Nimi Wari Boko, Walter H. Mulder Professor of Social Ethics, and by all of you who have reflected deeply on his work. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. That was a lovely uh, introduction. So, um, Tim, so nice to see Tim, actually. It's actually a lovely, I have to thank um, the convener because this is a chance to meet lots of old friends you've not seen in many, many years. So uh, lovely I believe you, uh, it's lovely to see you, Tim. And um, please and uh, take, a, take, take it away. Sure, and uh, lovely to see uh, Toyin and uh, Nimi and everyone else as well. 
Um, my job again will be just a couple of seconds really to uh, express how happy we are at Boston University uh, to be celebrating the work of Nimi Wariboko. Um, I have to confess to being uh, a little bit resentful of someone who can publish over 20 books and uh, shame the rest of us. Um, but uh, the books themselves are, are quite important um, with insights in business and religion and philosophy, uh, insights into Nigeria, into Africa more broadly, into Pentecostalism, and, and into the connections between all of those. Uh, both of the institutes that I direct, the uh, African Studies Center and the Institute for Cultural, Religion, and World Affairs at Boston University uh, are places where we are very happy to have Nimi Wariboko as part of our community uh, because of what he brings in terms of intellectual rigor and fantastic creative ideas and information. So I just wanna say thank you to Toyin Falola for putting together this fantastic volume, which uh, uh, is uh, I, I think a really great collection. I'm currently working on a book myself on religion and politics in Africa. Uh, and I've already turned to several of Professor Wariboko's books. Uh, and I look forward to, to reading this book as well to help me in my own thinking as I work on this. So uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you to the organizers and uh, I'll turn it over so we can get to our keynote. So, sorry about that. The, uh, the next, Toyin, I have to hand it over to the yoga. Pata, pata. Um, Toyin, I believe you are next. Please. For those of you who have been to Nigeria, we do book luncheon. <laughs> um, and it's one of um, the very best things we do because there is no chain of bookstores as you have here. So the publishing strategy in Nigeria is you do the book launching and you sell all the books you've produced. Uh, here you are used to buying one book on Amazon, 10 days later another, buy, another person buys one. The other thing in Nigeria is that when you launch the book, the sales price is not what matter. Somebody can buy one copy for the cost of the entire print run. <laughs> on December 17, I did them um, in Lagos. I launched my book. Uh, and somebody just bought a copy for the equivalent of 3,000 US dollars. <laughs> so we're used to that book launching. Um, they don't have that tradition here. Well, we didn't invite anybody to buy any copy and pay for the entire thing. <laughs> we, just, we just followed the American way of um, showing you the book. Uh, and um, I want to thank all the contributors uh, for, for uh, accepting the request to contribute. Uh, and then um, meeting the challenges of multiple revisions and um, my nagging, which my never ending nagging. <laughs> um, I'm very grateful to my Boston colleagues. When he moved to Boston and he was given the chair, I was there in the church and I listened to his um, lecture and there was a wonderful reception in the in the theological school with wonderful testimonies and food and drinks and i'm also grateful for your support in fact tim asked whether you should even um, assist us with money and i said because it's a virtual conference we may not need money i later regretted that decision by the way <laughs> <laughs> so th th thank you very much and then um, we donated a copy each to everybody who's presenting papers at this conference mm -hmm. as a way of thanking them. We're very grateful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, uh, Doing. Uh, so now, with no further ado, I would like to invite our distinguished keynote speaker, Mark Lewis Taylor, to uh, to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you for a lovely introduction, Tony. I have to go and wash my book in Nigeria. Honestly, three thousand dollars. I have next one. I'm going to book launch in Nigeria. Seriously. All right. Please go ahead, Professor Taylor. Thank you very much. And I thank you for that introduction. I assume that I'm coming through clearly. Can I get an affirmation? Very good. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm, I not only thank you for the introduction, but I want to thank also the organizers of this amazing conference and greet those who I cannot see some 80 in number, I guess. Um, thank you, Dr. Falula, for your role in the book and this, ish, this uh, conference. Uh, the team, Anneli Carruthers uh, in particular, from whom I've heard, I know this must be extraordinary preparation work. Um, and I greet you, uh, Dr. Nimi Wariboko, and also Wapaemi Wariboko, who I see there. I remember when your family was at my house in the days of celebrating your PhD um, some time ago. My keynote address, and I will stay at the 25 minutes that I was assigned, is entitled, When I Survey Nimi Wariboko's Work, History, Incredible Crises, and Political Theology. That will be uh, my focus. And I'd like to start with the words of Vishil Mbembe uh, in his 2019 book, Necropolitics. I am not an African studies scholar. And yet I share with Dr. Wari Boko an interest in all of the world's travail and its hopes and its possibilities. And if I find Mbembe's work, uh, which is cited by uh, Dr. Wari Boko in many ways to be very important. At the end of Mbembe's work, Necropolitics, he writes this, rendered to life and thereby different from the fallen body of colonized existence a new body will be invited to become a member of a new community, unfolding according to its own plan. It will henceforth walk along together with other bodies and doing so will recreate the world. Mbembe's necropolitics, I would like to say, is not just Africa's structural trauma. It is also becoming a political and existential ordeal of the world, as he calls it. It's becoming a political and existential, existential one that touches many worlds. First in the post colonies to be sure, but often a trauma that works its way into as a terrific boomerang effect to cite Ami Cesar into colonizers worlds also. Mbembe here offers a gem of real hope when he writes of a new body rising from the fallen body of colonized existence walking along with other bodies to recreate the world. It was a singular event for me to walk along with Nimi in the adventure of serving as his dissertation advisor. I was just one body though alongside him as he made the journey toward his PhD degree at Princeton. If I may deploy Mbembe's words in another way, I hope I am still walking along together with him and with other bodies with so many of you gathered for this important event and doing so, may we all help to recreate the world in some small, if not more transformative way. By way of introduction, I would like to say just a little bit more about my work with Nimi. I want to observe that it had something of the storm about it, my participation in his projects. Works were completed ahead of time. Papers and chapters of his dissertation came through at amazing speed. I, as the advisor, had to work hard to keep up. There was indeed very much a sense that our advising was a matter of participating in one another's works. And he even generously took time during his own doctoral studies to read one of my book manuscripts um, in the process of publication and give me very important uh, uh, feedback. So in this essay today, I would like to remain an interlocutor, one who participates in the flow of the mutual advising process. Now my title, When I Survey Nimi Wariboko's Work, might suggest that I'm going to take stock of the whole of his corpus or his life work. 
no, I'm not. I cannot do that. I do not have those abilities, uh, nor the time. Instead, my title, When I Survey, actually references a most important way in which Woriboko himself signals his recent concerns in two recent essays, still on the way to publication, which he sent me some time ago. In the essay entitled Production of Violence in Nigeria, Woriboko writes, quote, when I survey the ponderous post-colony from which sacred excesses and violence flow mingle down to ordinary Africans, I realize that were the whole realm of idealized theory at my grasp, it would be inadequate to make sense of the sacred violence in Africa. All vain theories, he continues, that charm me most, I sacrifice to the particular historical discourse of each connection between the sacred and violence in the African post-colony. Now, those of you who are aware of the legacy of Western Protestant hymnody might be startled by the rhetorical devices that Woriboko utilizes here. They're drawn from the well-known hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Only here, Woriboko uses it to reflect on an intensification point, maybe a new turn, I'm not sure, but a new intensification and inflection in his research project. With this religious hymnic language, he signalizes a change that is coming. The question is, what kind of change is Wari Boko inaugurating here? He names it particularly in that line I just quoted uh, to you as a transformation wherein he's going to turn again to history in a new way. He is not moving away from theory. That, of course, is not Nimi Woriboko. It is no surprise that he wants to move to history because he has explored history so often before. In fact, his book on ethics and society in Nigeria was dedicated to my colleague, Peter J. Paris, who he credited with orienting him to historical studies. So what does it mean for Nimi now to be turning to history in a new way? Um, it doesn't mean a turn away from theory either. So let me reflect a little bit on history in order to sharpen up the kind of history to which I see Nimi moving. History is a term, of course, that's generally used to refer to human and Earth's temporal dimension, the susceptibility of our being and beings to the flow of time. This temporality is often seen as chronological flow perhaps traced by the turning of different calendars with their marks, their pages, their tablet marks, and so on. But the experience of time's passing, if even thought about in a linear way, is impacted by how humans organize themselves in their times as families, groups, cultures, institutions, states, and nations. Chronos time, chronological time, has a certain virtue that is it can productively for a human being increase flourishing. It can spread out the flow in ways that promote flourishing or not. Even the end of a being's time in temporal existence, if orchestrated rhythmically in the full orchestration of events, can result in flourishing. This kind of experience of time I've explored in my book, The Theological and the Political, as being in extension, following French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, who sees extension as tensely balanced interplay between bodies in the world, an extension through time that delicately spaces bodies, creating conditions for both mutual intimacy and the distancing of bodies. This extended temporality in the spaces and places of human living is what Nancy calls a veritable condition for justice. Violating that condition is injustice. And this violation of extended bodies and lives dwelling in delicate and fruitful relationality, Nancy terms that violation concentration. It is the mixing breaking, crushing, stifling of bodies and time, making them indistinct, gathered in a hard center, piled up to eliminate the space between them, within them, assassinating even the space of their just death. 
So for a first response to the question of what kind of history it is to which Nimi is now turning in these two more recent articles, I suggest it is to this destructive and unjust concentration of time that afflicts peoples in the post-colony, especially in the post-colonies of sub-Saharan Africa. This concentrated time, of course, abounds in many others of the colonized regions of the world. It abounds also in the internal colonies within the US carceral state and its imperial organization within and abroad. In his two articles, Wari Boko walks across the concentrated landscapes of various ruinous zones, not only in the zones of death in Nigeria, but in genocide stricken Rwanda's Murambi Hill and Tarama Chapel in one of Rwanda's poorest provinces. He considers the Congo with the aid of ethnographer Jason Stearns in the book Dancing in the Glory of Monsters and looks particularly at the village of Kasika. Um, I won't account here the grisly details of violence performed at these places, indeed normalized there. Those details are reminiscent of killing fields that we know the world over. But history concentrated with the crushing of bodies in time and the destruction of time is a aspect of this history that Wari Boko seems to be turning towards. Second and most importantly though, we find Wari Boko taking up a form of sacred history. Yes, he'll be positive about the sacred still and particularly forms of religious experience, but he's primarily concerned now, as I read these two essays, with the way a sacred excess stokes the flame of violence in the concentrated history I just mentioned. The sacred at its best, suggests Mori Boko, both distinguishes and mediates between what is possible and what is impossible, and so would contribute, as I read him, to history in delicate and just extension. But the sacred has functioned instead at its worst to become excessive in the post-colony. It short circuits, he says, the fruitful connection between the possible and the impossible. The sacred increases disorder, constitutes disorder, often legitimizes it, rendering it numinous and fascinating, a kind of mysterium tremendum, as Wari Boko glosses Rudolf Otto's famous definition of the holy. Degradation and depravity in chaos are revered. And he cites here Ashil Mbembe again, who writes that so often in the post-colony, the sacred and the secular mix to form a breach, one that, quote, reveals itself in the guise of arbitrariness and the absolute power to give death anytime, anywhere, by any means, and for any reason, end quote. Here, our temporal existence, history, especially in the post-colony, is not only concentrated, that's the first feature of this history as I read him, but the sacred has become itself a concentrating agent, another way to read Nimi, the second point of the history. And so Dr. Wari Boko lets forth his most understandable mix of rage and lament, a kind of cri de coeur, it seems to me, at a very intense moment of the second paper. I must cite part of that paragraph. He says, we must not fold into ourselves, into our being, this grave obscenity not in this century, not in the throe of death. Every day, thousands of African children die because of malnutrition and common diseases. In this century, in this horror, we should never let the world give only a passing glance at our dead children within its exuberant and indifferent celebration of abundance of life. There's more to that lament, but I will give that as one example. So we are here we have this kind of problematic, concentrated, sacredly excessive time to which he's turning, which demands another kind of theorizing. And so I come to the second part of my keynote on crises incredible or incredible crises. I said crises incredible because the incredible itself comes to dominate um, the theorization here, not just the crisis, or better, from the crisis comes a kind of reified force in itself that he names the incredible. There's two incredibles, really, that he talks about. First, the post-colonial incredible and the Pentecostal incredible. And the way he puts these together is so fascinating. 
But first consider the incredible itself. This is a notion he develops first from Tejumola Olanian, prolific author in African cultural studies at U Wisconsin Madison, particularly from the book Arrest the Music. And he says this about the incredible. The incredible inscribes that which cannot be believed, that which is too improbable, astonishing and extraordinary to be believed. The incredible is not simply a breach, but an outlandish infraction of normality and its limits. The incredible dissolves all props of stability, normality and intelligibility and engenders social, um, in fact, dissolves all props of stability, normality and intelligibility and engenders social and symbolic crisis. Now, both the post-colonial incredible for Dr. Wari Boko and the Pentecostal incredible enact an outlandish infraction of normality and its limits. This is the first way to think about these incredible. In terms, I have already laid out, these outlandish infractions destroy history as extension of delicately related events of shared living and flourishing. The post-colonial incredible does this by taking aim at the normality of any sense of the common. The common life is destroyed and exists, if at all, only in an informalized way, writes Wari Boko. It no longer is structurally differentiated from patrimonial, ethnic, clientelistic networks and other particularistic domains, which are more arbitrary. The normality of common life is destroyed. And Wari Boko masterfully provides examples of this from Chris Abani's novel, Graceland, as well as from other sources in, in ethnography, which take him back to Rwanda again and to the Congo and to other zones of death that can be found in the post-colonial state. In Nigeria, this tends to map on to an ongoing 60 years of the state of corruption and violence in his own Nigeria, which he paints in very complex colors, of course. Everywhere he finds the, uh, the breakage of time and change. Again, the breaking of bone, the crunching underfoot that tourists experience when visiting the sites of genocide and Rwanda. This is the post-colonial incredible, this outlandish breakage of the normal and of the common. What then of the Pentecostal incredible? I'm understanding this notion in Wari Boko as both worsening the post-colonial incredible, but also as a creative engagement with it. And there are implications of this for all of us who are trying to understand religion in the global world today. If the post-colonial incredible is an outlandish infraction of normality, Wari Boko presents the Pentecostal incredible as another form of outlandish infraction, but this time of faith itself. This is because the faith that takes the form of the Pentecostal incredible is an infraction of reason and even Christian normativeness and their limits. Now the Pentecostal incredible, as I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience, is not to be identified with the Pentecostal principle or with the Pentecostal hypothesis that Nimi has so carefully delineated in other works and which, as he writes, makes necessary and important contributions to social ethics, uh, operating in relationship to principles of excellence. But here, with the Pentecostal incredible, as I understand him, those contributions of Pentecostalism run off track. Because in responding to the post-colonial incredible, the Pentecostal incredible adapts to the post-colonial, and so doing, exacerbates the incredible outlandishness at work in the post-colonial state. The result is an eruption of thinking as a reason of blessed indifference, a mad metaphysical dance, as he says, violations of, quote, common standards of justification and acceptability, close quote. The results for Pentecostal churches in the post-colonial state are cataloged by Waraboko in another long paragraph, listing the psychotic delirious acts wherein pastors and leaders of the megachurches violate reason and truth, making both of them impossible. God's will, he says, is used to justify all kinds of destructive moves against parishioners, their own bodies, sometimes by their own pastors, resulting in a kind of sacral pastorality that is another case of the excess of spirit in a destructive 
uh, modality, such that love of God can even be used to legitimize some of the most horrible of deeds. Now, as Wari Boko ponders this, the Pentecostal incredible in relationship to the post-colonial incredible, he asks himself, and I cite him, quote, how do you think if you're an African Pentecostal theologian like me, facing the Pentecostal brain, quote, that has fallen under the claptrap of thaumaturges, close quote. And here he paraphrases the Apostle Paul intoning, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will help me make sense of all of this? It's the great merit of these two essays that Wari Boko will reinterpret the Pentecostal incredible as a way forward to birth a new important phase of, I think, his radical political theology. How does this work? I can only sketch it briefly in the last section of my paper on his political theology. Wari Boko's political theology emerges from an understanding of the two Incredibles and the way they interplay with one another, as well as with Western modernity. What is most interesting is the way that Wari Boko interprets this destructive eruption of the Pentecostal Incredible as a response to and engagement with the post-colonial Incredible and its suffering in order to wrestle with both toward a promise of transcending the destruction at work in both. It is with this theological turn in the context of the two Incredibles that Wari Boko announces a kind of departure from being ensconced in what he calls the standard issue stuff of mainstream predominant theology, close quote. And I welcome that kind of move, being at the belly of the beast of that kind of theology, perhaps at Princeton Theological Seminary. Especially in the second of the two essays, that I've been examining. Wari Boko pushes beyond, it seems to me, even the liberating theology of his 2018 book, The Split God, to reflect on something that he calls the non-theological. What is this? It's a difficult concept and I cannot explore all of its dimensions right here. But basically it's a move beyond a kind of theology that has been obsessed with establishing order. And yet it's not merely reactive to celebrate disorder, but it is a kind of theology that focuses on what Wari Boko calls following the Slovenian philosopher Slavo Žižek. He, it focuses on the terrifying excess that is a part of being human and is a part of almost all orders. The terrifying excessive disorder that lurks in all orders and is especially marked when we behold the living dead not just the ancestral dead who are present to the living, but the living dead, or to use a notion that Zizek uses also, the undead, still living, but showing forth an intensification of being dead. The post-colonial incredible may create the zones of death of the undead, but the Pentecostal incredible rises with it. Wari Boko's radical political theology will dare to ride the Pentecostal incredible, as it were, in some manner, so as to expose and subvert the post-colonial incredible, simultaneously trying to turn the energy of the Pentecostal toward liberation. You may say this sounds like liberation theology or a political theology, and in many ways it is, but what I find distinctive about it is the way the dispossessed and the oppressed are not bracketed off as a category uniquely apart from the whole which needs liberation, certainly not just assimilation, but their disorder is part of the order of things of our very humanity and must be addressed as such. And so Wari Boko turns in some final reflections in his 50 page second essay on governance as trauma in Nigeria to a new Christian mode for his radical political theology it's one that in fact advances the notion of promise, saying that promise is crucial and that Christ is the grand promise. I'll let others of you, and I hope I'm whetting your appetite for this, um, read those reflections on the Christianity, uh, on the radical Christianity he proposes. What I find particularly important, however, is that Wari Boko relates the Pentecostal incredible to the post-colonial order and disorder in such a way that it pertains to those other than only Christians, 
just as it pertains to those others elsewhere than in Nigerian society. A beautiful sentence points in this direction. He writes, quote, the Pentecostal incredible is a silent energy coiled at the base of every common life, waiting to be awakened in order to threaten social bonds and structures of reality and mind. That coiled energy is always there in the common life of societies, continually providing energy that can be destructive as well as enabling. But when the common is destroyed as it is by post-colonial orders, then the silent energy coiled becomes a spring releasing disruption. And his challenge in his radical political theology is to guide the eruption, the uncoiling of that spring in a way that is renewing and a kind of winnowing force, a kind of wind of reconstruction. So that as he puts it, quote, members of the community are grasped and attuned with their being with one another. Now, in conclusion, Wari Boka's lesson for those of us here and elsewhere is important. If I could employ an image, he may be suggesting that we need to surf amid the turbulent waves of this reactive Pentecostal incredible that might resist the post-colonial incredible, but all too often sets it aflame. And he is writing in a way that is instructive for our addressing comparable evangelicalisms in other locations that arise as an anxious display of meaninglessness, a lashing out, a floundering in the seas of the post-colonial disorder, close quote. We need to ride the turbulence, even the chaos, he suggests, precisely in order to discern new orders, new ways of rebuilding the commons for people of all faiths, groups, and nations, whether for Christians who can approach the future with the grand promise of Christ, or for Muslims, or those of diverse African traditional religions, or those too of secular consciousness and conscience. There's so much more to develop about all these themes, but you see the radical political theology emergent from the way Nimi is trying to put together the Pentecostal and the post-colonial Incredibles. I would like to just end with questions, which is one of the best ways I found always to walk along together with someone. It's always been the most instructive and enlivening way to walk along with Nimi. And I have four questions that I will not develop at great length. Uh, you can read them later in the longer paper here. But the first is this. I wonder if Nimi would be open to deploying in these recent turns of his radical political theology, something like Tillich's latent spiritual community, one that does not need to manifest a Christ language. This would mean discerning and theorizing forms of community born and forged from the grading of the Pentecostal against the post-colonial incredible to release emancipatory energy but without the need to confess Christ as the grand promise. Is he going that way? I don't know. Second, might not any such spiritual community in the future emergent from his radical political theology need something more than promise, something that is often packed into the word spectrality, which has promise in it, but also a note of threat, which suggests vigilance and resistance and being on guard against violation, even while one lives from the promise. I think you would be open to that, but I am asking to flag a notion of spectrality that makes promise just one dimension and not the primary one. Third, I'd like to ask about his notion of the emergence of what he calls, quote, the incredible man woman as kind of exemplary of what the emergence of an ideal way of riding the Pentecostal incredible would look like. This singularity of the notion incredible man slash woman as he writes it is kind of singular and it's difficult to accommodate in relationship to his own calls for a new community, a new being with. How do I, how do we manage that difficulty of the singularity of this notion and perhaps also of the binary gender terms here which are often part of colonizing modalities too? An interesting question. Fourth and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I pose a question that takes us back to his turn to history uh, when he surveys the ponderous post-colony and the concentrated concrete 
incredibles met in everyday Nigeria living and so many other places. Would I be right to ask about where promise is concretized? There's something abstract about the way that even the second paper ends with the talk of the promise and the promise in Christ. Where would I find the movements, the communities that for Dr. Rory Boko embody the promise? I think if I looked back over his many books, I might find answers to this question, but I'm wondering to what communities of the promise he might point to today amidst the grating action of the Pentecostal incredible with the post-colonial incredible. Where are those movements? With these questions, I'll end my remarks with the very last line of my opening quote with which Ashil Mbembe ends his book, Necropolitics. And it's also the last line with which Frantz Fanon ended his well-known first book, Black Skin, White Masks. May these words pervade the spirit of our continued co-working, if I may dare dream such, our walking along together. Fanon entombed these words and Mbembe does still today in his necropolitics. The words are these, oh my body, always make me a man who questions. Mm. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruth will direct the conversation, but let me start. The reason why we left a lot of time is to actually expand the space of democratic conversation. Um, and I want to start. And I will connect my remarks, you are getting applause on the charts, if you are reading them, by the way. People are commending your lecture already. Mark? There's a very interesting light effect happening with Nemia at the moment. I would like us all, all to note. Yeah. So, so, Mark, you should read the charts because there are questions for you on the chat. But let me start. And I'm going to start. I, won't, I will stay within the paradigm of your conversation. I but, liked it, Nimi. It was looking mystical. But create, but create a contest for it. And the, the way I will shape it so that you can respond to it is there's an argument developed by our colleague in India that we're now in the age of anger. In that very fascinating book, by the way, in that age of anger, there's no place in the world today where the majority, many people are not complaining. They're complaining. They're complaining about the state, about the system. In Nigeria, there was just the most massive um, post-colonial protest. And people tend to forget that what happened in Nigeria, they were happening in seven countries at the same time against police brutality, against rape, abuse of women, and things like that. And we cannot disconnect that age of anger from religion and also from Pentecostalism. In the case of Pentecostalism, it promises excessive hope. But that hope is not being realized. So that's one problematic there. Because if you keep promising hope and people have no jobs, no food, then you are contradicting the very mission. Because it is, it, you, that's the way you set it up. You give them hope and this hope is not realized. The second issue, when I was in school, it was the age of mega nationalism. bigger projects of the nation states, bigger Pan-Africanist movement, Organization of African Union, Pan-Africanism. Today, nobody's talking about mega nationalism anymore. Rather, we're talking about mini nationalism. Everybody wants to have their own country. Where Nimi comes from is people are 
they represent the fourth number four biggest um, nationality there. If you allow people to articulate their wish, they will break the country and create alternative countries. One day I got a letter in the mail appointing me a minister of a country that has not been created. <laughs> <laughs> Because my people just said you are republic, and they appointed me a minister. <laughs> this, I signed for the letter. I was just laughing. Uh, so, <laughs> religion has a place because religion has always been connected to this nationalism, whether it's the mini one, whether it's the mega one. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they actually go to the Bible or the Quran to frame these arguments. So, what happens if? what they're now articulating is secession, return to intense political identities that will give them autonomy, that will empower their people. How, how, how do we frame this set of new arguments? Then you have Boko Haram, ISIS, implosion in the Sahel, all these crises, in one way or the other, they are tied to religion. Sometimes they are not instigated by them, but they are ultimately connected to them. Uh, my, the serious implosion, a global implosion. Where do we go from here? Um, and a deepening conservatism which is contradictory because on the one hand you see the radical projects of political identities and the creation of nation states but on the other hand you find a return to traditions in so many places whether it's in the medicine in the language they use returning to those which modernization has them to abandon whether it's a food system they are returning into it and these have consequences to start from where you started your lecture, which is, is return to history, blending it with theory, and yourself invoking Achille Mbembe. I want to underscore that point. And, and where I underscore it is that, is that all these disciplines, as we collapse their boundaries, they will enable us to move in some of your directions. One element that people may not know about NIMI is the way, because I, 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 I belong to part of the traditions of his teachers, because the way we were thinking and how they taught in Port Harcourt is that we should not limit our students to those disciplines. For instance, when he went to school, they create, when he was in Potako, they created a school. It's a school. In that school, you do economics, you do religion, you do sociology. It was a framing. It's a framing different from how you say you get a degree, it's only history you do. You get a degree, it's only political science you do. And part of the argument is, should we return to this way of retraining people so that the components of their degree will be in what we call a school? in which humanities and social sciences are, are entangled and, 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 and they interface and interact in a way that we can produce more of NIMI instead of just producing a fragmentation that is also limiting our horizons. So I'm trying to elaborate more your lectures to generate a conversation. You can respond or you can wait while I call on other people. Uh, you can write these points down. Monte Lee Rice, I can see you are making comments. Can you unmute Rice? He seems fascinated, he's been making comments. Obina, can you unmute our friend from um, which country? Scandinavia? Rice? Sweden? Rice, let's see. Hello? Anna? Obina? Yes, sir. We can't have unmute. Power to so unmute the person him, themselves has to do it. Who right. has to unmute? Only the you. The person whom you need to unmute, Toy, has to unmute himself. 
Okay. And, uh, the administrator cannot unmute for them. No, we are right. muting them. Uh, Rice, can you unmute yourself? No, we are the one who unmute them. I, I am no. here now. Okay. Yay. I am here now. Yeah. Uh, you, just to just to clarify, actually, I live in Singapore, <laughs> and uh, right now it is midnight. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, that that is the situation. It's midnight here. I I was listening with. Uh, great fascination to uh, Dr. Taylor's address. And um, I, I want to, to read into the uh, literature he was referring to, this uh, African scholar on uh, how to pronounce his name. Mbembe. The, the ne ne necro politics, yes. Mbembe, Mbembe. Yes, yes. The, but the thing that came to mind um, listening to him was actually our panel this morning on the meaning of split because I, I was consistently arguing the primacy of Lanconian uh, psychology uh, <laughs> driving uh, Warren Borkel's split notion via uh, Slavo Suzet. And uh, frankly, that, that was, that's the background to the, to the statement I wrote about uh, the, uh, the pains and wounds and trauma birthing eloquence, birthing, if you don't mind me saying as a Pentecostal, birthing Pentecost, birthing uh, uh, you know, potential and, and new possibilities. It's, it's this theme of fractures, of splits, and trauma that births uh, something new, new creation, and, uh, and better ways forward. That, that was the, the, the theme that I got. I, I felt that Dr. Taylor's uh, message was actually reiterating the themes that we were talking about the discussion earlier today in uh, the first panel. So I can't help but but see this uh, these these underlying uh, Lanconian themes at work again in Dr. Robert Barkle's um, split notion. Um, so do you want me to share or do you want to do it? I'm happy to. Um, Nimi, do you want to answer a bunch or what? How do you want to do it, Toy? Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Okay. I'm happy to. So Nimi, would you prefer to collect some questions? You've got marks four, which are already huge ones. And I would like to add, I'm going to take the privilege of adding one, but would you like to collect some or would you like to respond one, one after the other? How would you like to do it? No, I don't. I'm, I want others to respond. I want to learn from them and you can respond on my behalf. There is nothing I'm going to say that you cannot say <laughs> better. I debate this. Rubbish, that is rubbish. No, this is uh, not true. Uh, I debate uh, this with you uh, on the phone. And sometimes Ruth is so interested, she will fly over from Toronto to Boston just to debate <laughs> with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite true, but I, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to, because I actually haven't read these last two papers. I'm very excited. The, that I would I'd also like to add something. It is one of these trials, having worked on this topic for about 30 years, to see that I've managed to come up with one book, one book. <laughs> it is, I said, it, you know the difference, the difference is, um, and this goes all the way down actually with Nimi and I, is the Holy Spirit, he's got the Holy Spirit, and I sadly do not. And, and that, I, I mean, that's one of the arguments. However, I, I think Mark's four points are super exciting and interesting, and as you very well know, since we've there's a particular cafe in the town between where my brother lives and where Nimi lives that we've spent hours and hours arguing over these questions. And I don't want to jump the gun because I'm meant to talk about the sovereignty of miracles in the plenary later on today. But I did want to ask to pick up with Mark, the fundamental difference between the, you and I, which I finally worked out, is that you're actually properly speaking a philosopher and I'm just a dilettante. In fact, I mean, I do, I'm a social scientist. And so my theory is ground up in a way that for an ethicist and for a philosopher, properly speaking, 
Yours is also because it's your lived experience, but it's articulated in a very different way. So I often feel that our disputes are not actually, properly speaking, disagreements, but they're we're working at a different, potentially a different, um, on a different level or a different category, right? But I do have this question, right? Because there is, um, you and I both know that, uh, that I mean, the, one of the most exciting and interesting philosophical formulations I've read in you was your argument about the transimmanence. This is a Nancyan idea, um, or you might want to call it the quasi-transcendental, so that Pentecostals, you know, the serious matter of salvation is a matter that's put into play and is played with, right? So one of my important questions is, is it, how do we respond today to the kind of Davidian claim um, about um, what he calls mondia latinization or uh, global latinization? In other words, with the emprise of Christianity, not simply on the post-colony, which is an obvious historical claim and has lots of political consequences that I tried to, some of which I tried to tease out. But secondly, more broadly, right? I mean, I've been working on the US and I have another, so the first question is, to what extent is the aspirational part of your ethical thought or your philosophical political theology, um, you know, to what extent is it A, tied to the Christian form irrevocably? So that's Mark's important question. What do we do about the fact that we're talking about a particular religious formation, which is in this moment of violence, trying harder and harder to mobilize along the lines of ident identification. And we all know from reading our history that identification is the totalitarian um, impulse par excellence. You know, we have that wonderful piece by Nancy and La Coula Bart on the Nazi myth, which I just revisited because it strikes me in times of QAnon, it's useful to think about what happens to the, the what he calls, what Nancy calls myth-making dreaming in the modern world. He calls it dreaming. And it seems to me that it looks very close to Pentecostalism. But I want to know if the problem that Derrida flags, which is to say that religion cannot take place. In other words, it is driven into autoimmune overdrive, um, both of these world tra traditions, both Christianity, but Islam, um, largely because of the nature of, you know, late global, you know, what, the, the nature of teletechnologization and um, the, 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 the ways in which capitalism is a regime of, a regime of equivalence functions. So my question is, if it's the case that we have, um, that the transcendence is perhaps impossible in our world, and especially for a Nancyan kind of thinker, we want it to be. We want prayer to be something that's an imminent activity. We want being to open up a hole in the world, not outside of the world, right? So if we're after something like a transimmanence, because it's it saves us from the danger of a positive political theology, which we all know is terrifying, right? What do you do then? How do you locate the community? Or is it simply, um, is it simply a community to come in that Davidian way, right? So what is the status of the those who are gonna respond and turn the Pentecostal um, incredible against the post-colonial incredible? Because I haven't seen, frankly, any evidence of that. On the contrary, as you and I both know, and when we were looking at um, pandemic and QAnon going viral with Nigerian pastors, and I mean, I didn't want to say I told you so, but <laughs> I kind of did because this is what I've always seen. And I want to know what happens. What is it that we need to get the shift? Because it's as if, right? I mean, a conference I went to in Quito with the Latin American Pentecostal theologians, it did sound a lot like liberation theology. But on the other hand, when you look on the ground in Brazil and many of these places, you are not seeing a corresponding community. And so what I worry about is this becomes what liberation theology became, which was to say something that we did in the university, but not on the ground in these countries. So that is, I guess, my big question for you. I hear that is, uh, can I speak just briefly? Uh, yeah, yeah. Please, I hear just... that is a question for, for Dr. Oh. Rory Boko primarily, and uh, your comments underscore my question of where do we look for the social movements that express the kind of energy that uh, Nimi's emergent radical political theology seems to be leading. And uh, my travels in Central America and Latin America lead me to pose the same question. And it's increasingly a mid yes. political <laughs> politics in the United States. It's important to ask the question here. The other thing, if I might be so bold, and I think I would like everybody who's an Africanist in this collection of scholars to think about this, and I've been thinking about this increasingly, as I observe what, what is happening in the United States, and I've been obsessively, as Mimi knows, you know, living on right-wing watch and following Paula White, and, the, you know, enjoying the M&M 
retakes of her. But the point being that what we see happening in the U.S. is been has happened in Africa. In other words, this has been mooted by some scholars, I believe maybe the Comoros, I can't remember exactly who mooted this in a recent conference around Africa as a precursor. And in other words, as a, as a prophetic space for what will happen in places like the United States and these Western liberal democracies. And I think methodologically, there's something really interesting in that proposition. Because many of the, of the kinds of disintegrations of institutional norms, these kinds of breakdowns that we see in the state, the kinds of responses, the fact that 41% of all Americans think Jesus is coming back by 2050, is one of those massive social facts that has to be dealt with, right? The fact that the, the response to, for example, COVID is filtered through not the, simply the lens of politics, but an epistemological stance about the real, right? Which isn't something Pentecostal streamed up. Don't forget the pundits under George W. Bush who were talking about you people living in the reality-based worlds, right? And for me, that kind of political talk, which is, you know, we don't, we don't respond to reality, we create it, is a Pentecostal way of thinking, right? Am I right? It's performative. So the faith, so again, there's an epistemological question and a question around language that I would, you know, we don't have to get into that. But one of the ways I think this happens, the question around trust, Mark, that you brought up is very much around the ways in which Pentecostalism manages to stage experience of language as ethical, political, right? Um, and in, in the register of the performative. Um, and I, you know, I, I focused a lot of that in my work, but I think there's something in, um, I think there's something about an epistemological crisis, which is obviously more acute in places like, um, obviously more, you know, sort of binary looking in places like the US, but it's always been part of the problem in Africa, right? And trying to get um, students, for example, to understand how to think about phenomena such as witchcraft or religious or spiritual activities is often one of the more difficult challenges for professors talking to, you know, students who are not African. Um, so I, I wonder if these questions themselves too, are, are, you know, what we talked about, you know, for years, lots of that, you know, especially Nigerian is talking about the problem of insecurity, ontological and epistemological insecurity, how this is also a globally, it's not simply a post-colonial issue in other words. So what can Africa teach the rest of the world would be my second question on this point. I mean, anyone can pick this up. There's lots of scholars here who know more than I do about this. That's absolutely, it's for certain. But I, I mean, the, the, the other question might be Mark, for Mark might be um, a question around Christianity, frankly, which is one of the questions you asked. And you seem to ask it, um, how, 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 and Dini might be able to intervene also, to what extent is this about um, Christianity per se, or is this an, a, 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 theo a, a political theology that we could think about in terms of a, a broader, uh, you know, like Amos Young wants to do something like um, a theology of the spirit that can transcend, you know, these um, faith boundaries, which I think is very ambitious, but it's, and, but I'm not sure how Pentecostal it is either anymore, right? If it's, because for me, the, the political limit is the limit of the Christian faith, right? And that outside of that space, there is no redemption, which of course, politically is really a problem that you have, you know, you're gonna have groups who are worthy of redemption and those who are not. And politically that is not compatible with a democratic um, way of, of living um, or emancipation in my view, because if difference and identity are what's at stake, then boundary keeping is going to be the main thing. And, and then, you know, there are the, then you have to add beyond the ethical question, all of the ways in which political entrepreneurs exploit and take advantage. And we can see Donald Trump is the perfect avatar for that, right? because there's nothing religious or Christian about it, but he has become the voice or the spokesperson for a group of militant uh, militant Christians, let's just say. So what do we do about the militancy of these Christians and the fact that they now are formed in militias and have guns and whatnot? Yes, I would like to yield to Professor Wari Boko at this point, unless he's saving his comments oh, for later. One second, one second. Let's, let, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's ask members of the audience because he has his own panel later. Anybody, Samuel Salanga, you want to make a contribution to this? And Tim no. looks like he wants to say something yeah. too. This no, will talk, but let's grant room for members of the Yeah, audience. okay. I'm, unfortunately, I'm not seeing people. So if you want to- I can see them. Samuel, I can see you there, but we can't hear you. Can you unmute Samuel Salanga, please? Samuel, unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? No, we unmute them. Oh, okay. Uh, I, Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead. I found the presentation very fascinating. There are so many issues, and I'm a kind of person who likes to dig deep into uh, whatever somebody is saying. Like Derrida says, if you're reading, if you don't understand one paragraph, it's a waste of time to move to the next paragraph. You have to digest what this paragraph is saying. But here is my concern about Pentecostalism. There was a time I was writing and reflecting about the potential of Pentecostalism to bring about change in Africa and Nigeria. And I felt like, assuming metaphorically speaking, Christianity or Pentecostal Christianity was a corporation that was established by Jesus Christ. And he granted the corporation its mission, its goals and its values. Today, it seems to me like, honestly, and I grew up in a Christian family, but honestly, I feel like Christ has lost the monopoly over that corporation, which is the shareholders that are now really <laughs> making decisions about that. And I say this, I really mean it because the shareholders is like, here is what Christianity really is. They read the same verse in the Bible. They come up like uh, Ruth was saying, Look at, uh, the reaction of Pentecostals about uh, the elections in the United States or whatever and all those kind of things. So my problem is, if you look at, for instance, the message that Peter received and Cornelius received, there were two different messages. But when you combine them, there was something beautiful that came out of it. Okay, it was something complimentary. But when people are guided, supposed, are supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit, and in my view, the Pentecostal does not believe that he's an ordinary human being or she's an ordinary human being because ordinary human beings have five senses, but the Pentecostal actually has six. The Holy Spirit, okay, and the grace of God or whatever, which gives him something different from the regular person. And I noticed that it's one thing to make a claim just based on purely rational analysis and then make a claim that no my claim is not just rational but it is also informed by something much higher so i trust these people but when i begin to compare their work or something like that i feel like oh my god um they seem to be everybody seems to be just interpreting uh the bible the way they want let me give, let me make one last comment and then i end it uh here there was a time i went to the office and I started feeling I was in a bad mood. I didn't know what happened. I didn't have any quarrel with anybody. And then I decided that I will sit down and then look back at the past 24 hours to see exactly what happened that changed my mood. And then I realized that I was reading a book and I came across one Pentecostal pastor of Nigeria who preached that in his church that um, he didn't see any basis where a member of his congregation could be richer than him. And the justification for that was when Jesus was going into Jerusalem, he rode on a donkey, on a colt, but the disciples walk on their feet. And that means they <laughs> see glory there. Okay. So when I read it, I didn't know that it offended my sensibility. And I went to the office. <laughs> and I felt like I had a quarrel with somebody. <laughs> and then I realized that that was really what I read that offended me really seriously. <laughs> so what do you do? In a liberal democracy, you cannot tell that person to shut up. The best you can do is just to make your own counter argument because they have the freedom to say it. And this is why I said the shareholders now have taken over. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was really interesting. Okay, that Nimi, I think, oh, Tim, 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 yeah. Tim, and then we have to put Nimi on the hot seat, I think. Tim, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I having written a book on churches and genocide in Rwanda, um, one of the things that I concluded from my work there was that it really was a challenge to Christians everywhere. Um, because um, one of the realities I saw on the ground, having been in Rwanda just prior to the genocide, was that there were a lot of Christians who were uh, very actively promoting human rights and working to unite people across ethnic lines. Um, but that the dominant voices within the church uh, ended up taking the church towards violence. Um, and so I see this as something that is problematic in, in response to partially what Ruth was saying and, and also our, our keynote speaker. You know, I do think the role of religious leaders in helping either to promote tolerance and peace or to promote violence is really key. Um, so I, I appreciate it very much what, what, our, what our speaker was suggesting. And I would love to hear more from, from Professor Wariboko about what his, what his thoughts are on this, because I do think this is a moment where not just in the United States, but uh, across the world, there is an acceptance of nationalism and division and bigotry and violence 
Um, and I want to know what the churches are saying to respond to that and what, what the churches could do to help uh, move us in a different direction. I don't know now. I think you are going to have to talk. Nimi. I think uh, you are going to have to speak some small words. Um, <laughs> somebody, um, has his hand uh, first, so we want to take, um, then maybe I would speak. I think we still have about 20 minutes for, for this section. So, okay, well, I just can't see who it is that would like to. Um, yeah, yeah sounded, if you Because I don't have everybody in front of me, unfortunately, so I'm not seeing everybody who is uh, trying it, to speak. Yeah, it's Pastor Gozim uh, on air. Oh, okay. So All right. Guy. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. I cannot see you, but please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to speak to what uh, Professor Samuel just said. Um, I, I have, I think I have also discussed this informally with Professor Nimi uh, during the race uh, protests in the US. Um, it's, and uh, Samuel said, if this was a cooperation that Jesus started, Jesus has lost to shareholders. What has simply happened? What has simply happened is because, you know, remember again, God gave us free will from the Garden of Eden. And uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, we still have our free will, right? But somewhere, one of the greatest challenges Christians have, one of the greatest challenges, in my opinion, because on the cross, Jesus took away our sin. So we don't have a sin problem, but we have a flesh problem. The flesh, the carnal nature, the nature of man before Christ came, the nature that man had become so used to, the feelings and the impulses that man had responded to, he thought to before uh, he got saved and got the Holy Spirit baptism. So now the challenge most Christians have, including evangelicals, Pentecostals, is where to draw the line between what my natural impulses are leading me to do and what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. And But God did not leave us without, uh, without uh, a choice. God, I mean, without uh, a solution. The Bible the written word of God from Genesis to Revelation reveals the will of God to us. And whatever is contrary to the word of God is not from God. So if, for example, uh, the uh, what Timothy Longman just said now in, in the genocide in Rwanda, uh, the Christians, etc., just like we saw in America in their race issues, if a Christian knows that the Bible says, love one another, for love is of God. And anyone who loves knows God. The one that doesn't love does not know God. The person cannot see another human being and do them evil, no matter what. If the person is responding to the Holy Spirit and the word of God, because anything we do, the Holy Spirit aligns with the word. The Holy Spirit agrees with the word of God. So Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says to the word and to the prophets, if they do not speak in accordance with this word, it is because there's no light in them. So whenever people have impulses that are contrary to the Bible, those impulses are not from God. And when, those, when they obey those impulses, they are acting contrary to the word of God. They might call themselves general overseers. They might call themselves Pentecostals or evangelicals. But whenever they act contrary to the word of God, it is not the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's one thing that both Pentecostals, evangelicals, anybody that calls themselves Christians, we have to define when am I obeying the Holy Spirit and when am I obeying my carnal, natural, biased impulses. Thank you. Maybe. Yes. No. It's, it's, you're, you're being very quiet. Much too quiet. I mean, I can answer if you would like. I have an answer to that one. But um, I mean, um, you are the, the ogre. Um, so in the short, also, um, um, Dean Moore, Professor Elizabeth, um, 
uh, more also asks a question about she wants, if you look at the chart, she wants more um, uh, both uh, Professor Taylor and I to talk about the issue of promise, right? Um, the, uh, so, but I will just limit my, um, a few remarks to what Professor Taylor and you have said, and, and then um, turn to her briefly. The key question both of you have asked for sake of, uh, for sake of time is, where will this change come from? Where will the promise of the new, or what are these communities, as Professor Taylor put it, where we think that these emancipatory impulses in Nigeria or in African post-colony will emerge? Otherwise, we are just uh, theorizing. So, so that is the first question, then, the, the, the issue of promise. Um, I have two responses to the first question, simple. And uh, probably Professor Taylor can guess what I would say because I studied Portelic with him. Portelic would say, we never know where the new will come. And so if you allow that to paralyze you, you are never going to see a vision of change. That, that we believe that the new will come and Portelic was relying on um, the book of Isaiah said, I will do the new thing. Do you know where it's going to come from? We don't really know. So, so, so the new will always come and the chaotic moment will come. <clears throat> but in most times, it's in a retrospective uh, perspective that we can say the new has come. If, like um, McIntyre made an argument, if you can predict an invention, then invention has happened, right? So we're not always know the new, but if, for, for, for an African-American that was enslaved, if he burdened himself or herself said, I don't know how the change is going to come, then he, has, he or she has not taken the first step towards emancipation. So you got to hope for a change. And whether that change will come or it will come through your grandchildren or, or, or so. But you got to, and that is the purpose of vision and, and theorizing. So, so, so that, is, that is one way to answer it. But I think that is the ship way to answer it to, 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 to get that <laughs> The question, so, yes. but, but, but I know what to answer is that it's a question that cannot be answered on a forum like this. We need empirical study. And this is the same question that bedeviled uh, Jeffrey Stout for a long time that he, he wrote his book organizing or, or so. He wanted to study things on the ground. And I think this is where Nigerian social scientists and ethicists need to come up. I feel that there are pockets of um, communities that are developing that we don't just know because our social science are not stop, uh, studying them to know where these uh, communities that could be the basis for some kind of exchange will come up, right? So that is the question you need to answer. Maybe they are not there or they are there, but that is an empirical question because you know, something may just pop up like the way the anti-SARS uh, movement came up, but that may, may not be a sustainable thing. Are there communities where these people are prepared to do this. So I mean, focus of it or they do not exist. So that is the kind of empirical study that um, we will need to take, right? So still on that question, I will not turn to start again. Jeffrey Stout had a debate with McIntyre and which um, Professor Taylor knows no, no as well. He said, as social scientists, as philosophers, we should be very careful to say every society or any society is in ruins. He said, if it's in ruins, where do we stand to hope? That no matter how bad a situation is, that will be a place where you can stand to project forward to hope. Because that was the challenge Jeffrey Stout gave uh, to McIntyre. He said, if everywhere is ruined, then where can you even stand to think about reorganizing Western society? Now, so the place to stand may just sometimes be historical. And this is what I find out in my, uh, I try to do in my book, Niger Ethics and Society in Nigeria, uh, History, Identity and Political Theory. That a place to stand might even be that we retrieve some of our heritage. So what did I do? I retrieved the story in 1857 of the, of the Ijo people killing their gods as a protest against God performing to tell our youths that indeed we can go back if the present generation do not give us any ground to hope. We can go back to history. And how do we think about sovereignty? I went back to the Ife sovereignty, the, the, the idea of Oni of Ife as a sovereign. So in all that book, what I was doing was retrieving history, at least as a place to stand, even because we know for the past 60 years, we've been disappointed. 
So I, I, that is where I believe that, in that sense, I'm optimistic that we always have to find a place to stand, even in the bleakest of moment that African post colony is in. So that's do this work. So, so the important thing is what? We need empirical studies that will begin to identify or begin to not show where those things will, will, will come up. We cannot, st and I've not done that empirical uh, study. And probably there'll be nothing on the ground there in Nigeria or any African countries. But I believe that there may be pockets of things uh, happening that which we could begin to piece together. And that is the kind of work that Tim Longman, Tim Longman in his work does not, he's a political uh, scientist, he doesn't just talk about that. He, he combines ethnography and visits to begin to tease those things uh, uh, together. That's why his, his book was very relevant in helping me theorize the post-sacred violence, the work he did in, in Rwanda that uh, uh, Professor Taylor just quoted. And you for roots, you also, you are trained as a political theorist as Oxford, but you've always been by ethnography to say, some of these questions we need to go to the ground to, we cannot settle it merely on political um, this is. So that is where I would say the, uh, we need to approach the question. The other question about promise, which maybe uh, Taylor can come in. Because when I look at the Nigerian situation, and I've been telling political theorists and philosophers that Western philosophy for a long time, or even for, through its inception with, with Plato, have always been concerned about order. If you read uh, uh, Eric Vogel, uh, is it Vogel, uh, five volumes mm -hmm. of political order, it's always about tracing an order from, from Plato, uh, the, 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 the Republic or so, the order, and if you see Rancia, hatred of democracy. So it's all about how do you create an order? Of course, it's important. You can't create this, this civilization without an order. But in Africa, we're dealing mainly with disorder. So how do we begin to think about disorder in connection to, to order? The, because the post-colony is a place of disorder. Governance, as I showed in my book, is, 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 is governance of trauma. To live in Nigeria is to be subjected to the trauma of governance every day. And mm -hmm. that would lead to the uh, uh, post-colonial incredible and the Pentecost incredible. But in the midst of that, um, Taylor said, how do I then hope for the incredible man? The, the, this is the trick. We have an incredible situation. So my hope is almost incredible. That, that's why I call it incredible man. It's, it's, it's not something logical that something could be, but in, in, in the hope you feel that something will have to come up, somebody have to come up. That is the promise of every, um, 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 of every situation. That maybe some, and, and like the SARS came up in Nigeria, the project, no one thought about it. There's always that possibility that the new can break through. So where would those kinds of person come out? Yes, I use the singular, but it could also be an historical uh, uh, a singular like Paul Tillich would, would, would say in that kind of people come out because and those, those kinds of work uh, need to be done. And why do I uh, um, have it as a promise? The first is that um, Taylor mentioned only Christ, but if you looked at it, I mentioned also an area in that paper because an area said something that is very important, fascinating for, for me. He said, there are two things that make us live in this world very well. That is the, the notion of promise and the notion of, notion of forgiveness. She, being a Jewish person, wrote a dissertation on those two on Augustine. And what, what was that point? He said the world is generally an uncertain place. That promise is what gives us islands of certainty in the ocean of uncertainty. That without promise, you can't have any place to stand. So promise is something, and that is also what is in the uh, for, for, for Christian faith, for God and most men will show that God is a God of promise. So we have to look at the promise in the Nigerian situation or in the African situation. Otherwise, what do I do? Give up and die and roll that Africa is doomed, there is nothing. So I always express that hope. That doesn't mean that the hope will be realized in my lifetime. But I, I've told people I'm no more writing for those who are alive in Africa today. I'm writing for those who will come behind. As Walter Benjamin said, he said, we expect the coming of the next generation and we should begin to prepare for them. Right? So that's for me, it's a promise that a next generation uh, will, will, will come in. And then an area said, the other thing is about forgiveness because we always make mistakes. We always um, um, injure other people. 
But so without forgiveness, the consequences will live for us forever. But what forgiveness does is to say, I forgive you and therefore the consequences will not go any further. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a fundamental belief. So, so probably like science or, or anything, there is some deconstructible position in my work to say, the, the axiomatic proposition is to have a place of hope in the midst of hopelessness. And, and I may have that maybe is baked into me. I grew up in, when they talk about the last six, 60 years, I grew up after independence and it's been one bleak moment after another. <laughs> but yet, if you're in Nigeria, you keep pushing on. As they say in Nigeria, it go better. So, so, so you keep <laughs> pushing on one way. And that is showing for me in my scholarship, I will be, because people don't give up hope. We don't give up hope in the midst of that. And I'm trying to tell people that there is a hope. And I believe that Africa will be delivered one day. And Nigeria will be delivered one day. So I want to, I don't want to, because it's a trauma, we are going through trauma already. But in the midst of trauma, how do we point people to see there could be a light coming somewhere? And I said, I drew from an area as, as a political philosopher, she's not a Christian. And I also drew in support of that promise from also Jesus Christ as a Christian. Because I'm speaking also to the Pentecostal incredible relates to Christians with Christ. So have to also draw the attention to the issue of uh, a promise. And I also talk about promise in other settings. So that is the basis of trying to speak to that audience, even if as, as I was trying to speak to the larger world. So that's what I was doing with the promise and that's what I was doing with the communities of, of, of possible communities of hope. But I said in an interview recently with Professor Falola, I said Nigeria is an impossible possibility. You have to believe in the <laughs> impossible. That, that is an impossible possibility, just like uh, Ranoni Nibo would say. Everything around you tells you that it's impossible that something good will happen. But yet, yet again, you believe. So that's what makes it the impossible possibility that in the midst of all that, maybe that is the theologian side of me rather than the philosopher or the <laughs> economist that we need to give people some hope. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not realistic or um, that things will happen. I'm doing that with my eyes open, but it got to also write for the next generation that will come up. For the Christians or for the, anybody will say, how do we find hope in the midst of this bleak condition? And so that's why I keep talking about hope and, and all these things that the incredible man will come. But because I'm not even sure it was going to, it's going to come. That's why I call the person incredible man. It, it, the, the coming will be incredible, but yet you leave that window of hope open so life can go on. It, it's the philosophical structure of the to come, really, isn't it? it you know, the David is not a horizon of, not the Kantian, you know, um, regulatory ideal, no horizon, right? The lack of horizon, because it's the radical openness, that kind of thing. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's a radical opening that something will come. We don't just uh, close it up. Right. To the, it could be, I mean, as Derrida says, it could be the worst. No, let, let me show something, right? In the first panel and the year, and I've been to the conferences, book, um, book panels on my work, and they look at the Pentecostal principle and they look at everything that I've written. And they said the Pentecostal principle is the capacity to begin. I said, if you really want to understand what I'm, I'm doing, let people go back and read my ethics and time. Everything I'm telling you is drawn from my age philosophy. You see, that's what we do. If you go back and read my work, not this capacity to, to begin, this hope, that book, the moment I wrote that book, it changed my scholarship because People don't, people think that, okay, I use Western uh, continental philosophy, Western ideas as my uh, interlocutors, but the real source of what I've been working out is that a job book on ethics and uh, time in, in the Niger Delta, uh, um, in, in religion and politics. Because all those ideas that I worked out in the Pentecostal principle and everywhere were anticipated and worked out there. Because this capacity to begin this capacity not to give up. That is where I understand my job upbringing as, as an job person. That, that capacity to always begin, that there's always a hope that you can start. Mm -hmm. And so I've been to a conference in six years and I said, you guys are, are struggling to pin me somewhere. Go back and read that uh, 
book, it was worked out this idea that you can uh, actualize your potential. This idea that you can kill your gods mm -hmm. if they don't li listen to yeah. you. So uh -huh. uh, revolution ideas has been worked out uh, in, in that kind of a book. And so the best way sometimes for people to decode all this book is not that th th these books that came later have not moved beyond that book, but sometimes to get the all moment, as the German would say, you are the all moment of where this hope goes. So people sometimes think that I'm working out Western ideas. No, I'm working out a job idea. Yeah, and I think that's super important because also, Nimi, I'm doing, I'm, I'm being abusive of my charitable, but um, I, I want to underscore that because what you're yeah. actually also yeah. doing is something like comparative yeah. political theory, what we would call, right? And so the king's set, how many? Five? Five bodies? I can't remember how many bodies yeah. your king had. Five bodies, am I right? Yes. That piece. So I love that piece. I thought it was brilliant. And it's partly a, a poke in the eye to Kantorovich and the entire, um, you know, the, the corpus of political uh, Christian political theology, because it's clearly drawn from a completely different tradition, whilst using the model of trying to think about think about how an order is constructed, right? Which is, you know, at, at, at a societal level. And how do we, what is the, que que the question of foundation, which is the political theoretical or political theological question par excellence. And how do you ground a regime with, you know, which just comes back to the question, how, do, how does Pentecostalism itself, given that it's not anything and not everything and not anything goes, given that it has a discursive structure and a history and a, and a kind of set of limits internal to itself, um, that it itself structures the question of hope and the question of trust and the question of beginning again. You know, I, you know, you know, I used Arendt. I felt her, her language was partly we use this language as a kind of heuristic or as a kind of effort in translation, I would say, right? But that after all is what we're always doing in this cross-cultural cultural way. And that the fact that you should, one of the things I would love to see you do is draw out that specificity and that ontology and that epistemology, because it's precisely that difference that's going to make all the difference, in other words, right? What you see playing out in the US amongst Pentecostals is not going to be what happens in Nigeria in any way, shape, or form, and it cannot be. But what I would love to see is how, you know, that, that elevate your EJA history to something like um, a, a more systematic form that we can do that comparative work with because i think that's what's missing particularly for africa and what we work with is christians not so much a longer history of african political thought which of course is obviously complicated because there are so many traditions and there's so much empirical historical material that has just been kind of left waiting for future generations so i just uh, i just want to underscore that that you nimi thinks the uh, universal from as you know it, consciously from a particular position and it is precisely that situatedness that makes his work so genius i think and i'm so i wanted to defend you or re-inscribe re that 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 effort on your part because that's absolutely crucial and i don't know if people see it enough yeah yeah so so right now i'm working on a book called the split time where i'm consciously um my theoretical framework is consciously coming from, uh, from my Calabari traditional religion and philosophy. But you see, I also did that with the ethics and society where I consciously yeah. said, look, I'm writing political theory drawn from African traditional worldview and religion, how they thought about this. It was uh, worse it and every other uh, interlocutors are, are just some ways of allowing me to articulate my voice. And I felt that that was something that has not been done very well in political theory or even by Africans to think political theory, starting from African traditional religion or of course. and work. That's why all the examples of a or Yoruba or even uh, looking at the Igbos and um, uh, um, the uh, one of the politicians you use of language or doing all those things I was doing, or the issue of the Lotus Self, which is the first chapter of, of that book, and, and, and they're looking at the independence. Everything was a Nigerian example, but everything seen from um, traditional point, uh, point of philosophical point of view, but without rejecting conversation with, with other, other, civilization, other theories from other part of the world. It was done that way precisely 
to, to, to say, we can create a rigorous, sophisticated political theory or philosophy drawn from African resources and material and history and put it in conversation with the rest of the world. So I consciously did that on political theory. I'm right now working that on economic philosophy, where um, while the political theory, I traverse many places in Nigeria, as many ethnic groups I can draw in. But in this one that I'm working on, I'm focused on the ejaws, the, the Calabari particular, which is a subset of the jaw, to begin to think about economic philosophy in a way that pays homage to African thought without rejecting in a global world conversation with other theories of the world. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell Mark. Us, oh, yeah, Professor Taylor. Mark, Mark, please, please go just ahead. Time for a very brief comment. I just want to underscore regarding hope. I liked what Nimi said about looking for it. You can't in a way because it's new. I think that was his very first point. Um, and then his next point was that there are these pockets and I would affirm that there are, I've used the phrase shreds and patches before uh, uh, for any kind of tradition of real authentic hope that is politically emancipatory. The only other thing I would like to say is those shreds and patches experiences, which I have known sometimes in struggle against our, our uh, uh, politi politics of death in the US and elsewhere, they're surprising places. They're often not in Christianity. They're not in any religion. They are in indigenous secular groups and the indigenous may be using their gods or killing their gods, like you say in your book. The, the secular folk may be experimenting with new spiritualities. Um, and then you, to study those, I think is an interesting thing. That's what I was calling for in one of my questions. What do those pockets look like? Can we describe them and how did they instigate any fissures in the post-colonial order with a disorder that was creative as well as deconstructive? Uh, these are the things that I'll continue to look for as we contemplate your work to come, as well as I'll go back and read some other passages in the works you pointed us to. Thanks, Mark. That was, uh, how are we doing on time? Um, We're doing well. We're doing well. We have another, we have till noon, am I right? No, we don't have till noon. When do we have till, sorry. We have till 10 oh, yeah. but we can No, go. I mean, for me, oh, sorry, I'm on, I'm on East Coast time. So we, can, we can go for another five minutes. Ah, okay. Uh, is there anybody who would like, who really hasn't had a chance to speak and would like to? We do have someone with his hand raised. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I'm not can doing a good job of hello? finding them. Can you? Please go ahead. Yes, we hello? can hear you, sir. Uh, okay. Hello. Yeah, it's Mubarak. I'm also a PhD student uh, at Macquarie University. I'm also an assistant lecturer at the Department of History and Scripture Studies at Mara Musara University, uh, Nigeria, from the northern part of the country, Nigeria. Uh, I, I would like to draw uh, the attention of uh, Prof. O to give some more explanation from his last statement that he's confining the recent studies on the Calabarese. And he said he, he drew some, some attention of other, other tribes. I want him to tell us, who are these Calabarese? Are Calabarese different <laughs> from the Ijos? <laughs> then, if he has drawn the attention of that, I would like to, uh, to have another new study area from the northern part of the country. We have some Christian... Hausa minorities whom we don't have anything to, to say about them, but we are living together with them. So I would love to have a kind of another perception from the indigenous Hausa Christian minorities in the northern part of the country regarding the uh, movement in the Pentecostal. These are two issues that I want to say something on it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, the Calabrese are part of the Ijaws, and the Ijaw is, the, like um, Professor Falala said earlier, is the fourth largest ethnic group in Nigeria. And so they, they, they span across many states in the, um, from the southeast to the southwest or, or so. So um, I know 
a little bit about them, but to make this study credible, I don't want to just pick up every your community and study. So I decided to, to study one of the groups. So the collaborators are a subset of the Ijo people. Um, um, the, the colonial master spelled it as uh, I-J-A-W, um, but actually locally we spell it uh, I-Z-O-N, it's Zon, Zon rather than Ijo. Okay, so, so, so that is, so I'm studying um, them as a, um, as, as, a, as, a, as a group. Uh, also, and then from there, one could uh, uh, go up and up into other places. In my last book, when I looked at um, um, J.P. Clark's Bacadremo's work and, and that, it was based on the general age concept of, of the way they, they handle the Republican democratic uh, system and how that is also influenced, like Dr. Ambassador Gale just told me how it's influenced by the environment. This is a riverine environment. So their gods, their ways of thinking are very much influenced by the environment. So that's what I'm doing. I wish that someone can also do the work in Northern Nigeria, this kind of work. I know that historians has been doing, excavating this historical knowledge of different parts of Nigeria, different places. I mean, <coughs> across that. that work has been going on for over 60 years, trying to map out the different history of or Mumuzi Soshonu, right now, but the experiences of the of, of, of the non houses in within the uh, hegemony, uh, feudal hegemony established by the British government during colonialism and even continuing to now. So those kind of work has been going on. But what is has not been going on very well is this idea that are there theorists or ethicists or theologians or philosophers, economists who can use those kinds of historical material generated by the historians to begin to theorize aspects of our past and our present going forward. That is the kind of synergy that need, needs to be put in place. So I'm not a trained historian, but I, I, I go to a museum. I was in Liverpool Museum. When it's necessary, I go to places to, to, to get material. But a way that these studies that are doing should be made available or easily accessible. And so, Part of the sadness of some of us who are in the West is, is, is that even though that kind of work is important, but we are make, making our living in the West, so I'm not there to train the next generations of people who can extend the kind of work that we are doing. And that is part of the, of the plight of the post-colony, right? So you would think that, if, for, you, you, would, uh, you would think that there will be even resources, like I'm, I'm due for sabbatical, I could get one year, but is there any African institution that can um, pay half of my salary or something like that? I can go. I can't just pack up and, and go there. I still have to pay my mortgage and my student school fees and all the rest. <laughs> so, so this is the, so even though I know what to do, you can train people to cover those kinds of things, other indigenous, all the worldview. And the more we know about our history, our idea, we've known a lot about our ideas. We've not known much about our philosophy, our social ethical stance. In many of these communities, they have not been studied or they've not been theorized. So that is the dilemma that, that we have. We don't have those institutes that can move scholars um, in diaspora uh, back home and support that kind of this. So uh, individually, we are doing it. Professor Falala does a lot of that. I do on my personal basis, but those are personal uh, efforts. But that is, our governments have not organized a system to tap into the resources of the diaspora intellectual in a way that could feed and energize local knowledge production in Nigeria or any other part of Africa. So, so that is the dilemma that we have. So he has a great question, but somebody needs to be trained to study. Uh, you need a certain level of training before you can do this kind of work, right? And, and uh -huh. we, well, thank you. Because we the next panel starts at eleven, I need to give um, time for people to refresh and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I would like to thank our colleagues from Boston for honoring us. I'm very grateful to the dean of the School of Theology, Professor Mary Moore. I'm grateful to the director, Tim Longman. The keynote is very successful. You can see the reactions that it provoked. Thank you so much, Professor Mark Lewis Taylor. Uh, members of the audience, we thank you. 
we see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for a lovely keynote, uh, Professor Taylor. It was fantastic. Thank you.
You Africans, please listen to me as Africans. And you non-Africans, listen to me with open mind. So far, so far, so far, so far, so far, so far for a world. Now your fault be that. Me I say, now your fault be that. Ah. So far, so far. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, we are, this has been um, seen at two levels. We have people who join by YouTube. So the number is usually higher than those who join us by Zoom. My job is to introduce the chair uh, because this panel dovetails into lunch, you may actually speak for as long as you want, uh, if that is your intention, because we set aside if a break period from one to two, uh, and break is very uh, difficult to organize in a virtual conference. Um, We've been running on time. All the panels have been well attended. Uh, there are 48 of you here in a normal conference. You are not going to get 48 people to listen to you. It's my pleasure to introduce another Boston guy. <laughs> the keynote is about Boston. Professor Godino took his PhD from Boston. Um, like Nimi, he's also granted in um, uh, in ethnography, drawing ideas from his own people. And he just released this book on the Yoruba. And we are also uh, doing a special edition of the Journal of Yoruba Studies uh, on the book, uh, which we are, we've announced it, but we'll do more announcements. Uh, we, Benson, please, can you change your seat so that can you sit higher? Because we only see your head. But if you can't help it, don't worry about it. Uh -huh. So we have um, Benson joining us from Adekunla Jassi. I think you are presenting two papers, right? Answer from Oslo. Thank you. Uh, George from Legon, is he here? Creighton from Virginia, Makosabe from University of North Carolina at Asheville. So the two of you are from Carolina here. But the chair is also from Carolina. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I'm Professor Bimbola Adelaku. Let me hand over to our distinguished chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Falola, for organizing this uh, conference. Uh, as he said, my name is Akin Ugundono. I'm based here in North Carolina, University of uh, North Carolina, Charlotte. I have the distinct uh, honor to serve as the chair of this uh, fourth panel, titled Understanding the Religious Africa. Well, uh, Professor, I told the, the panelists that they will have 10 minutes to make their case uh, so that we'll have five minutes for all members of the audience to share ideas, have ask questions and make comments. But uh, based on this uh, change now, so panelists, uh, feel free to speak longer than 10 minutes, but uh, be aware that uh, we have uh, six panelists, so uh, don't monopolize the time. Not more than 15 minutes, okay, please. Well, uh, we have distinguished uh, colleagues here this uh, afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon my time. Uh, good morning to Austin. <laughs> so I'm gonna, uh, when I call on the panelists, 
I will introduce them in turn. Our first uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Benson Igboi and Dr. Abimbola Adelakun. They will be speaking on karma, accountability, and governance in the Nigerian Pentecostal Church. Dr. Igboi is the head of the department, religion and African culture at Adekunle Ajaxin University. His areas of interest cover philosophy of religion, African cultural studies, and African Pentecostalism. And Dr. Adelakun is an assistant professor in the African, African Diaspora Department, the University of Texas at Austin. Her research interests span the areas of theater and performance, Pentecostalism and Pentecostal culture, indigenous African religions, religious creativity, Yoruba studies, and Black popular culture. Now, take it over. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Adelakun. Okay. okay, yeah, sorry. Um, this is still taking some getting used to. Um, first, I must thank the convener of the conference, Dr. Falola. This has really been an enlightening experience. And um, thanks to the chair of the panel, Dr. Gundiro. It's good to see you again. And um, most especially, thanks to Professor Wariboko for bringing us together with your uh, prodigious prodigious intellect. Um, I, like I've told you several times, one of the books that changed my life forever is Nigerian Pentecostalism. I discovered the book in 2015 and it, it changed the direction of my dissertation, my work, and it has been a very enlightening experience and um, still my favorite of your books. And that's part of what we're engaging today. Thank you. And so we are presenting as a team and what we are presenting today represents some of our, my discussions with um, my colleague, Professor Igboin in, um, from Adekunle Ajasi University. So we'll be talking about Kama and um, it's a lot that Nigeria, it's company and allied matters act that Nigeria, um, it's a bill that Nigerian government president signed into law in August. And it's been a very controversial bill. And so we're using this medium to discuss some of our own um, understanding of why it was very controversial and how we can offer the way forward using Dr. Wariboko's scholarship on Pentecostalism. So um, first the, in, okay, yeah. In 2000, in August, during the service at Living Faith Church, and anybody that knows the Living Church, Faith Church in Ota knows that it's one of the biggest congregation in Africa. And it's a 50,000 plus church. And then the Bishop, David Oedepo, started talking about the law, Comedian and Allied Matters Act, um, Kama. Um, the, it was a law that the government put together and was lobbied for by business people to facilitate ease of doing business in Nigeria. Um, it's about 606 page document, but nobody that I know has read it. Everybody filtered it through what their pastors said about the law. And uh, it includes provisions like uh, companies, um, like you can file, they can share, they can transfer minutes of their meetings electronically. Um, companies with single shareholders can now be exempted from the appointment uh, requirements to appoint auditors and uh, provisions to rescue companies that become insolvent. Those are part of the content of the law. And so a lot of business people praised it because they thought it would facilitate um, how they do businesses, all right? And Nigerian business environment can keep pace with their counterpart elsewhere. But among Pentecostal circles, it was a totally different reaction. After Bishop Boyedepo spoke about it, people started saying, oh, this is a satanic law, it's tyrannical, it's anti-church, it's, 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 it's anti-Christ. And then there was so much controversies from the church side. And at the same time, you find people on social media saying that, yes, the law of karma, the law itself, they started saying this law of karma that has caught up with pastors, right? All these years they've been eating money, but now they are going to be very accountable. And then it, it adds, um, you know, and there was this much controversy. And um, some of the things we are going to be doing today is to walk through this law with uh, Dr. Wariboko because it can be very, it, it felt very disheartening for some of us that follow his works and, you know, Pentecostal studies to find that some of these debates as they were going on, people were talking across each other and nobody was making the attempt to engage Pentecostal scholars and try to understand. So what we want to do is to look into his work in Nigerian Pentecostal to try to understand some of the basis of the controversy. 
So um, first, let me cite what exactly Bishop Boedipo said. He said, you know, the church works on the pattern delivered by God, not the pattern of man. The government has no power to appoint people over churches. This is a secular nation. The church is the greatest asset of God in this country. Please be warned. Judgment is coming. The losses have been still, but now I will arise. Anybody that is in this deal is taking poison. This will never work. I am waiting for a day when anybody will appoint a trustee over this church. You can't gag anybody. We own this country together. It's only in Africa that people who are over 80 years still run around to become president. I know that it's in the prosperity of the church that is making them jealous, but I'm going to live to see an army of many winners soar together. In this church shall emerge one of the greatest, largest con concentrations of giants on earth. And so we look at it like, um, so why, how come the a law that is supposed to facilitate accountability became a matter of persecution in churches? And so here we are looking at um, uh, Nigerian Pentecostalism, specifically the last chapter where Dr. Wariboko talks about the logic of invisibility. So in the last chapter, after he had written about the spell of the invisible in Nigerian Pentecostalism, he answered the question of how Nigerian Pentecostal and Nigeria itself, Nigerian Pentecostalism and Nigeria, they, how they reflect one another, each other. And so it says that Nigerian Pentecostalism reflects Nigeria and Nigeria also reflects its Pentecostalism, that both of them operate jointly within a common imaginary and politics that defines one also defines the other. So the argument makes like the things that Bishop Wedepo was saying that the church is secular, the separation of church and state is not perhaps not even the basis of the issue here, but the logic of invisibility. And so the, the argument about the logic of invisibility is that the power of things that are not seen or operate and control the things that can be seen. So in this presentation, we follow the concept of the logic of invisibility as a source of power and control in the social sphere that Nigerian Pentecostalism operates. The things that are not seen drive the things that are seen, and the sovereign is the one who can manipulate the invisible things to make the visible things manifest. And so first we'll talk a little bit about karma so that those are not familiar will get an idea of what, what, what is at stake when, pe when people rejected our law. And then we argue that and uh, we show how why it was resisted specifically by Pentecostal churches because it, of its agenda of transparency. Um, people were asking questions. So why is the Pentecostal churches that are talking? One of the Catholics, one of the Anglicans. And so some of those things we think that if they had read um, Nigerian Pentecostalism, they would have a better clarity on why it was the Pentecostal churches that were putting up a resistance, right? Because in a culture where the logic of invisibility reigns, asking people to be transparent in their dealings is, is a threat because it's, it exposes them to an outsider gaze that can be very denuding. And so um, it, it's understandable why Pentecostalism specifically are the ones that were pushing against the law. I would say, yes, it is about accountability, but even no doubt, but even much more, there is a mutual reflection of Nigerian society of, and Pentecostalism. And that's perhaps part of the visceral reactions that you see. There's something about the common imaginary both of them share that makes the exposition or the call for transparency make the, uh, makes um, um, repel the Pentecostal leaders that were very, very particular about pushing back against these laws. And um, so we will say it's quite logical for Pentecostal churches to refuse to be transparent in their dealings. And I would believe that an understanding of their rationale will clarify the issues at stake. And then we can look at a way forward on going forward on how Nigerian society can balance between um, God and Caesar. So at this point, I will push it to Dr. Egoin, who will talk about karma and then talk about the issues of accountability. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Abimbola. Yeah, the, in addition to what uh, Abimbola has uh, uh, spoken about, out of the 606 page uh, document, having several chapters and several uh, sections, only one section has generated these controversies. That has to do with section 832, which states that the law empowers the uh, uh, Corporate Affairs Commission to appoint 
an interim manager? Should there be a petition from the trustees or should there be an allegation from the corporate affairs commission itself that there are, there are infringements on how churches are run? And so the law also states that that suspension and the appointment of an interim manager would be as a result of court order. But in the Yedi Post um, proclamation of it, he omitted an important aspect of that section, which states that no suspension can take place, no appointment of interim manager can take place without court order. And so that generated a lot of argument. But in a country that you do not trust the government and the, 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 the followers as well, where laws and courts can be manipulated, we feel that it is understandable that raising such an argument that without recourse to law, without recourse to the court, that the government could do what they want to do makes some sense. For example, there are arguments in legal circles that there are indeed no civil societies in Nigeria. And that has, to, uh, has a reference, for example, to the suspension and eventual removal of the immediate past um, uh, Chief Justice of the Federation, Walter Onoge, as a result of political manipulation, which some people have argued that his removal was not due to legal procedures. And even when it was challenged in the court, the court said that the plaintiff had no local standard because there were no um, uh, charities, there were no NGOs in Nigeria. And so part F of this uh, uh, Common Act 2019 is then raising the issue. If in 2019, the same government argued that there were no NGOs, there were no charities as, uh, in the country, why therefore is the basis what therefore is the basis for this law that does not recognize charities and NGOs in the country? There is another conspiracy theory that has to do with karma. And that is during the lockdown, it was, it was raised that some churches donated money to state and federal governments, some to the tune of 20 million, some 50 million naira. And so the government felt that so much money is in the church and there is the, 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 the need to know how the churches raise this money, especially the Pentecostal churches, and how they administer this money without re uh, recourse to financial regulations. And so it is as if paying the church or uh, the churches back with evil. And that is why the common law was, you know, defined as evil, as tyrannical, as paying back the good that the church had done. And the other conspiracy uh, theory that followed has to do with the fact that the Islamic uh, congregations, that since the inception of uh, the independence of the country in 1960 to date, there are no investments that could directly be linked with mosque. So since mosques get money, share their money and do not invest their money in the economy, as the Pentecostal churches are doing with reference to establishment of universities and other economic activities, that this law, therefore, is targeted at the Pentecostal churches to weaken them economically, to weaken their financial basis, so that, as you know, the conspiracy theory goes, because we have a Muslim president he is out against the, 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 uh, the Christians, the Pentecostal churches at all. So that also shows the debate between churches and mosques and uh, the Pentecostal churches versus other churches. Now, the structure of uh, Catholic, the, uh, the Anglican, the Methodist uh, churches and so on, the mainline churches is different from the Pentecostal churches. Because the Pentecostal churches are seen as one man or a family 
church most of the time. And so the, uh, the, the, the structure ends at the founder or the general overseer, general superintendent, as the case may be. Whereas in the, uh, um, the other churches, the mainline churches, it is not so. The bishop of the diocese cannot entirely lay claims to the property, to the affairs of the church as in Anglican or a Catholic church. And so for the other mainline churches, their response to common law uh, as passed by the government is that, well, if they are asking for uncountability, if they are asking for governance in the church, it does not affect them directly. It is those churches that generate money and use such money. And so the question now is, to whom are Pentecostal churches accountable? Is it to the members who largely contribute this money? Or is it the founders of this money uh, of these churches? Or are we talking in terms of God, whom they claim that appointed them overseers of these churches? So there is a complex web of uh, uh, discourse concerning accountability in Pentecostal churches. Who are they accountable to? Now, are they going to be accountable to government? which many of them seem not to be ready to abide with. And that is why there, are, there, there is a lobbying going on in the National Assembly to see that this act, especially this section, is amended or uh, evoked you know, completely. And so the members of the Pentecostal churches are not actually asking for uh, um, accountability. The founders and managers of these churches, Pentecostal churches, are also not really ready to be accountable to the members of the churches in many instances. And now these leaders are also not ready to be accountable to, uh, to the government. And so they see accountability as relating between them and God, who they argue ultimately would decide whether or not they run, uh, run the church while here on earth uh, in accordance with the, the Christian principles of accountability. So this raises a question of who and who is accountable, who and who is being accountable to. And so these arguments are part of those things that we will want to investigate as we look at this uh, common law uh, in Nigeria. Thank you, Dr. Um, yeah. Boeing. So in Conclusion, like we have to wrap up now because of time. We know that the question at the base of the complaints and the issues about accountability is the question of um, the, who should, our churches should, um, why churches should be made to operate at the level of visibility that even the state itself is not capable of demonstrating. Now for so long, the logic of invisibility, the ability to hide the things that you're doing and not give an account of your activities has defined sovereignty in Nigeria. And so when the government came up with the idea that will make Pentecostal churches operate with a greater clarity into their activities, what this protester heard and saw coming is a strategy to enfeeble them, to take away that part of their sovereignty. And so the idea of power and strength in Nigeria has been constructed on the notion of opacity and mystification, the ability to redact processes and pretend phenomena appear through a slate of hand. And so for so long, churches have been able to claim material wealth and numbers that they probably do not have, but which they regularly manipulate to make things seem much more than they are presently. And also this is the, another reason that these churches, the question they say is that they operate abroad within a milieu of transparency, that churches in uh, diaspora, Nigerian churches in diaspora regularly give their accounts to government. So why not, why can't they do the same thing in Nigeria? But again, it also has to do with the specificity of the environment that Nigeria is where to show your um, processes or to be transparent, like asking a magician to reveal his slate of hand. And so we say that for the churches that protested, the underlying fear is the weakening and denigration that could come from opening yourself up to a government that refuses to open up its own operation. And the question of accountability is one aspect, but overall is the logic of invisibility, to be the one that commands the rituals and processes of hiding things and manipulating them in your favor. We'll stop there because of time. Thank you very much, everyone.
Okay. Um, the organizers did not unmute me before. So now I'm back, right? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, our, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Igbohi and uh, Dr. Adelakun. Now we the the floor is open uh, or Zoom is open for Q and A uh, uh, comments about these concepts of uh, the logic of invisibility and the logic of accountability in a, in an open society. How do we reconcile the church that operates in a, under a different a rule or spiritual rule? Uh, and, 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 and how do you reconcile that with, with uh, uh, a democratic open society? So um, as a chair, I'm not going to take over the floor in making the remarks. I would rather let the uh, members of the audience uh, share their perspectives and questions. So I'm looking here to see whether we have any reaction, any, any something in the chat. Um, Am I getting any question here? Not yet. Any question? Any comments? Well, do you have your hand? Let me just scroll around here. Uh, Well, uh, I, I'm having a question here from uh, Dr. Adela Kunsenda. Should we let the other presentation run first? Is that is that is that uh, is that something that we should do? Okay, we should go ahead, everybody. Okay, in that case, let us go ahead with the other presentations. Now, now the second presenter is also Dr. Igboi, and uh, he will be talking on. Uh, Beliefs and veneration of ancestors in contemporary Africa. It doesn't need uh, any other uh, introduction, <laughs> okay? Just for the sake of those who are just joining us, he is based at uh, Adekunle Ajasi University. Okay, Dr. Boeing, so yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, the topic is uh, belief and veneration of ancestors in contemporary Africa. And uh, we're trying to define ancestral as generally understood by Umbiti as the living dead. That those who have left this world, those who have died, but their memory is still being remembered by their immediate family. And so they are still living in the mind and in the community that they have left behind. And that there are rituals, there are rituals that are carried out to lubricate that relationship that exists between them and the living family which they have left behind. And so to become an ancestor, there are qualifications that have been outlined from community to community across Africa. And so we're trying to put all of these uh, criteria together to examine them from the pre-missionary, pre-colonial era to post-colonial Africa to see whether these criteria, these qualifications to become an ancestor, whether they are still valid today given the reality we have in Africa. That's the trust of this discussion. And so we see some of the characteristics of ancestors to include first and foremost that they are part and parcel of the community. They are invisible members of the family they left behind, invisible members of the community they just left behind. And so the community the, and the invisible world interact and so it is a part of the spirituality of African indigenous uh, religion that ancestors are not just dead people, they are alive, they connect, they interact, they lead, they punish as well as bless, depending on how 
they are handled. And depending on how the morality of the community or the family is addressed by the people. But now let me quickly uh, state that to become an ancestor, what does it become? Uh, what does it entail? One, it is argued that to become an ancestor, one would have died after living a very good life. Living a good life is underlined because what is good life to the Africans before the missionary, before the pre, uh, before the pre-colonial era, and what is good life today in contemporary Africa? Two, that someone would have uh, you know died as an old person. Today, what is the lifespan of an Africa, given the rate of poverty, the conflict that we have here and there? And even the kind of death, there is good death, there is bad death. What constituted good death in the pre-missionary, pre-colonial Africa? And what constitutes good death today? For example, if somebody died by accident, as some communities have argued before now, that was a bad day, and the person was not entitled to barrier. And so if one was not entitled to barrier, it therefore meant that that person was not qualified to become an ancestor. But today, people die of accidents and they are buried. And so how do we look at the past and the present? Again, we look at barrier itself. Before now, people talked about proper barrier, where the ritual procedures are followed to the letter. And if there are occasions where the procedures are not even properly followed in proper barrier uh, rudiments, you know, other rituals had to be done so that the soul of the departed would join the communion or the realm of the ancestors. But the emphasis today is on defeating barrier, the social aspect of barrier, rather than the proper rituals that are, you know, that had been laid down in pre-colonial Africa. I cite an example. We see today that people say they are Christians, they are Muslims, and they are also Africans. There are Africans in the first instance, and there are you know, controversies whether such people should be buried according to Christian right or according to uh, uh, traditional indigenous uh, religious rights. And in order to you know, settle any of such uh, uh, conflicts, both are joined together. There is a combination sort of that the Christians will be doing their work outside the traditionalists would be doing their inside with the cops. I just cited an example. In my place, by 3 a.m., for a person to become an ancestor, for a dead person to become an ancestor, there must be feeding of that corpse by 3 a.m. And if they miss it at that point, that person will not become an ancestor unless other rituals are done. And so why we see in this uh, time, uh, what we see in this time is that the Christians will be having their wake up outside secretly, secretly. The children would still have to perform this right by 3 a.m. to ensure that they are, uh, they are, you know, late one, their dead person becomes an ancestor while thinking that the person has gone to heaven, the Christian heaven at the same time. And so, how do we then place that vis-a-vis -vis the pre-colonial and post-colonial realities that we have to face in becoming an ancestor? And so we, we look at all of these things. That the good life that I mentioned is important here because I just make, some, uh, make mention of certain names right there. Even the, the, the professor we are celebrating today, uh, uh, Nimi, it, would he become an ancestor? Your name is there in, in, in my paper. Would he become an ancestor? 
Well, from our own Africa, how do we answer such, who becomes an ancestor today? And uh, how do we set the conditions of becoming an ancestor? He's a pastor, he's an Af African. He has written so much about all of this, but would he become an ancestor? a Christian ancestor, a traditional ancestor, and that leads us uh, leads me to the next uh, point on becoming an ancestor. There is this argument, especially by the Catholic, Jesus as the proto-ancestor. The concept of proto-ancestor means that all African ancestors who believed in Christ belong to Christ. But that raises again the question of my grandfather Iboy, who never knew anything about Christ, probably, and he died, and he was given proper burial, I was told. So what happens to him? The argument is that if he had ever had the gospel, if he had ever listened to the gospel, and he believed, even if implicitly, he would make heaven. But that is not the kind of heaven the African indigenous religion wants. It is reincarnation. While he remains in the world of the ancestor, he can also reincarnate in the children, in the family. And so there is a continuum that is being sought, that is being maintained within the African religious uh, the, uh, thinking of an ancestor. And so the questions finally are these. With the way things are in Africa, in Nigeria, who becomes an ancestor? How do we raise the criteria for such people to become an ancestor? It's a question I have not answered. It's a question I'm pushing back to every one of us to think because, yes, because right now, it seems to be that giving somebody the fitting barrier Giving somebody all of the person who makes who becomes worthy, nobody thinks about how he or she becomes worthy, is venerated even while alive, is giving chief dancy title, even when we know obviously that the means of that word is questionable. Since this was not the case before, do we still say that, well, this person could become an ancestor? A nine-year-old you know, boy died, about, about four new national newspapers announced the death of this boy. Even the parents placed an advert, the parents who were supposed to be mourning placed an advert, a food page in a newspaper. Whereas before now, such a corpse would have been thrown into the evil forest. And this child was taken to a church Nine-year-old boy was taken to church for funeral rites. And so all of these are raising questions in my mind, whether we will still have ancestors, real ancestors in contemporary Africa. And if we do, what criteria will make such persons become ancestors? Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Igwe. Um, another very provocative presentation. Well, um, I'm going to break this rule of listening to all the presentations because I think um, we should take some of these ideas. Uh, some people are already lining up questions, and I'm sure there will be more questions. So let's take this first two for the next 10 minutes have discussions and then move to the next uh, set of papers. That way I can, I can easily manage <laughs> the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the scroll of uh, questions that are coming in. So um, I have a question here, actually, and a draw. Long yes. hand, hands that were raised long time ago um, by David Oskran and uh, uh, Adesaya, their hands have been up after the first presentation. I, I, I don't know if you can see them. Uh, I cannot see the hand. I cannot see the hand, but I can see the chat. Um, so if you have any question, please just let me know in the chat that you have a question. Unfortunately, yeah. I, cannot see, I cannot see the hand. So Adesaya, 
Hey, Luis. Yeah, sure. please go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm David, David Styles Okran, um, uh, speaking from Norway. Um, um, the, to my, my question, first question goes to the first presenter. Um, and um, I, I, I like the paper and um, all the presenters. Yes, I like the paper they, they presented on the issues that they raise regarding accountability um, of Pentecostal churches. Um, I can associate with it um, as a Ghanaian. Um, I know what is going on in Nigeria is not that much uh, different from what is going on in Ghana. Um, we, we are all um, sharing almost uh, some uh, same um, um, event. Um, but my question has to do with what kind of accountability um, um, are we talking about here? Is it the case that um, the state want a report? And if that is the case, do, does, do the church do, uh, ha um, have to register? And if the church have to register, what I know in our, our, our part of the world in Ghana is that um, there is this um, internal revenue report that churches are supposed to file, even though we, it, it has not been strict. Um, um, I don't know why, but then every year, every church is supposed to file your um, statement of account um, to, to the internal revenue. Um, other part of the world, well, there are benefits that the states the church even gets for filing and even members get for filing their reports. You know, government gives back to members in the, in the form of tax re returns. Um, and so I believe that there are issues that must be raised. If the government would want the church to be accountable, to file, to tell the whole world or the nation um, or the people where they get the money from, how they got the money, who contributed, um, then the state also has a responsibility. If you compare it to the West, where there is also some form of um, percentages that are given to members who are given to the church for charity purposes. I stand to be corrected, but I work with other, uh, I'm a pastor myself, I work with, um, um, churches, um, some church in, in, in the United States, um, and I, I've done that. But in our state, what kind of accountability in our kind, what that kind of accountability are we talking about? And if the karma, the, the karma they are talking about, is the government also ready to give back? You know, that is my question. What kind of accountability? Do the church file the report, and then do the workers also in terms of paying tax? I think the issue of church, um, church also become accountable by workers being taxed. My second question goes to the second presenter. Why does ATL cherish the concept of um, ancestorship? I think um, his issue of whether there are ancestors, ancestors today and how do they become ancestors, I would want to engage the question or retro, um, ask the question um, for him to think about why is, is um, the traditional um, the believers or leaders or our forefathers decided to look at qualifications of ancestorship, the benefits? I think that that should be looked at um, than um, other aspects. But if we understand why becoming ancestor, then good life is not like anybody, but then issue of good life Living well, integrity, accountability, everything must be looked at. That, that is my, my question. Why? The, the, what, what is this real contention here? Because this is an old standing thing. What is the significance of he understanding whether and ancestors exist? Or, and, and, and how do they become ancestors? Why is he interested in that? I think we should come out clear with that. The Thank you. Part. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lacun. 
Oh, okay, so, thank you. Um, so the thanks to the um, to David Stalokran, um, the accountability is primarily financial accountability. In other words, you should open your books for close scrutiny. Not that they don't do it already. Already, right now, churches register to start. You have all of those processes. But like I said, the Kama Law has like 100, it's a 606 page document. And it's just one aspect that caused all these controversies. So if they look through your books, this is the summary of it. And then they find some um, financial imprudence, evidence of it. They can disband your church and impose a, a board of trustees. And some of the issues were like, first of all, how do you trust that this government will not use it deliberately to cripple the church? You are dealing with a government that has proven itself very corrupt and nepotistic. So like one pastor said, what if they appoint a Muslim? to be a trust in the church? How do you pollute the church? Like some of these arguments might look as if um, they are, they are um, the pastors are raising these issues because they don't want to be accountable, which is part of the things people were saying that they are just, um, because they have, they, they have nothing to hide. But of course, it also speaks to the lack of trust between government and the people, right? Nigerian government has proven itself. They've, the way they've dealt with people over and over again, people don't trust them. Like, like, like now churches criticize government a lot. What if they want to come after you? They open your books. They say they found something. They found something, and then they destroy your church by bringing in a board of trustees of people that are not Christian. How do you impose non-Christians? What if they impose non-Christians on the church? What's going to happen to the spirit of Christ, the body of Christ? Like, so it's a question of first, like defining, they want to define autonomy, but at the same time, you're also within a context where you, you, are, you are dealing with a government that is not very clear in its approach to issues. There's one of the pastors, I've been trying to recall his name, I think he's a primate or Bishop Ayodele that said he has spent so much money investing in his church. Like when it was nothing, he used his own money to build his church. And then one government will send somebody from Abuja and then they will change all of that. And it's not possible. They are autonomous. They consider themselves a body of Christ and they want to separate themselves. So it's about the larger Nigerian social issues um, and the social political issues as well. Like you cannot, you are dealing with a government that it's clouded in so much mystification, but they are asking yourself to open yourself up to government scrutiny. And that's part of the things they were pushing back against. As for the questions of whether churches pay tax or not, as far as I know, Nigerian churches don't pay tax, but they also argue that they do a lot of welfare projects. They build roads. They, uh, some of them will tell you that they build schools, they renovate schools, they carry out all of those projects that the government will not carry out. So if they are pick, uh, picking up the slack where the government fails, why should you also want to um, interfere in the way they conduct their affairs? So those are all the issues. That, those are part of the larger issues. It's um, it's primarily a question of financial accountability, but it goes much more. It is a, the ability to obfuscate, right? Like to be able to hide and to be able to keep your, to use the cliche, to keep your card close to your chest as the measure of how you define your sovereignty. Uh, Dr. Egoini, do you want to say? Dr. Egoini, do you want to say something, Dad? I think it's frozen. <laughs> okay, let, let me move on to the next uh, question then. Uh, please keep your question to be very brief, please, so that we can go through this quickly. Um, All right. Uh, Dr. Adesanya has a question. Dr. Adesanya. Okay. Are you still here? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm still here. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, a number of the things I wanted to pose has already been addressed by um, Adela Akun, but I, I'm, I'm still going to raise uh, one issue. There are so many um, complex issues uh, concerning uh, the Kama law, but you know, certain things that are so apparent is uh, the uh, grievances of the public against the church. There are grievances about the Christian autocrats, uh, Christian oligarchy, you know, who uh, sort of um, uh, administer and manage funds that are not uh, under any scrutiny whatsoever. That's one key issue. So that the, the public um, distrust uh, must be addressed, you know, when people are even raising issues against, you know, Kama law. 
But my question to uh, Adela Kwani Boy, uh, the, the scholars you know, doing this work is, uh, are you looking into the perspectives of the legal luminaries on this subject matter? Because each section, whether the Christian churches or even government, they have legal representatives. Have they clearly addressed, you know, uh, they've gone through, you know, the fine lines to see, okay, what are the gray areas? Even if you're going to have a debate, even if you are going to have some revision, what are the key issues that we must take to the drawing board? And have you taken a look at that in order to be able to answer some, you know, questions that are already arising and questions that will come up again? So it's not just, you know, what people are responding to right now, but what they would, you know, raise, you know, in the near future, it's not going to go away. So they, they really have to key into, okay, what are the perspectives of the lawyers, you know, you know, those uh, even legal scholars, you know, concerned, you know, with religious, you know, uh, issues, they must speak to them and actually prepare themselves, you know, for a rethink of, of the law. If definitely there would be a need to have a rethink. So if there's going to be that, then, you know, they, they must uh, put those people on board. And um, the Christian Association must also be aware that they operate within, you know, uh, a state, a state structure. They are not, you know, isolated, you know, entities. No matter, you know, how much they preach that, oh yeah, they start, like you were citing an example of somebody who said, you know, he started this church, you know, on his own with his money, but you have, you know, uh, collected other people's money along the line. And you, you know, blows them into a very, you know, big institution, an institution that exists within the Nigerian state. You are bound by this, you know, uh, laws of the state. So they cannot uh, simply say, okay, we're not going to submit, you know, to, to the rules of the state. You have to negotiate. And they also have to be reminded, you know, of um, the scripture, Mark, Mark 12, 17, that says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Even Christ, you know, charged them to pay taxes. And it's not just, you know, tax, you know, to government per building or per certain units of their structure, but tax in generality. So if they are taking okay. tithes from yeah. people, they should also be able to pay, you know, whatever is due to the government. You know, and um, they have valid... Thank you, the yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, let, let me uh, um, read a question from Dr. Unjoku. How does the logic of accountability figure in the problem of pastors using false prophecies to screw up the poor and the needy? Uh, keep that question. And then, uh, and then Dr. Droll also has a question. Uh, please, uh, go ahead, Dr. Droll. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. She said, mine is just a parallel. Oh, here I am. I'm sorry, doctor. I was having okay. difficulty. Thank okay. you. I just okay. wanted to make a comment. Okay. Go uh, ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. Very brief. Yes. About the parallel in the United States with the situation of the socio -clim uh, political climate here in the U.S. with the lack of trust in the government at this time of the COVID situation, COVID-19, where we have some Pentecostal churches and some that are not uh, technically self-identifying as Pentecostal, who are engaging in thoughts about conspiracy theories and opening their churches against the governor's orders. And so therefore we have some similar dynamics uh, and sometimes the, uh, we think about the question of, is this a clash between science and Christian faith? So just some of the, of the dynamics I see in Kama that are reflected here in, in my own climate. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Igwe and Dr. Adelako, keep those questions. Let me move on to the next uh, presenter so that they can have their presentation and then later we can take all the questions together. So uh, the next presenter is Ms. Anita Hansa. Uh, she was speaking on African traditional religion as the inheritance of African Pentecostalism and the split within grace for African Pentecostalism. Ms. Hansa is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Theology 
University of Oslo. She is a feminist theologian and she embraces emphasis on African feminist theology in her research. Ms. Ansa. Please, please unmute yourself. Anna, please, can you unmute Anna? Anna Abansa, she wants to talk. Can you talk now, please? Yeah, she Anza, is a she's herself. a panelist. Yeah. She can talk. Yeah. She she's unmuted. She may be uh, maybe she's having microphone issues. Hold on, Anita. Can she? Can you talk now, please? Please, can you say something? She can. We can hear her. Obina. Yeah, she she's not. Maybe, she seems to be frozen. She's not moving. So, is it okay? Can you say something, Miss Ansa? Hello, hello. Oh yeah. Hear you. Good. Hello. Good. It's an honor to be part of this conference and to advance the discussions and engagement on the scholarship of Dr. Nimwai Boko. The title of my presentation is African Traditional Religion as the Inheritance of African Pentecostalism and the Split Within Grace as well as a split within the absolute for African Pentecostalism. I'd like to share my screen. This presentation examines and engages some key notions in the Pentecostal theology of Nimi Waragoku. These are African traditional religion as the inheritance of African Pentecostalism the split within grace and the split in the absolute by deploying notions from African feminist theology and a notion of human flourishing. For Wariboko, the air that African Pentecostalism breeds is African traditional religion. This is because it is a religion in all its diverse forms and presentations that exist and still exist in Africa. This was before Christianity and it's now ubiquitous Pentecostalism for Africans on the continent and in the diaspora. This implies that historically, ATR has had implications for African Pentecostalism and continues to do so. One of the ways that ATR acting as the ecosystem of sorts upon which African Pentecostalism has found its niche is by asserting inadvertently elements of the recent for Joel B. Kaling, a rich belief in the spirit realm as having implications for daily events of life is part of the African worldview. These are important elements of ATR that spill into and informs African worldview. This element is also shared by the Pentecostal ethos. This can also be referred to as the fissuring of phenomenal reality in the experience of the African Pentecostal. Therefore, such beliefs find affirmation in Pentecostal, in African Pentecostalism. For so Iboko, this is evident in Pentecostal experiences by their epistemological quest, which for African Pentecostal forms part of their spiritual discernment and is indicative of what it means to live life in the spirit. For that matter, believe in malevolent forces such as witches, for instance, as causes of ill fate in African Pentecostalism spaces upon the ecosystem of ATR is endemic. The patriarchal nature of some Pentecostal spaces in Ghana and similar locations in Africa, for instance, ensure are leveled more often than not against women than men. Through an African feminist lens, I examine a few specific instances of spiritual discernment in Waribuko's rendering and flourishing for women in African Pentecostal spaces in the light of African Pentecostalism and its inheritance of ATR. So as far as the fact that ATR is the inheritance of African Pentecostalism, it breeds the belief process, for instance, as causes for ill, Ill fit. And there was a case in Ghana this year in July, whereby 
an old man, a 90 year old man was beaten to death in the Savannah region of Ghana as a result of accusations by a fetish priestess that she was a witch. So this is an eight year example and it's very current in Ghana at the moment. At the same time, in a personal correspondence in 2018, I find a, mirror, a mirroring of this kind of occurrence because an individual attended a Pentecostal meeting and received a prophecy that her mother is the witch and is responsible for her difficulties and failures in her business ventures. So more often than not, it is women who suffer the brunt of, of this fissuring of phenomenal reality as far as they believe in malevolent forces such as witchcraft are concerned. But uh, there's a, there are also instances when men are also accused of witchcraft, as in the case of the virtual church experience, where in a new Pentecostal church, a spiritual leader gave a prophecy about an individual whose brother was supposed to be practicing which was responsible for his own health. So flourishing and human flourishing is eudaimonia in the Aristotelian sense. Eudaimonia or flourishing is not just part of the notion of salvation for here and now, but also together with a good life in a common good together with a good life and common good. African feminist theology as a lens focuses on the efforts at repairing the imbalance of tradition and culture through the critique of it via the lens and the voices of African women. Muzimbi Kanyaru asserts that women are condemned and relegated to Christianity with Pentecostalism being no exception, founded on women's differentiated physiology sexuality and reproduction lead to left for reasons why they are not regarded in the same light of quality as men. Therefore, due to ATR as the inheritance of African Pentecostalism, women are wrongfully accused of practicing witchcraft more than men are due to the fission of phenomenal reality for African Pentecostals. Human flourishing Human flourishing prescribes that all humans, including women, experience a good life and a common good. Another salient notion for a group is the idea that African Pentecostals often experience a split within grace, more acutely than other Christians do. This is due to the violent ways in which the African Pentecostal detaches from previous symbolic links connections to the natural environment and the tradition for the light of the Holy Spirit. For Rick Van Dyke, Pentecostalism demonizes ATR or African traditional religion. This in my view facilitates the detachment and the disruption by African Pentecostals from their previous symbolic links and tradition. By deploying Waribogo's notion of flourish, and I engage the occurrence of the split within Greece, and that renders the African Pentecostal identity violently disrupted in the quest for the born again experience, and how some Pentecostal spaces in Ghana seek to ameliorate the split within their spaces by restructuring elements of life stage rituals, such as naming ceremonies. Flourishing is aimed at bringing forth happiness, among other gains. If happiness is to be realized in a newly found faith of Pentecostalism, then there should be a balance. For a false balance does not validate the roots, origins, and identities of the African person. The question then is, does conversion to Pentecostalism truly require a violent detachment or disruption from previous symbolic links and the natural environment of the specific African culture or tradition? The International Central Gospel Church in Ghana, in their naming ceremonies, have made an effort at ameliorating this. So in a Tan culture, during babies' naming ceremonies, the elements of water and alcohol are introduced, whereby these elements are dropped in the mouth of the newborn, and these words are said, so yon sa, yon su, so yon sa, yon sa, which means if this is water, let it be water, and if this is alcohol, let it be alcohol, and by so doing, they are conferring the virtue of honest, honesty on the newborn symbolically, that is their belief. And many African Pentecostals detached from these symbolic links due to the demonization of ATR and African worldview, but in the International Central Gospel Church in Ghana and in all their branches the world over, 
they have introduced or tried to ameliorate this by introducing the elements of water and honey. And they, they emphasize the same symbolic action by striving to confer the virtue of honesty on the newborn. Interestingly, they believe that some Pentecostal spiritual leaders misuse the divine life in among Pentecostals themselves. This is another dimension caused by the occurrence of a split, a split in the absolute. According to Waiboko, the crack, the gap or the split in the absolute renders it possible for divine manifestation, miracle, and the anointing to be manipulated and misappropriated. This leads to excesses of the anointing and this plays out in African Pentecostal spaces. Two cases are first, the paid audience with Daniel Obinim of the new Pentecostal church known as International Gospel Church, which corresponds with the time duration with the spiritual leader, as well as the return to the pulpit of Bio Fato Yimbo of Commonwealth of Zion Assembly, Koza. This caused an outrage in Nigeria and across the continent because it was accused by Miss Busola Dakolo of rape in August 2019. However, the accused spiritual leader returned to the pulpit after only one month of leave of absence while investigations were still underway. These instances are due to excesses of the anointing. So there is this understanding that even among Pentecostals that there is there are excesses and that the anointing is being misappropriated. The anointing is being manipulated. And when you consider the case of the International Gospel Church, there is this practice whereby adherents who come to the ministry to seek prophecy or healing or all the other elements that uh, um, African Pentecostalism promise, promises are expected to pay a fee, depending on the duration of the audience that they will have with the spiritual leader. And I believe that this is an excess of the anointing or the manipulation of the anointing. Additionally, with the Koza case, Bayodin Fatoyimbo could be innocent in the accusations that have been leveled against him. But in this day and age of the Me Too movement, this is another instance of the manipulation of the anointing because of the speed with which he came back to the pulpit and the outrage by the public, that was very evident. Therefore, African traditional religion as the inheritance of Pentecostalism, as well as ATR, as the air that African Pentecostalism reads has implications for the nature of African Pentecostalism. This is seen in how witchcraft accusations are endemic in African Pentecostalism and are often leveled against women than against men, impeding the for women for men. In addition, the split within grace is counteracted in the ICGC instruction of life stage rituals of their naming ceremony practices to ensure a balance that does require a violent detachment of symbolic links and tradition. Finally, the split in the absolute rendered possible by manipulation and erosion of the anointing in the cases that have been discussed underscore the reality of the excesses of the anointing in African Pentecostalism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ansa. Thank you. Um, we now go to our fourth presenter, George Nikwe. Uh, I've not. I've been scrolling around to see whether he's here. I've not seen him. Mr. Nikwe or Dr. Nikwe, are you here? Okay. Well, let's now move on to Kristin uh, Coleman. Kristin Coleman will uh, speak on this title: the role of discernment in the thought of Nimi Wariboko. Mr. Coleman is a PhD candidate at, at the University of Virginia. He is working in the areas of Pentecostal theology and Christian ethics. His 
dissertation is tentatively titled Working with the Spirit, Social Cooperation and the Discernment, and the discernment of Spirits after Pentecost. It's now Dr. Kulman or Mr. Kulman, doctor to, to be soon. <laughs> In faith. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, before I begin with the paper, um, I wanted to thank Professor Falola and the conveners of the conference for their work and uh, a great communication in organizing the conference, um, as well as Professor Warvoko for providing the brilliant scholarship uh, that inspired the conference. I am honored to have the opportunity to participate. Living in the US, I am no longer sure what it means to see. When I talk to some folks, it seems like we are genuinely witnessing different realities. Particularly interesting in this cacophony of perceptions is the way that Christian Pentecostals claim a yet deeper reality behind that which the more common public perceives. Many, believes, many believe they have discerned something more fundamental. God at work, or a pungent evil on the march. One approach to these non-falsifiable, yet often politically dangerous claims has been to shame them from public conversation. Few anymore consider this a viable political or religious solution. The desire to discern is not going away. In fact, the Nigerian Pentecostal ethicist, Nimi Warboko, places this quest to see the noumena behind the phenomena at the center of Pentecostalism. I think Warboko is right, and I use this paper as opportunity to track discernment as a category in his thought and think with him about this fruitful yet fraught way of encountering the world. Now, you may wonder what business a paper like this has on a panel titled Understanding Religious Africa, and that's a fair question. One way to understand what I'm doing is from a particular location, that of a white Pentecostal in the US, seeking to understand and learn from the religious Africa. One of the great values of Warboko's work, from where I stand, is that he makes more accessible and helps to process African religious sources while vigor vigorously arguing for the necessity of including those plural ethical methodologies. I'll begin this paper with a rough description of Warboko's discernment in one way African traditional religions contribute to his understanding. I will then turn to problems facing Pentecostals as we seek to discern. For Warboko, it's a collaboration with capitalism, but I wanna add from my perspective a pervasive epistemological whiteness. Finally, I close with the potential of Warboko's social ethics to begin approaching these problems of Pentecostal discernment. First, the function of discernment. Warboko characterizes Nigerian Pentecostalism as an epistemological quest that is concerned with, quote, accessing the underlying character, the so-called noumenal invisible realm of events circumstances and coincidences in the world, end quote. This spell of the invisible leads some in Nigeria to discern within noumenal signs a final destiny for Nigeria at the vanguard of global evangelization and economic supremacy. Setting aside the substance of these particular claims about Nigeria, the mechanism of discernment is one that Warboko considers in depth at multiple points. The practice assumes a split in reality between noumenal and phenomenal realms, which can never completely be bridged. Despite these cracks, though, discernment seeks to reveal, quote, secrets that hide secrets and drives discerning persons to seek after the ultimate mystery and impenetrable core of reality or creation. These gaps or splits are part of a triadic conception of reality, which takes subject, object, and the relationship between the two as foundations of knowing. Warboko's consideration of discernment is not intended as a universal picture of discernment, but offers a more fine-grained account of how discernment functions among Nigerian Pentecostals. As such, he draws on African traditional religions to illustrate the many background assumptions that go into Nigerian Pentecostal practices. As one example, Warboko points to the Calabari of the Niger Delta region, whose concepts of so undergird processes of discernment. 
uppercase O is akin to a concept of the sacred where individuals are pushed to recognize their own limitations, as this so refers to the sum of possibilities open to them or the infinite possibilities of the sacred. Lowercase so differs in that it refers to the possibilities available to an individual, cultural institution, and social structure. In discerning one's so, one, begin to one can begin to change their trajectories. This process requires a form of discernment that strives for what Warboko calls explanation, prediction, and control. Warboko puts it like this, quote, in explaining, predicting, and controlling events, Calabari people are not just applying specific culture brewed concepts to nature and social systems and, to direct, and directing their thoughts to some regulative telos. They're also applying specific rules or concepts to particular situations, or they are moving from the particular to the universal. Imagination is the muscle that Calabari flex to pierce the phenomenal veil and give narrative structure to events. It is the engine that drives explanation, prediction, and control. To reduce this process of imagination to narrative formation, though, would miss the modes of understanding that Warboko describes. Imagination always occurs with identifying patterns and understanding forms of order in what had seemed chaotic. In doing so, both the imagination and the understanding equip Calabari to see beyond or within the phenomenal realm. Warboko argues that Pentecostals, by and large, have adopted modes of discernment from African traditional religions with the main difference being the gods Pentecostals ident identify as active in their methods of discernment. Here in passing, Warboko makes what is one of my favorite moments or comments in the split god and what I take to be an important intuition for Pentecostal thought. He puts it like this, quote, Pentecostals hold that they focus on or work only with the Holy Spirit and that adherents of the ATR do not. Never mind that this claim presupposes a capacity to distinguish the Holy Spirit who is present and active in the world from other spirits who are, might be, similarly functioning in the world, end quote. While most Pentecostals might not admit it, Warboko sees African traditional religions as making up the backdrop of the Nigerian Pentecostal quest to see. Each discerns for the sake of explanation, prediction, and control with an assumption of an invisible realm always lurking behind the phenomenal veil. Now this short description does not give justice to the nuanced theorizing Waraboka devotes to Pentecostal discernment. Discernment for Pentecostals generally is a way of seeing and following a God who is active in the world. But Waraboka is rightly concerned with the extent to which the global Pentecostal movement is shaped, shaped by and collaborating with the forces of global capitalism. A particular concern is uh, that Pentecostalism's attitude to the sacred and the miraculous produces subjects whose mantra in life is, I can do it. And that this mantra puts Pentecostalism in league with the expansion of global capitalism. In the face of suffering and everyday life, I can do it mentalities energized by the potential of miracles coming from an external God and an inward potential only furthers the productive and consumptive mentalities of capitalism. The appropriate response of doing nothing in the face of capitalism is one that Pentecostals struggle to imagine. This is a problem for Pentecostal understandings of miracles and the sacred, yes, but it seems impossible to disconnect that problem from Pentecostal discernment. The types of things we see and the types of order we bring to chaotic events is inevitably and problematically shaped by logics of production and I can do it. Warboko is spot on with the relationship between Pentecostalism and late capitalism, where Pentecostal subjects are formed as participants in the expansion of capitalist consumption. I take this insight as helpful in understanding one possible way Pentecostal perceptions can be tainted prior to ever discerning, but I also take it as an invitation to consider the manifold ways that Pentecostals might be formed or malformed in the quest to see the real. Within my own context, I see whiteness as a malforming force similar to late capitalism in its pervasion. White domination and race, racial capitalism, 
serve to create a system that forms white Pentecostal subjects who take white supremacy as a natural ordering of the world, often upheld by a blindness to its reality. Given the history of domination among white Pentecostals and our blindness to its continuation, I cannot imagine trusting ourselves as a community to discern a deeper reality without first tending to that which clouds our vision. But is this even possible? I think we have much to learn from Nimi Waraboko's The Pentecostal Principle, which I turn to now. Paul Tillich's Protestant Principle is a drive for reformation of Catholic substance, largely a negative or critical project. The Pentecostal Principle builds on the reforming energy of the Protestant Principle, but with an eye toward creative potentials. The spirit of Pentecostalism is human capacity to begin again to create a new, and therefore assumes an oppositional stance towards social structures claiming any sense of ultimacy. This is not exhaust war about this contribution, but I see the prioritization of the new beginnings as particularly helpful. Warboko gives language to think about anticipating the new by rejecting any single mode of knowledge production, especially those built on domination. New social arrangements and potentialities can come in the form of divine surprise, God acting in the world, but also from emergent potentials within the world. For Waraboko, the world is always emerging and never reaches its fullness. In fact, those that would claim any social arrangement or thing as complete would be exactly the type of thing Waraboko hopes to cast suspicion upon. In a way similar to certain Ignatian spiritualities, this demands a sort of detachment from any social arrangement or knowledge system, as they're always incomplete in awaiting the emergence of their new beginning. As Pentecostals strive to see, we would all do well to consider Warboko's theory and ethics as a way to unpack ossified knowledge systems and anticipate new beginnings. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation. Um, now I move to Dr. Marcos Harvey, who will talk on Gnostic and epistemological themes in African traditional religion. Dr. Harvey is at the University of North Carolina at Hashville, just uh, across the road from me. So welcome. Thank you. I hope you all can uh, can hear me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Falola and the other conference organizers, as well as um, for the invitation, and the opportunity to be here, and also, of course, uh, Professor um, Wadiboko for his uh, scholarship and for making possible uh, this conference. So it is truly an honor uh, to be here. Um, I actually changed the title of my talk today um, to "What It Means to Know." in African traditional religion, what it means to know an African traditional religion. And I have no uh, in quotes here. And I'll just say quickly before I begin the actual paper that uh, the title is, is in keeping, I think, with um, Professor Wadi Boko's um, concern with issues of epistemology um, with respect to African traditional religions and Pentecostalism. Um, and also with respect to his uh, commitment to transdisciplinary approaches, uh, because in order to pursue this question of what it means to know an African traditional religion, um, one has to uh, explore multiple methodological frameworks. And in my case, um, I'm bringing together here uh, phenomenology and epistemology in an effort to, to unpack um, this question and offer some, some thoughts uh, that may be helpful in, in answering it. Um, so by the late 1970s, the category African traditional religion had gained steam in a discursive environment whose growth was fomented by 18th and 19th century Eurocentric beliefs about African primitives held by eminent European intellectuals. A common axiom tying these beliefs together was that quote, there is nothing to be learned from them, them being Africans, unless it is already ours, ours being Europeans, or comes from us, end quote. 
This form of reasoning undergirded, for example, conservative British statesman and former prime minister author James Balfour's imperialist attitude toward Oriental Egypt in a controversial 1910 parliamentary lecture, an attitude reflected in the belief that, quote, British knowledge of Egypt is Egypt, end quote. It may come as no surprise then, 60 years later, Ugandan social critic, critic Okat Bitek concluded that, quote, Western scholars have never been genuinely interested in African religions per se. Their works have all been part and parcel of some controversy or debate in the Western world, end quote. Whether we agree with Bitek or not, the study of African traditional religion from a Gnostic or epistemological perspective is a fraught enterprise. It resists Hume's and Kant's shared insistence upon useful, morally grounded African knowledge being an impossibility, stubbornly forcing the question of what knowledge is or what it means to know from within an African religious frame of reference, embedded both in the, in the ancestral African past and in the so-called modern contemporary present. So if, as Michel Foucault suggests, distinct sociocultural conditions make possible the creation of diverse ideas, knowledges, theories, and philosophies, what then are the conditions that enable traditional, or, or we might say indigenous, African religious gnosis or knowing? How is knowing understood? from a traditional African religious perspective? What is the relationship of such knowing to contemporary modernity? It is perhaps quite reasonable to ask the latter question when we consider uh, Bruno Latour's theorization of contemporary modernity as a complex state of affairs that quote, comes in as many versions as there are thinkers or journalists, end quote, while simultaneously pointing to quote, the passage of time, a new regime, in a contentious revolutionary rupture in time where there are modern winners and ancient losers, end quote. Engagement of this question is buttressed as well by a growing interest among um, transdisciplinary scholars such as Professor Wadi Boko um, in African transcultural and global modernities. This question along with the others just posed represents the basic concerns of this paper. I should also note that the ensuing analysis takes its cue from the phenomenology of religion and places a heavy emphasis on epistemology. Thus, my approach to African traditional religious knowing bears interpretive proximity to studies like Opoku's West African traditional religion and Baki's death and the invisible powers. As signal in Mudembe's the invention, of, the invention of Africa, a landmark work that raises epistemological questions regarding our understanding of African people groups, traditions, and thought worlds. The language of gnosis from the Greek nosko, which means to know, can be useful to discussions of African epistemology, given, given its association with seeking to know, inquiry, methods of knowing, investigation, and acquaintance with someone. Even more important, terms found in the Akan Yoruba in Dagara lexicons such as ebazadzi, which means to ascertain or inquire through divination, um, <clears throat> which is a mystical or Gnostic technology utilized by trained priests to establish materially effective communication with the spiritual world. Ifa, um, the sacred oral text of Yoruba religion and to a core divination system known as, uh, oh, excuse me, and Yel Bongura, which uh, translates in, in English, is, this is a, a Dagada term, which in English translates to the thing that knowledge cannot eat. Um, all of these terms invite academic attention to African traditional religion at the level of knowledge. My argument then is that a contemporary sense of what it means to know within a traditional African religious environment can be established through attention to um, two things, although I only will um, focus on one in the, in, in the interest of time today but on two things that emerge upon a general consideration of cosmological details shared across a variety of African people groups, followed by a more focused examination of oral religious discourse, primarily a con proverbs with spiritual implications or references. The themes are 
knowing as an elusive yet adaptable relationship with spirit requiring constant interplay between the ancestral African past and the immediate present. And two, and, and this will be the thing that I'll focus on today. And two, knowing as a moral crucible. Knowing as a moral crucible. My analysis mainly treats Akan aphorismal statements as religiously pitched oral discourse. Moreover, the analysis here rests upon the assumption that such statements embed epistemological reflection. Proverbs thus emerge for our purposes as data points that allow a look at the apparatus of thought underpinning African traditional religion. They also make possible an interpretation that for the purposes of this paper, coalesces around the central theme of knowing as a moral crucible. The following proverbs invite reflection on the ethics or morality of religious knowing in a Khan society. They include, and I'll render them here in English, they include, uh, quote, if something flourishes too much, it begins to spoil. Second proverb, too much power leads to stupidity. Third proverb, if you want to see everything, you become blind. Fourth proverb, it is the spirit that does not talk that we throw stones at. Most things are capable of flourishing in some way. Religious gnosis is no different in this respect. In fact, as discussed earlier, religious gnosis, religious gnosis uh, is linked to the blessings of wealth, children, and long life, three goals toward which African traditional religion strives. Why then do the Akan warn that, quote, if something flourishes too much, it begins to spoil? Concerning religious, notion, concerning religious gnosis, I would posit that this admonition is motivated by an acute awareness that religious, gnos that religious gnosis is a potentially volatile form of power whose use must be governed by a firm discipline grounded in the moral values of the community. To imagine one example, a priest demonstrated proclivity for selfish excess in his use of spiritual knowledge would be regarded as an immoral proclivity, indicative of a lack of proper discipline and as a grave threat to the well being of the community. The priest in this example would be seen as having failed the moral crucible of responsibly carrying the burden constantly placed upon him or her by religious gnosis. His standing as a trustworthy epistemological vessel in the community would be greatly diminished, if not annulled completely. He would be an unfortunate reminder that, quote, too much power leads to stupidity. And that, quote, if you want to see everything, you become blind. The priest's pursuit of religious gnosis in excess gives rise to, stupid to stupidity, which in, turn uh, which in turn blinds him to the moral duties of his spiritual role and to the necessary limits of seeing, or we might say knowing. Lastly, another related dimension of the moral, moral responsibility accompanying religious gnosis involves sharing. The knowledge given to human communities by spiritual beings through the body of a priest is not intended to be privately hoarded, but rather distributed for human benefit. Spiritual knowledge usually extends itself as needed, often withdrawing only in the absence of a proper vessel for transmission. The Akan priest is thus expected to openly communicate on behalf of spirit. Indeed, she has a moral obligation to do so. This is why the Akan say, it is the spirit that does not talk that we throw stones at. While the priest is a mouthpiece through which religious gnosis flows, the gnosis itself remains an invaluable community asset. A pressing question the Akan priest never escapes is, can you communicate ancestral religious gnosis in a manner that is relevant to and useful for the present moment? It is toward this moral epistemological goal that he must daily struggle. At its most basic level, 
the analysis developed herein puts forward African thought as a channel of insight into the phenomenon dubbed African traditional religion. Furthermore, both African thought and African traditional religion are seen as being in conversation with contemporary modernity, rather than in strict opposition to it. Even so, we must avoid the notion that African societies have not created ideas and uh, philosophical traditions that perdure over time in stable patterns that are distinguishable from those of modern Euro-Western epistemes. African traditional religion presents us with an opportunity to fundamentally reimagine our understanding of what it means to know. What is at stake in mustering the courage to embrace this opportunity is an epistemological future inclusive of and consequently deepened by African religious gnosis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much for this presentation. Now we, the floor is open or the screen is open to questions. So the questions that we are going to entertain now are for, uh, for the last three presentations. And if you have more time, we can take all the other presentations. So if you have any questions uh, for Ms. Anita Ansa, uh, Kriti Coleman, and Dr. Harvey, please um, feel free to speak or send me your questions in the chat room. Mr. Uh, Dr. Odutola, you have a question? Are you there? Dr. Odutola? Okay. Now, okay, let me ask uh, uh, one more message. Okay. <laughs> let me ask Dr. Uh, Ms. Answer this question. Uh, you, do I understand you correctly in saying that um, African traditional religion is the inheritance of African Pentecostalism or African Pentecostalism is the inheritance of African traditional religion. Uh, can you clarify that please? You are still muted please. Or mute yourself. Okay. I, I just wondered the... No, 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 please. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Miss Ansa is speaking now, okay? I will get back to you, okay? Miss Ansa, go ahead. Yes, what I was saying was that African Pentecostalism has inherited elements from African traditional religion. So the inheritance of African Pentecostalism is African traditional religion in, in a number of lights. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Dr. Rutola, your question or comment? Please be, be brief. I'm very brief. I just wanted a clarification on whether it was knowing crucible or principle, because it's, it's sounding like um, knowing principle. And I, if, if, the, if Dr. Harvey could just throw a little bit of light on this whole idea of a knowing crucible. Thanks. Oh yes, thank you for your question. Uh, here, I, I do emphasize the idea of, of knowing as a moral crucible um, in the sense that uh, knowing, um, uh, especially within the context of, of Akan's spirituality, as I have studied it and understand it, um, constantly places a burden upon um, a komfo, that is to say, um, traditionally trained and initiated priest um, to uh, to, to deploy the knowledge that they acquire from the spiritual realm in ways that are guided by um, the ethical principles, ethical uh, precepts of society, right? And so uh, that's what I mean by, by, more, by knowing as a moral crucible in this, in this context. However, I do think it, that, that, that it's entirely possible to think um, of, of knowing in this sense um, as also a kind of moral principle as well. I don't think that the two uh, happiness uh, are necessarily um, in opposition. I, I think they can sort of exist um, in conversation with each other um, in ways that are are constructive in the sense of or in the direction of of furthering how we how we understand and interpret what it means to know 
um, within the context of African spirituality. But, but thanks so much for your question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have many questions here. So um, we have to be very, very brief because of time. So I have a question from Dr. Ngong. Is there any theological interaction between Islam and Pentecostalism in Africa? This is open to anyone who wants to have, answer the question. Any of the presenters, actually. Uh, is there any theological interaction between Islam and Pentecostalism in Africa? Can I, can I answer here? Yeah, please. Actually, great. Um, yeah, yes, so please. I actually answered um, uh, the question and saying, yes, indeed, there is a great deal of interaction. And in fact, Brian Larkin, who works on, um, you know, sort of young uh, movements among Muslims in northern Nigeria, and I've had many years of conversation about the ways in which Islam in particular borrows from Pentecostalism in its styles, and particularly in Yoruba land. So you can go and meet Allah, which if you're a Muslim, is not a thing. Uh, we don't get to meet Allah in the... <laughs> and so there are even choirs in some of these mosques and some, there's one group, I can't remember the name of it. My colleague knows who's, I don't know if he's here, um, who do services, Friday services on Sundays, really largely to prevent their youth from going to the Pentecostal churches. So in fact, it's a very competitive interactive space. The use of tapes, for example, the me use of media in particular is something that a lot of Muslim groups in the North have borrowed from Pentecostal. So there is a ton of interaction, I would say. John Peel's yeah. last book is a great book of the three traditions, Islam, traditional religion, and Christianity. His latest yeah. book before, just before he died. Yeah, let me say something Maybe. that is important. One of the main identifying mark of Pentecostalism today is the online vision Friday. So why people did not know, they copied that from Muslims. Yes. And Muslims copied that from African traditional religion. So now in the last 15 years, Muslims have come back to copy it from, from Christians on the Ibadan Expressway because they want to stop yeah. their youth. Because you see, people don't know the history of the nine vision. African traditional religions were used to having nine visions prayer in the night. So yeah. when I grew up, I never found it very straight. I didn't think it was an invention of Pentecostalism because in the time they won't let you sleep. They have their nine vision. So how do we trace the route? If you go to a giant crowd at his book in the, mm -hmm. in the 19th century, he complained about the Africans, traditional religion, having nine vision that was dis 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 disturbing him. <laughs> you see, so that's how I said it. Then along yes. in Yoruba land, the Islam picked that up to counter that. And then that waned. By the time the Pentecostal reinvented it in the 80s or so, and everybody think nine visual, this big nine visual is, is a Pentecostal invention. Then what happened? The, 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 the Muslims now go back and say, wow, these people are taking our, our stuff, right? So they <laughs> now think and, and copy the case. So people thought, yeah. oh, the Muslims are copying Christians. But because they have a limited, they don't have a long durable view of history. If you trace how African religion have been, you find out that they were doing that to counter, just like the Muslim and Christians, to counter their youths going out in the nights to, to, to enjoy African traditional religion. So it has kind of come uh, full circle. So that is the way you can find some of this. Um, of course. Uh, 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 because when night vigils were brought in, Nini, uh, when night vigils were brought in in Yoruba land, they were actually, people were worried that they were demonic. And I remember Adi Boy preaching one time saying, don't listen to your husband if he says that you cannot go to night vigil, that your baby will be replaced with demon baby. Don't mind them. You know, there's this. So, of course, there are these. Again, this is a big theme in my book. How do we mark the break that is colonial, the colonial period? How do we mark the situation of beginnings? in every way that is a novelty and that, you know, these appropriations. So of course, I mean, John Peel has a lovely way of putting it, when leaf becomes soap. In other words, uh, the ways in which traditions become uh, integrated into a social world. And so of course, Pentecostalism, uh, who was it that, um, Jose, I think he put it, I forgot his last name, the famous uh, sociologist of, of evangelical, Jose uh, George, anyway, it doesn't matter. He put it this way, Pentecostal, 
Pentecostalism is a local tradition, uprooted tradition at war with its own roots. And in fact, I think it takes this dynamic, if you start looking at a much longer history, you're right, Mimi, but we still have to mark a break. And I want to know, what is that break? Because now, I mean, if you look at Andy Apter's book on, um, which is, you know, Yoba Sovereignty, which is actually a really a terrible book because it's got no Christianity in it. And so my question for those working on ATRs at the moment and trying to look at the interactions and the ways in which Pentecostalism and Islam, actually, to be clear, at least the new reformist versions, demonize traditional practices, how do we, how then do we get Pentecost to recognize the extent to which, of course, this is part of a historical continuum, even though there are important breaks and some of them are epistemic, potentially ontological, certainly political for sure. Um, I would like to, I'd like to ask that question for those of you working on this panel, it could be to all of you or any of you, because for example, you go, except in going to small villages, I mean, I'm an urban Africanist, but you didn't, you're not going to find practitioners. It is again, an academic, subject. I like liberation theology. You want to go to Latin America and find base communities, you will not find them. And in, Af in Nigeria, you will find a bunch, a few old women practicing in some small places, but it is no longer, it is part of a collective unconscious, I would argue, but not a practice. And so the question then from for you as scholars is to what extent uh, is this gnosis, which is absolutely, you know, the project of Madimbe, etc. How is it something that can be um, it's kept forward in Pentecostal, but it's perverted and, and, and changed in a way that it becomes unrecognizable, I believe, for those for whom it's their history. And I think that's a very crucial question for, for all of you thank guys, you. because this is a competitive field. Yeah, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, because of time, I have a question for Creating Coleman, and, and, but anyone can also pick it up. He, he, it complicates this for us, uh, the, this idea of discernment that Dr. Wadiboko has talked about elaborately in his books. My question is, is it possible to, to, to discern if one does not know the world, if you do not know the history that, 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 that produces the present, is it possible, therefore, to discern? And the reason why I'm asking that question is, I, am, I doubt that many leaders of Pentecostalism in Africa know much about the literature of racial capitalism. I doubt whether they know much about the philosophy, theory, and history of the power of whiteness that produced racialized world that we live in. So, for someone who is building a church and make and, and, and leading congregation in Abuja or Lagos or in Calabar, how is it possible to discern when this person is not aware of the history that produces the very subject that he's trying to discern? That's my question for me. I think that's a fantastic question. And I think you are you know, spot on uh, with, uh, much of the tension. Um, so, so to answer your question, I think, I think no, um, I, I don't think one can uh, discern um, without knowledge of the world. And what I mean by that is uh, because I am interested in a normative account of discernment, um, knowledge of the world, knowledge of history and material in the world um, is important uh, for then discerning the world. Um, one account of discernment that I'm interested in is Amos Young's uh, discernment of spirits, and Professor Warboko has um, highlighted this tension between uh, Amos Young's account of discernment and uh, the emphasis on the external and the material and the observable in discerning spirits and, um, uh, and discernment as it happens uh, among Pentecostals, um, a reluctance to limit to uh, the observable or material. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, I mean, I think the social sciences um, are essential in knowing the world. Uh, those fields that uh, allow us and give us the tools to, um, uh, to observe the world, collect information, uh, gives more data for the process of discerning. Okay, thank you. Professor Falola, how much, oh, uh, Professor Wadibuko wants to say something. Let him go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, our next panel is at one o'clock. At Only one o'clock. You, you've all missed your lunch, as I was telling you the other time. <laughs> so, okay. so um, go ahead. 
So it's very, um, the, the question you asked about what role historical reality or condition apply. So let me answer that discernment in light of how discernment takes place in African traditional religion and what it takes place in, um, how it takes place in Pentecostalism. In African traditional religion, as I've read, especially Robin Hortin and others who have studied the matter, discernment, it's heavily rooted in understanding your social conditions. Because when you go to the African traditional healer, like Horton said, they have two theories of, of the disease, what they call the gem theory, which is the scientific, everybody knows that uh, if a knife cuts you, you, you will bleed. So the gem theory is there. But where that does not fully account, they will go onto a second level order of thinking. But the thing about what Horton said that oftentimes the way they solve the healing problem is to diagnose the tensions in your social relationship within your context. And, and this is what part of Western science is now going to healing in the hospitals as some kind of psychological healing. Because part of the assignment of a traditional African um, healer is, is not only to use the spiritual as a tool, as an apparatus to know what is happening, but he, he or she also looks at the tension in your social relationship. So, so sometimes you are sick or something is, is, is bothering you. It will say because maybe you, you are not in good terms with your mother-in-law. And therefore you're not in good terms with your mother-in-law. And that's why the ancestors are angry with you. But, but the thing to understand that he first looks at the social, the, the tensions by asking the questions, knowing all that. So they are very constant with the social and historical realm upon which they will build this spiritual scaffold or, 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 or do it that way. So, so they very much understand how the social works in the environment and the tensions that are there that could create all sorts of stresses and illness in the society in addition to the gem theory. So they are very vast in that, in addition to using spiritual. But once you go to the Pentecostal, still do the, the discernment, but they tend to elevate or we tend to elevate the spiritual. Because the Pentecostal say, I don't really want to know what about you. Anything I want to know, the spirit can reveal to, uh, uh, to, to me. So they've, they've, they've now decoupled the, the, uh, the physical, historical, relevant knowledge from it because they believe that the spirit will automatically tell me what to do. Because oftentimes they have a short cut to it, right? If you are have problem with your husband, it's not your bad attitude. They're not trying to understand what is going on in your family. It's because some devil is uh, attacking you and therefore let's go pray, cast out that de devil and your problem with some. So, so you, see, you see what is happening. So the, 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 the discernment is de-emphasized. Pentecostalism tends to de-emphasize the, 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 the social. And that also had an historical period in Nigeria. In the 70s, people who were interested in the, in the sermon begin to even get more interest in how the gods, the local gods operate. And some people within the movement says, no, you are, you are investing too much in understanding, quote unquote, the demons. So you don't need to do that. You see, so that idea of understanding the historical and the social is very was begin to de-emphasize. But that doesn't mean that it was completely gone because if you look at what Pastor Adeboye and um, um, the founder of Deeper Life, all of them did, right? If you look at their analysis of the, of the discernment of Nigeria's problem, you could see that at that point in the 1977 period, they were still using this two model of understanding the social and the, and, and the spiritual to come up. Why do I say so? If you go back and look at their analysis of, of all why Nigeria is a mess, they will tell you the, the staging of the first tack in Lagos. See, that, is, that was a social event, historical event that happened. The staging of the uh, first tack in Lagos brought in all the demons from all other Africa and diaspora and deposited them in Nigeria. And since that time, Nigeria has not... Uh, uh, taken a, never mind that that period also coincided with the co co collapse of the oil market. Never mind that. Let me quickly come in. Earlier in the, 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 the panel before keynote, uh, I don't know whether he's left, Professor Sam Salanga. Is, this, is he here? 
he, he said something and it had never occurred to me before. And this is one of the blessings of having conferences. He said he got to his office and he was very sad. And he didn't know the reason. I don't know how many of you listened to that conversation. And it turned out that it was a sermon he had about Jesus, the donkey, and how the wealthy person said, the church pastor said, I'm going to remain the most wealthy. When he was saying it, now it occurred to me that even a statement that has nothing to do with him, just like that, connected to him emotionally and disturbed him. And I began to say, suppose we now begin to multiply this on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And you could see that sometimes we tend to misunderstand some of these um, people who go to churches. Because if a short sentence like that can destabilize this professor <laughs> and he had to search for his route, imagine all the statements in the markets, at home, everywhere. Um, the second one, which is to rupture some of this conversation, I owe it to the chairman. We're having the chair of this panel. We're having a conversation like two weeks ago. And he formulated the theory that every generation defines the values. And I'm going to add the value system. That's, he didn't have that as a form of protocol. So because I'm always worried about youth behavior. So, and when he told me that, I just calmed down. Because, because if, if, if they are the one defining those values, right? I'm walking back values of the past, as you've done with the jaw, right? Well, the jaw youth are saying those values of the past, against the background of um, modern Nigeria and corruption in Abuja. So when they said NNDC, is that, what, that is their name, NNDC, that they stole billions. I was telling people there is going to be fire and they are going to burn every place tomorrow in the Niger Delta. Nothing of such happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. So what? People will steal all your money. They didn't do anything. Which means, unknown to me, as the chair argued, they probably absorbed that kind of value. That, well, what is it to steal money? Is money. You can go and steal it. <laughs> I'm just adding to this. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have seven more minutes left, right? You should give that... them time to go to the bathroom for the next panel. Yeah, yeah. please, uh, Dr. Goin, there was a question for you about the ancestors. Can you just spend two minutes to answer that question? And, uh, and your 3 a.m. How do you know 3 a.m. by Western time? Well, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Receive <laughs> thank, thank you very much. I, I think the question is very simple. It is asking a Christian whether he wants to go to heaven and how he wants to get there. So for, for, the, African, uh, for the African, we must look at one thing and it's very important in discussing the ancestors. That has to do with the anthropocentric values that are derivable from the criteria for becoming an ancestor. So when we say a good life, for instance, just like uh, Professor uh, Falola has quoted you, that every generation determines its own value system, then the question resonates. So what is the value system that we want to generate or determine at this point to set criteria for becoming an ancestor in post colonial Africa. From all our discussions uh, thus far, the question is very... Uh, we're losing you. Okay. Well, uh, we are losing the, uh, Dr. Igboin. Uh, well, let me just say that uh, I really thank all the presenters. <laughs> for these wonderful remarks. And let me say that on the question of the ancestors, I actually have an elaborate discussion on that in, uh, in, in my book that uh, Professor Falola shared with you. And I will not say what I discussed in that book. So you have to go and buy the book. <laughs> so um, I thank all, 
all of you for your presentations. And I also thank all the members of the audience uh, and also Dr. Falola, Dr. Wadiboko for making this panel and this conference possible. I have more questions in the chat, but unfortunately uh, it's not possible to take all of them at this particular time in the conference. So thank you very much. And then we are gonna use the, the loo and then transition to the next. Okay, so we'll meet in four minutes. Yeah. Quickly, Thank you. go to the bathroom so that, please. Thank you, Chair. We thought we, <laughs> you had it one more hour. <laughs> but it's very entertaining. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Well, welcome. We're very grateful that you all are able to join us. And we look forward to an exciting set of presentations. We still have a very large audience for over uh, 48 people. And we have a, another set because we are streaming this live on YouTube, who are also joining through YouTube. Uh, our chair is from Boston. This has become a Boston mafia. 
I never knew it's going to turn out this way. It's just accidental. Uh, Falungom, who used to be the director of the African Studies Center, and his book on Islam, uh, Islam Beyond the Arab World, won the Askovitz Prize some three or four years ago. Uh, thank you for sharing this, and you introduced the members of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I am uh, very honored uh, to be here today and to learn a lot. Uh, more importantly, to uh, uh, celebrate the work of uh, uh, my colleague, my big brother, the distinguished professor, uh, Nimi Wariboko. Uh, there are about five panelists. I wanted to make sure that they're all here first before I can uh, begin. So I'm just gonna call the names and uh, if you're here, just let me know. Uh, the first one is uh, Tony Bo. I'm here. Are you? Okay, I'm here. great, yeah. excellent. And uh, Gerald Ellis. Yes, I'm present. Great. Uh, Michael uh, Kameniki. Right here. Excellent. Uh, Taylor Thomas. Here. As part of the BU Mafia. Okay. Uh, Nick Rodriguez, BU also? I'm here. Okay, excellent. All right. Uh, so I think just like the panel before, we will have about uh, 20 minutes uh, conversation and uh, we will save the uh, questions uh, at the end. Uh, the first panelist is Tony Bo. Uh, Tony is an educator, songwriter, essayist, musician, and scholar. Uh, more recently, he graduated from Boston University's uh, School of Theology, where he earned the prestigious Master of Sacred Theology where he studied social ethics with uh, Professor Nimi Wariboko. Among other things, he has a passion for the social, educational, and spiritual outcomes of young people. And he loves the Lord and earnestly desires that God's will be done in this life. So uh, I look forward to hearing his insights. The second panelist is Gerald Ellis. Gerald is a leader in labor economics and poverty and is an award-winning teacher and researcher from the University of Minnesota where he obtained his PhD in labor economics and organizational psychology. Uh, he has a very extensive background in various fields. Uh, Jerry's current research projects are focused on understanding the role of students' debt. And I think this is very important and topical. Uh, the role students' debt will play in the public space from both a theological and economic perspective. Looking forward to that conversation. And the third panelist is Michael Austin Kamineki. He holds a, an MA in Theological Studies from Lee University, and his current research examines the intersection between Pentecostalism, aesthetics, and constructive theology. He worked as, as an adjunct instructor in his alma mater. Looking forward to hearing his insights. And Taylor Thomas is a PhD student in theology, ethics, and uh, philosophy at uh, Boston University. Looking forward to learning from you. And Nikki Rodriguez, uh, Nick Rodriguez, is a third year master's of uh, third year student uh, in the School of Divinity at Boston University, studying uh, various aspects of uh, Pentecostalism. He is deeply interested in the relationship between theology, anti fragility, and resilience. So I think we have a wonderful list of panelists here 
which will continue the exciting discussions we have been having since the, the morning today. So without uh, uh, further comments from me, I will begin with giving the floor to Tony Blow, uh, Tony Bo. But before that, I just wanted to touch on a few aspects of his fascinating paper. Uh, his paper is an attempt to reveal an existential proclivity of blackness as a site for textual resistance. What it explores is how blackness as existential, as ontological, as consequences, uh, as consciousness, has a mode of survival and triumph for 400 years in America. Clearly, this is a very important paper, topical in terms of the situations of anti-blackness in America. So uh, I think this is a wonderful paper and we look forward to hearing uh, Tony. Tony, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Listen, first, I wanna say this to Brother Coleman. Thank you so much for what you said in your presentation. You said that whiteness is not an apt or proper site for resistance against racial capitalism. And you were so right. Um, you're all in my paper. So thank you so much, sir, uh, because my paper uh, invites you to come over to the black side. Uh, since it is true that whiteness um, with this history of racial capitalism and primacy cannot be the site of racial justice or justice and resistance, then um, come on over to your darker brother to your darker sister. I invite you today. Uh, first, I wanna say also to uh, Dr. Nimiwari Boko, um, thank you for this, this is awesome. Uh, I would not be here if it was not for Dr. Wari Boko. Um, I'm not gonna quote any of his papers. I hope that doesn't offend you, but I wanna make sure you knew uh, how uh, much his thinking, his thought, his philosophy, his view on ethics has influenced my own um, epistemological commitments. Um, there's a map of Africa behind me and Dr. Ori Boko is right, is right here. These are all of my favorite black writers. And I put him, I tried to get him close as possible to Nigeria, but I, I didn't, I, Claude McKay got in the way. So I just want you to know as I, as I stand here um, for that. So uh, to begin, I just wanted to uh, say this, that when it comes to the idea of blackness as a site for textual resistance, that nothing is more important today in our society than that, than textual resistance. Um, we've heard about what's happening in Nigeria. We've heard about what's happening in Ghana and other places, and that's great. But let's talk about for a moment what's happening in the United States. Even right now, um, as I speak, lies are going forth from the White House, from the Oval Office, from the press room, um, at the top of the executive branch of government. Right now, um, lies, um, mendacity, perfidiousness galore is going on right now um, at the top uh, of the United States government. And so in no other time has there been a need to have a kind of resistance uh, to lies. Um, and Black people, my thesis, my argument is that Black people in this country um, have a certain kind of lived experiential tradition in which we uh, have a kind of uh, resistance um, in our very um, essence of living in this country for 400 years to certain texts um, that are lies about our very being, even those texts um, that are constitutive and constructive um, of what it is to be um, in America. I wanted to read a passage um, that I have in my paper um, that actually comes from uh, Immanuel Kant, from his uh, uh, observations on the beautiful and the sublime, that was actually one of the inspirational texts um, to what Thomas Jefferson would write in the Declaration of Independence. And he writes, Kant writes this in the 1700s, uh, 1763, he says, the Negroes of Africa have by nature no feeling that rises above the trifling. Mr. Hume challenges anyone to cite a single 
example in which a Negro has shown talents and asserts that among the hundreds of thousands of Blacks who are transported elsewhere from their countries, although many of them have even been set free, still not a single one was ever found who presented anything great in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality. Even though among the whites, some continually rise aloft from the lowest rabble and through superior gifts, earn respect in the world. So fundamental is the difference between these two races of man, and it appears to be a great in regard to mental capacities as in color. The religion of fetishes so widespread among them is perhaps a sort of idolatry that sinks as deeply into the trifling as appears to be possible to human nature. A bird feather, a cow's horn, a conch shell, or any other common object, as soon as it becomes consecrated by a few words, it is an object of veneration and invocation and swearing oaths. The blacks are very vain, but in the Negro's way, and so talkative that they must be driven apart from each other with thrashing. This is what uh, was written by Immanuel Kant, one of the leaders of the so-called Age of Enlightenment. And if in the 1700s, in the 1800s, in the 1900s, and even today, um, I postulate and I stipulate that Black people have never paid attention uh, to such nonsense as that, uh, to such uh, racist nonsense, because to do so would be what Albert Camus would call philosophical suicide. We would never even be able to exist. We wouldn't even be able uh, to function as human beings. We've never listened uh, to such texts as that, but the texts are all around us. Um, they are in Western literature, they're in Eastern literature, they're all around us, which go and try to obviate and to preclude our very essences. I grew up in Virginia and there is a roller coaster that I would ride with my father um, in Virginia. And this roller coaster went forwards and it also had a side that went backwards. And the name of this roller coaster uh, was called the Rebel Yell. Can you imagine that? Um, even in terms of children's entertainment, we were being bombarded with texts that spoke to a confederacy, to a white supremacist ideology that actually went and had its motion of being against us at all points, even in terms of amusement at an amusement park. And so I grew up with this, yet it has not uh, fundamentally caused me um, to become dejected or to become defeated, but I am still here and standing strong. Isn't it interesting? Uh, so when we look at this as far as how blackness can be a site of resistance to text, to lies, to mendacity, um, to injustice. We see that um, over 400 years, we have triumphed, we have overcome in spite of those things. And so here we have a novel way of, uh, and I invite all the white people and everybody else uh, to look through the lens uh, of a black person uh, who has never listened to these uh, kinds of kinds of texts. And Walter Brueggemann in his book, he says that there are, and the word militant is the name of the book, he says there are no textless worlds. So there are texts that we can see, there are texts that we can't see um, that are working uh, against us. Yet uh, black people have done three things. We've resisted, we've repurposed, and then we've refurbished. Um, we're talking now about re resistance. Um, I also want to talk about now to move uh, about re repurposing. Um, this is why uh, Black people uh, say uh, the word nigger. Uh, I, I, I didn't make the word up. Don't be mad at me for using it. Um, so, uh, but Black people uh, use the term, uh, even though it was a portion towards us as a term that is derogatory. We have repurposed it uh, as a way of referring to each other, to, to take the sting out of death, as it were, to inoculate all of those kinds of forms of oppression is really what this 21st century hermeneutic I propose is about. It's, it shows how we must come from a place of marginality to see the text for what it is, to see it in a new way um, that is anti-hegemonic, that is anti-capitalist, that is anti-domination, um, um, that is anti-domineering. And that's the way that when you look at it 
a text in that way. When you look even in the text that actually build this country infrastructurally, superstructurally, um, you're able to actually come to it from a redemptive standpoint. Um, and again, my, my, my thesis is that black people um, offer a, a valuable, invaluable site to actually achieve this as a mode of achieving justice. Because um, uh, to quote the, the great, the late great prophet Bernie Mac, I've been black a long time. And um, I can tell you uh, from experience that these kinds of texts, which actually suffuse themselves um, from uh, Confederate monuments, um, Henry Louis Gates Jr. in his book, uh, Stony the Road, he says that even the monuments themselves are a kind of text. Um, from, from Confederate monuments to Confederate flags, to any kind of symbology, to any kind of text, it has not eroded my sense uh, of self-worth. Um, and actually I pay it no mind. Imagine a black person considering Immanuel Kant the father of moralism. Imagine that, you can't, it's impossible. Um, and so we've never uh, listened. So again, there's the site of resistance. There is the site of, of repurposing. And then there's also the, the necessary work of refurbishing, of refurbishing. Um, Walter Brueggemann in his book, The Word Militant, again, he says that the only way that you can confront the dominant reality of your age is if you actually issue your own, your own reality, your own text to confront the dominant text. And so that is the work of, of protest. Um, that is the work of resistance. That is the work of justice. That you, you just don't resist it, but from that place of resisting, um, you repurpose uh, what has been written. And then you refurbish the, uh, the realm. You refurbish um, the atmosphere. You refurbish society with your own texts um, that speak predominantly um, to the ways in which um, those texts actually have been insufficient. The paper that I use or that I wrote um, uses a kind of hermeneutic that actually can be described as a theology of preaching. I have examples in the paper about, about preaching because I think that preachers have a, a kind of novel way of looking at text and actually deal with text um, in a kind of literal way um, from week to week as, as they preach. And I want to say this before I close is that um, in, the, in the paper I look at how certain texts we've looked at in a way that actually yields itself to empire, that uh, holds up and shores up those kinds of um, empire market mentality, market moralities um, that are around us. Even how we, we deal um, with, with certain uh, topics. I, I have a, a part in the book towards the end in which um, I use uh, one of the, the poems uh, from Robert Hayden called Middle Passage in which he talks about how Africans would kill themselves um, on the slave ships coming over uh, to America as they were, they were stolen and brought over to America and how they would jump off the ship with laughter, um, with a shout. And how, uh, when it comes to how we preach, uh, we talk about suicide as being anathema, as being appropriate in all situations. Um, but in that moment when the African would jump off the ship, they actually, it actually was a moment of justice because they were reclaiming their own ontology. They were, they were reclaiming their own being. They were reclaiming um, who they were um, in their essence. They were actually taking back their freedom. So what could be more holy than that? Is something that I actually argue in my paper. And so it's a way of looking at text um, that actually comes from a place of marginality, that comes from a place um, of the learned experience of 400 years of oppression that, again, resists empire, that resists domination, that resists um, hegemony. And it must start at a very textual place. And again, uh, Blackness is a sign of that because of how the Black person has proven herself to be indestructible um, ontologically, existentially, um, and politically, even philosophically over the past 400 years. And so we must make sure that we attend to that, that we don't just look away from what Joshua Bennett calls the low life, that there is something to be redeemed and to be garnered and to be learned um, from that as special experience because the black person's experience in this country is like no other is like no other. And it's very important uh, to, to, to recognize that. And so I wanted to make sure that I said that in closing. So it is 
again, about the work of resistance in three modes, resistance, um, repurposing and, and refurbishing as a kind of mode towards um, achieving achieving justice. And so that's that's it. I think that's close to 20 minutes or 15 minutes. I don't want to delay. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very, very, very much, Tony. I think Tony raises uh, fundamental questions in the goals of African studies in general, including the humanities, social sciences, and all the domains uh, that uh, investigate Africa, uh, peoples of African descent in Africa and outside of Africa. I think this is a topic that uh, would be uh, greatly discussed, I think, at the, at the end. I have my own particular interest in this you know, topic, especially because, uh, as, as he said, the use of text is probably the, the first uh, area to begin resistance, when texts themselves have become symbolic of civilization. And the overemphasis of oral traditions that I think all of us have been uh, contributing to, suggesting that there is no other sources of uh, legitimate knowledge, whether written or embodied form of knowledge, uh, that has really affected negatively knowledge production about Africa. So thank you very much, Tony, for, you know, and I look forward to the discussion section on this particular issue. Uh, the second panelist is um, Gerald Ellis, and uh, an important topic, uh, he will be discussing uh, 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 the post-COVID-19 situation and student debt in that context. I think this is, uh, I, I wish more, more students would be present because this, is, this paper is very relevant to them. Uh, he will argue that post COVID-19 pandemic, uh, students debt will be the need, the next financial crisis in our country and a new form of slavery. I look forward to hearing uh, Gerald, uh, comments and insights. Gerald, you have the floor. Gerald, are you there? Yes, sir. Yep, I just got unmuted. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank great. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, I do have a presentation, but before I ask to share the screen and put the presentation up, I would just want to uh, I owe a great deal of thanks to many people. For starters, I wanted to thank the people from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, obviously, uh, Professor Fala, uh, your book is wonderful. I had a chance to read it. Thank you so much for putting that together, sir. I also owe a special thanks to the following professors. Uh, Professor Nimi Ward Boko, who I've known for several years. He is my mentor. I had the good fortune of having nine classes with Professor Ward Boko when I was in seminary. Um, he is my mentor, he is my friend, and uh, I would not be here without uh, his training and his friendship and his uh, collegialship and his scholarship. So Nimi, thank you very much. I also owe a great deal of thanks to uh, Dean uh, Elizabeth Moore, who I don't know if she's joining this particular panel, but um, I was a Dean's fellow when I was at uh, BU Seminary and uh, I owe a great deal of thanks to her as well. Last and certainly not least, I wanna thank my mother who uh, without her wisdom and integrity, um, I also would not be here today as well. Uh, so I wanna mention before I get into the presentation, the formal presentation, in particular, uh, when I was in seminary, Nimi challenged me both professionally and academically and I loved it. One thing that Nimi mentioned in one of his classes, and I quote, he says, economics is elegant, and in fact, it is indeed elegant when it is acting fairly and ethically. Let me just restate that again real quickly. Economics is elegant, and in fact, it is indeed elegant when it is acting fairly and ethically. And I want to come back to that point a little later in my presentation. I found out, obviously, that he was correct, and this gave me great insight and energy to eagerly investigate the research question of student debt crisis. I will say, unfortunately, this is not a new discussion, but rather an old bone discussion, if you will, that needs both revival and 
resurrection from the abyss. This has given birth to, if you will, what I call the ninja generation. I didn't necessarily invent that term. This term actually was in a movie called Wall Street. And Gordon Gecko was an investment banker on Wall Street. And he came up with the term. I just put some academic polish to it. So the ninja generation, let me just tell you a little bit about that. The ninja generation stands for no income, no job, and no assets. And this is exactly what is happening uh, within our economic system now because the financial system, the neoliberal movements are oppressing college students. They're willing to give them a lot of money, but at the end of the day, um, they're, they're being crushed by debt. So having said that, I only have 20 minutes. I would like to uh, put up the presentation if I could. Um, sure. Can I share the screen, please? Um, sure. uh, do I have to put up the presentation or is somebody gonna do that or how's that gonna work here? Actually, I, I have to ask Anna. Uh, yes, sir, okay. um, I can share it for you if you would like, would that help? You can okay, ask would you be so kind? Time. Thank you very much, Anna. I got it here, I'm pulling it up right now. Thank you. Anna. All right, thank you. No problem. This might take just one moment while I open it. That's okay. I will say while you're pulling that up, as I mentioned, the ninja generation. Um, this ninja generation primarily is folks between the ages of 30 to 39. And um, I'll talk about that in just a second. Great. Can everyone see? Okay. Yes. Yep. I think it's great. Up. Are you going to advance it for me, or do I advance it myself here? Are we going to? Since I'm sharing it, please let me know when to change the slide, sir. Okay. Great. So, as the chair so eloquently put, um, this presentation is dealing with what I call the great integrity divide, and what I simply mean by that is that, again, you have neoliberalism and capitalist movements that are oppressing a new form of slavery, and the slave happens to be in this case students or anyone going back to continue higher education. As a result, I'm gonna really explore and redeem our moral integrity and uplift the disinherited, as Howard Thurman puts it, investigating neoliberal influences on social relationships of student debt and relationships with financial institutions. Would you go to the next slide, please? So the agenda for today is, again, I'm gonna discuss the problem of student debt in a little more detail. I'm also gonna talk about why it's a major crisis. I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail again, who are these ninja students? Gave you a little taste of it, but we gotta go a little deeper. I'm gonna also provide some quick statistics. As an economist, I didn't wanna bore you with five or 10 slides, so I have one. And I'm also gonna say, how does the student debt statistics uh, play into the ninja generation? Also, we need to take a deeper look. I mean, a lot of us, not to insult anyone's intellect, we all kind of know what the term neoliberalism means but I think it's important to look at the specific behaviors as it influence, influences student debt. And we also really need to look at the student debt research, the current research and scholarly work. Obviously, I am going to discuss the works of Mimi Boko, specifically in his book, God and Money. I will touch on that. I'm gonna also touch on the works from Professor Scott Pace out of the University of uh, uh, DePaul, uh, DePaul University, rather, out of Chicago. I'm also gonna to touch on the works of both Mark Taylor and Kerry Day from Princeton Theological Seminary. And I am gonna to touch briefly on Islap An and his book, Just Debt. The key players in the student debt crisis, I'm gonna talk about them in a little bit more detail, specifically the World Bank, the World Trade Organization um, also. I'm also gonna talk about some of those underlying assumptions about student economic debt and a critical analysis of that real quickly. And then the outcome of that, unfortunately, which is more poverty, lower wages, no jobs. So again, we have this ninja generation, no income, no jobs, and no assets. And then we'll follow up with some questions. Next slide, please. So student debts and facts. What are some of the facts? This information was uh, supplied from the Department of Education of Washington, DC, 2018. Student debt is currently $1.9 trillion. It has surpassed credit card debt which is currently 1.5. So just think about that. More people have student loan debt than they do credit card debt. Higher cost of education has escalated while student wages and employment basically remained flat since 1967. Last time I checked this morning when I woke up, it was the year 2020. Neoliberalism and mendacious capitalist behaviors 
have eroded integrity relationships between the creditors and debtors. Nimi talks about that, and Islam An definitely talks about it in his book, Just Debt. So the financial system needs a major overhaul, and I'll talk about that when I make my proposal towards the end of the presentation. We need policies and programs that are more inclusive for the oppressed and disinherited so that justice can prevail over greed. The financial system needs what I'm calling a moral checkup. In other words, we need, to, we need more integrity. We need to be able to do what we say we're going to do. Our words and deeds have to match. And moral behaviors to drive human performance and not just financial performance, meaning maximizing profits and shareholder wealth. Next slide, please. So look at... When you look at this chart, it, it suggests a lot of things, but I'm just gonna highlight a few. In particular, the graph shows a steady increase of both ages under 30 and groups ages 30 to 39. They make up two thirds of the largest loan balances. So that's the 33% and the other 33% here. That's 66%. Some other interesting facts which aren't on this graph, but you can you can draw out of here. And I would urge you to certainly look at the Department of Education statistics. Defaults on loans for students are up 78%. Why? Very simply, they got no jobs. They got no jobs, they can't pay back the loans. The data also suggests that we have an aging population going back to school, unfortunately, for older students and younger students are proportionate, meaning they're both being saddled by overwhelming debt. In my research, I found this. The age is 30 to 39, the average student debt for that age group is at least $30,000. If you're between the ages of 40 and 49, the average debt is $45,000. If you're age, in my age category, if you're 50 and over, it's a minimum of 55,000. Next slide, please. So in framing the discussion, let's look at the scholarly work that currently exists. Professor Nimi Wariboko, obviously, in his work in God and Money, and also in his book, Charismatic City, Nimi really focuses on uh, this relationship, the social relationships, and the interplay of ethics and the economy. Nimi believes that the moral action and the economic justice that flows from the charismatic city, if you will, is this new creation, this new Jerusalem, if you will, the new energy, the new city that promotes good emotional energy. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Paul Tillich, who educates us about the triune God. In his book, Paul Tillich and the Pentecostal, page 71, he eloquently states, and I quote again, the triune God is a combination between the Christology, the Seratology, and the Pneumonology. Nimi also calls us to examine our moral imagination and to investigate the social relationships that exists between the demonic dimension, the evil, and the moral integrity, the good. Nimi suggests for us to, in order for us to coincide in a single unified currency, he came up with a brilliant idea, the earth dollar. I remember when I was in class and he first mentioned it and I said, what the heck is an earth dollar? I read about it, but really explain to me what this means. What the earth dollar is, it flows from the charismatic city. It is a good flow of energy, meaning everyone has equal access and everyone has shared access to capital with the outcome being financial freedom. Next slide, please. Professor Scott Page from DePaul University challenges Nimi. And he says, yeah, you know, I really understand that, uh, you know, this good versus evil argument and the social interaction and relationships are important but you kind of forgot about the environment and the ecology. So Scott Page argues, and that's not necessarily true because I know Nimi does touch in his other works. I had nine classes with him. He does touch on ecology. So in all fairness, I know he does do this. But Scott Page really is focusing on the ecological argument. It's missing in the economic scholarship, basically. He says our economies and our environments are really friendly, but we need to talk about it so we have environmental stability. Uh, Professor Page also talks about increasing conversations and engagement so that we have an interconnectedness, if you will, between the human and non-human worlds. He also suggests that determining the roles of the Holy Spirit and the Jubilee celebration in the Old Testament, that we need to, to look at those more deeply because we have to kind of extrapolate out 
So we can take the argument as Mimi would always say in all of his classes, how do you take it from the private sphere to the public sphere? Next slide, please. Both Professor Taylor and Carrie Day from Princeton Theological Seminary make a comment about being haunted by our ghost. And Professor Taylor in particular, I don't know if he's uh, uh, listening or not, I hope he is. Uh, he says, you know, we are haunted by our ghosts. He says, we must have the moral courage and ghosts represent the misrepresentation, and now this is Carrie Day, of both the, women, the womanist and feminist contributions, or what she claims is the lopsided guilt and amoral behavior that is in both political and theological theory. So both Taylor and Day challenge us to critically examine the oppressive behavior to reimagine, if you will, a better world. A world where both neoliberal behavior is challenged and we can flex our moral integrity. Next slide, please. So this takes us to Professor Islam Ahn and his book, Just Death. And Nimi made us read this book in a couple of his classes, but I still have it. I still refer to it. For those of you that haven't read it, it's an excellent book. Ahn helps us understand how student debt and moreover, how the relationship between creditors and debtors, meaning students and banks and financial institutions, exploit and how the oppressive relationship with debtors um, and, and uh, bank, banking institutions, uh, why they really exist. Ahn argues basically debt is immoral. He says it's immoral because the banks are exploiting the students. You have the slave and the slave master. You have the financial institution, the bank, that basically, and I hate to bring this up, but I think it's a perfect analogy. The banks have the knee on their neck of the students because they know they can't pay back the debt and they keep giving them the money. And the interest rates aren't necessarily cheap on those loans. So on really utilizes an interdisciplinary approach like Nimi does in a lot of his work. Meaning specifically, Ahn looks at this relationship between theology, anthropology, and economics. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we wanna talk about neoliberalism. Uh, a lot of us know what it is, but let me just revisit it real quickly. Neoliberalism is a capitalist system that uses economic policies, it limits uh, restrictions on manufacturing. In other words, it's really about mass production. This is kind of a Henry Ford concept. It's, it's all about maximizing profits and shareholder value. It also focuses on, again, reducing tariffs and free trade. It's about making, tra making trade easier. Uh, in the language of the current administration, it would be called, let's make big deals. It's about maximizing profits and efficiency. The issue here is that neoliberalism capitalist behavior, albeit we all wanna make a good wage, but when you're doing it at the expense of people's morality and you're doing it at the expense of their ability to, uh, uh, you're crushing their financial freedoms and their dreams, it's a self-interest model. That's an Adam Smith model. And it oppresses the least of these by keeping wages low and rewarding the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Next slide, please. So let's just real quickly talk about the evolution of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, basically, I'm going to start at the kind of post-war period, meaning early 17th century. The tensions between capitalism and labor were very intense, sort of like now. So not much has changed in three plus centuries, four centuries. From there, Adam Smith, the author of The Wealth of Nations, kind of really gave birth to a, a new argument, basically saying, you know, it's all about self-interest and about how I can make, how I can maximize my own profit, my own wealth. Then in the 1950s and 60s, John Maynard Keynes, the father of macroeconomics basically said, look, we need to really focus on growth, the production of jobs and labors. This gave birth to what was going on in the 60s and the 70s, if you will. This was all about liberalism and the liberalism began to collapse. So the bottom basically began to fall out. How and why did that happen? Because in the 70s, 80s, we went into a serious debt crisis. Not unlike what the, the debt crisis that we're in now. There's a, an economic pattern going on here. So it takes us to the 1990s up to the 21st century where we're at now. We, we had to basically deal with the capital crisis by promoting economic liberalism. In other words, 
the elites. It's all about the elites and how much money they can make. This is how neoliberalism, neoliberalism evolved. Next slide, please. So I'm going to keep this real short. There's a lot of information here. Here's what's important about this slide. Neoliberalism has the following characteristics. The market rules and promotes free enterprise. It cuts public expenditures, for example, social services, education, and healthcare. It's all about deregulation, meaning it limits government, and it'll reduce services, social services. It's about privatization. It promotes state, this is important, promotes state services, meaning banks. It's all about the banks. And it removes the concept of community and replaces it with individual responsibility. I'm sure Jean-Luc Nancy would have something to say about that. That probably would be an inoperable community, not necessarily a functional community. Next slide, please. So who are the key players in neoliberalism and the movement as it relates to student debt? Basically, you have the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. All of these kind of came under the umbrella uh, from the GATT organization, which was founded in 1947, which really promoted and focused on training and the exportation and the importation of goods. It's important to note that globally, neoliberalism has forced these powerful banks and institutions to basically participate. And in other words, they're pressuring them to play the game and they're playing it very well. And students are, are suffering from it. Next slide, please. So from an economic analysis and a critical analysis perspective, a lot of information on this slide, let me break it down for you. Three important points to take from this. One, neoliberalism is all about market manipulation. Two, it's all about the separation of economies from politics. In other words, it's all about money and profits for these folks. Three, poverty and keeping the oppressed poor and shackled with debt is what they're all about. In other words, and I talked about this from the very beginning, their focus is keeping the ninjas as ninjas. No income, no job, and no assets. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that their agenda is all about no income, no job, no assets. What's that really mean? What it means is this, we're gonna keep the oppressed poor and we're all about economic injustice because as King put it so eloquently, right? You know, where is, there can't be justice when injustice is being done. Well, neoliberalism doesn't care about that. What they care about is keeping people poor. So how do they do that? They've been doing it, no income, no jobs, right? So poverty rates have been increasing. Overproduction has been increasing. It's polarized the globe. Right now, when we look at what's going on with Black Lives Matters, and when we look at what's going on economically with uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting war poor, look at the poverty rates in Nigeria. And look at the poverty rates in the United States. They're both escalating. They're not decreasing. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm proposing. We've seen the works of Ori Boko. We've seen the works of uh, some other scholars. And I'm going to extend a lot of Nimi's work and some of the other current work. But I am suggesting that we need to help the ninja generation by relaxing interest rates on student loans and promoting an agenda and legislative policies. For example, loan forgiveness programs. It'll be very interesting to see if the current administration coming in, meaning Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris walk their talk. They have proposed that they're gonna have loan forgiveness programs. We'll see what they're gonna do. The other item is we wanna improve moral hazard relationships. In other words, for those of you that aren't familiar with moral hazard in ethics, it's all about trust, right? So we wanna improve those trust relationships between the creditors and debtors as An suggests. But I'm saying we need to go beyond On. We need to extend that, intensify that argument. It also establishes a common ground meaning the creditors and debtors mutually need to benefit. This is sort of a Howard Thurman argument. He talks about establishing a common ground in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, right? You gotta bring people together. They have to have a common ground, a common argument. And lastly, a new community. And this is a touchy one. 
This one feels a little soft, but I'm going to rely on the works of Jean-Luc Nancy and not in an inoperable community, right? We want to have a new community. Only way you can have a new community is if you have a common shared purpose. You can't have a common shared purpose unless you get people to come to the table and you let them be vulnerable. The problem is neoliberalism don't want to be vulnerable because it's all about money. Uh, last slide, please. So in summary, what am I suggesting? Two points. We need to continue to provide more robust research that is interdisciplinary and in nature and be mindful of the complexities that exist amongst creditor, creditor and debtor relationships. I'm also suggesting that we should remain mindful of maintaining an ethos of inclusiveness and integrity as we prepare students for uh, evaluating and examining uh, their student loan decisions. Any questions? Well, we'll, we'll deal with the questions later. Well, thank you very, 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 very much, uh, uh, Gerald. This is clearly an important uh, topic and uh, I'm sure it will generate a lot of uh, discussions at the end. But I think uh, just one key point that caught my attention here is really uh, the policy recommendations that you make. And I think these, these would be you know, very useful as uh, points of discussion. And the central issue that you raise is the issue of moralizing capitalism. Is capitalism, can, can it be moralized? And I think these are the issues that, that uh, will probably generate discussions later. But thank you very, very, very much for insightful presentation. Uh, the next uh, panelist is uh, Michael Austin and uh, his uh, paper is about uh, recent development in Pentecostal aesthetics. Uh, Michael will discern the differences and highlight the commonalities in the work of three major thinkers who have placed Pentecostal theology and practice into dialogue with aesthetics. And these are uh, Stephen and Felix Jagger, uh, Asian Crowley, and uh, of course, our own uh, Professor Niri, uh, Nimi Uruboko. Uh, Michael, you have the floor. All right, thank you for that introduction. Uh, don't have any PowerPoint or anything. I'll just be reading off of my uh, 18th century technology here. So if you hear any paper rustling, that's what that is. Um, as Pentecostalism's first century as a defined Christian tradition drew to a close, serious theological reflection on its belief and practice was coming into bloom. This paper seeks to collect and compare an emerging body of literature that represents the first forays of inquiry into the intersections of Pentecostalism and aesthetics. The possibility of this aesthetic line of inquiry has previously been touted by James K. Smith in his seminal volume, Thinking in Tongues, uh, wherein Smith affirmed that the affective nature of Pentecostal spirituality formed fertile epistemic grounds for a distinctive aesthetic. Affectivity in conversation with the materiality and narrativity of Pentecostal praxis excited Smith for the possibilities of Pentecostal art production that conceived of the world otherwise, especially through the medium of film. Uh, Edmund Rabarzik, uh, picked up this line of inquiry from Smith and further developed its possibilities. Rabarzik critiqued classical Pentecostalism for its iconoclastic and Gnostic tendencies more directly. He approached his, this problem through theological anthropology, emphasizing the material dimensions of Pentecostal experience in contrast to enlightenment dualism. Uh, he also highlighted the similarity between the openness to novelty experienced by expectant Pentecostals and that experienced by uh, inspired artists. Um, while both these projects successfully argued for the possibility of Pentecostal aesthetics, they are not sustained engagements with the subject. The major players in this paper are those thinkers who have begun to populate the territory that Smith and Rabarzik mapped. It will analyze the methods employed by Stephen Felix Yeager, Ashen Crawley, and Nimi Warboko. Uh, of, of interfacing Pentecostalism and aesthetics. Felix Yeager argues for a philosophy of art to encourage the use and production of visual art for and by Pentecostal churches. Crawley provides an aesthetic analysis of black Pentecostal practices as sensory cultivations of social possibilities that resist intellectual reduction. 
uh, where Aboko analyzes the implicit theology of Pentecostal practice, revealing how Pentecostalism instantiates radicalized grace through the practices of play. Uh, my organization of these three thinkers is not chronological, uh, but conceptual. Felix Yeager provides a theological and philosophical rationale for aesthetic practice. Crowley provides an analysis of aesthetic practice that allows that uh, is in opposition to theology and philosophy. And Waraboko pro, uh, incorporates the, sorry, Waraboko provides an analysis of aesthetic practice that allows for a revision of theology and philosophy. Waraboko therefore incorporates the polarities of the other two thinkers in terms of theory and practice. While all three thinkers approach the topic of aesthetics with radically different methods, I will argue that these three projects are united through their understanding of aesthetics as generative and participatory. Uh, so it's beginning with Felix Yeager. In his major work, Pentecostal Aesthetics, Stephen Felix Yeager constructs a framework in which Pentecostals can understand more holistically the role of the church in art and the role of art in the church. The animating force of the argument resides in Felix Yeager's desire for the church to consider art, especially visual art, with a seriousness that might counteract the tendency towards kitsch that much of the art employed by Pentecostal churches exhibits. The central thrust of Felix Yeager's argument is for a global Pentecostal philosophy of art and aesthetics that is ontologically grounded. He believes that a philosophical foundation must be laid before theological assertions can be risked. His argument begins therefore with a brief overview of the historical developments of aesthetics and art theory rather than theological prolegomena. Within this overview, he identifies the current postmodern milieu as a promising matrix for Pentecostal art since the hegemony of exclusionary meta-narratives has been deconstructed, thereby allowing for artistic voices that might otherwise be excluded from the mainstream. Uh, Felix Yeager identifies three core motifs within Pentecostalism that an aesthetic must account for, globalism, experiential spirituality, and pneumatology. He argues that a relativistic theory of art, such as the one provided by Arthur Danto, uh, provides a definition that can accommodate the Pentecostal distinctives that he has identified. According to Danto, there is no single characteristic uh, possessed by pieces of art that makes them art. Rather, the discourse of the art world determines, uh, defines and determines what art, what is art and what is not art. Felix Yeager believes that this theory can provide an ontological grounding for art that accommodates the global character of Pentecostalism. Having exposited an ontological definition that satisfies him, Felix Yeager then seeks to provide a take on inspiration and beauty from a Pentecostal perspective. Returning to his second central motif, experiential spirituality, Felix Yeager perceives a substantial connection between artistic inspiration and the inspiration of the spirit. He argues that uh, the spirit inspires the artistic imagination. Thus the, works, the, the work of the spirit collaborates with the artist and does not bypass the artist's imagination. Within this matrix, Felix Yeager proposes a process of discernment by which the operation of the spirit can be perceived in art by both Christians and non-Christians. Uh, this process calls for evaluating the artists within the context of their tradition um, in evaluating the ideolo ideological purposes of the art within that tradition, and then also the intuitive work of the spirit in confirming the operation of the spirit in that art. This contextual focus continues with Felix Yeager's examination of beauty in art. In keeping with the relativistic definition of art in general, he does not allow beauty a definitive place among artistic characteristics. Beauty is therefore contextually defined by the particular art world that produces a piece and should only be present if it is intrinsic to the piece's content. Uh, beauty must therefore be defined contextually by the Pentecostal art world and any objective claims must be relegated to faith. Uh, Felix Yeager argues that beauty within the cultural linguistic framework of, Pentecostal, of the Pentecostal art world is often eschatological. Beautiful art exhibits a foretaste of redeemed creation and thereby performs a prophetic function in the cultivation of hope. Having defined art in general and enumerated some characteristics of it, Felix Yeager turns his attention to the function of art. He frames his, this question anthropologically by examining the relational nature of humanity, which precludes a functional understanding of human vocation. Within the matrix of relationality, creativity is not a purposeful work, but a mat, but a extravagant play. This play is what allows for the eschatological vocation of art as the artist uh, imagines possibilities. 
Art as play most fully participates in the nature of humanity as gratuitous and relational. Playful art is art done for its own sake. While Felix Yeager believes that most art is characterized by its inherent value as play, some art, the arts of redemption, have value insofar as they lead to play. This art is liturgical and belongs to a matrix of devotional practice. Thus, these two types of art, pl the playful and the instrumental, are appropriate within their fitted venue of exhibition. Once again, demonstrating the relativist grounding for art that he initially posited. While Felix Yeager draws on the work of several theologians to provide content for the theoretical Pentecostal art world yet that he is positing, Rabarzik has pointed out that the primary foundation of Felix Yeager's text is philosophical. He provides an ontological grounding for the existence of art in a relativistic framework. The substance of art he posits is the societal discourse about art. Within this framework, Pentecostals are free to play with their distinctive theological commitments without totalizing the conversation or having their identity dissolved. Now moving on to Crawley, an aesthetic analysis of Black Pentecostal practice. Ashen Crawley's Black Pentecostal breath sits at the interdisciplinary plurality of Black study, which endeavors to trouble the production of pure knowledge by disciplinary separation. He argues that both theology and philosophy have a methodological impetus to pure knowledge and are based on the desire to produce pure distinctions, distinction, which is inherently exclusive and therefore inherently racialized. Crawley's method consists of his analysis of black Pentecostal practices, which are understood as aesthetic because of their status as sensual, affective, material experiences. The practices of black Pentecostalism resist any theoretical reduction that would deprive them of their status as living and breathing movements of the flesh. Black Pentecostal aesthetics, therefore, is the cultivation of alternative possibilities, the irreducible instantiation of life and breath that resists the social pressure to destroy black life by assimilation, servitude, or destruction. These unauthorized explosions of life are deemed excessive by the prevailing cultural logic. Crawley fr frames his work, therefore, as an atheological, aphilosophical project that gives voice to the irreducible excess of Black Pentecostal practice over and against the theological and philosophical attempts to make pure categorical distinctions. Uh, this resistance to purity is seen within Crawley's text itself, which draws on sources across disciplines and melds them into an argument that incorporates autobiography, history, and even fictional interludes. Uh, Crawley analyzes the Black Pentecostal practices of whooping, shouting, noise-making, and glossolalia. Through them, he traces the through line of breathing. Beneath the shadow of Eric Garner's dying words, the full political implications of breath come into focus. Uh, this is the foundation of Crawley's pneumatology, which is not a study of the third article of the Trinity, but of the actual enfleshed breath itself. Uh, this is an attempt to work against the repressive force of theological thought that would ignore the plentitude of the act of breathing and foreclose the otherwise possibility created by its practice. In whooping, the breath is aestheticized uh, in unnecessary syllables. Uh, the practice of shouting represents the recovery of the, the flesh from intell intellectualization and aesthetic judgments that would leave behind materiality. Uh, noise represents a surplus of sound that refuses to be incorporated into theological and philosophical schemes. And glossolalia is language pregnant with nothingness, laden with excess. It is a form of life that refuses to be constrained by accepted matrices of meaning and instead bears a plentitude that serves as a crisis, a crisis of logics that would commodify it. All of these practices for Crawley represent an imminent possibility of otherwise modes of social organization, which operate through an embodied agnosticism, a refusal to intellectualize or explain away the practice through theological rationale. Interestingly, when Felix Yeager reviewed Black Pentecostal Breath, he regularly framed Crawley's work according to standard theological axes, which are not present in the text, referring several times to practices connecting the practitioner to God or their use in sanctification. But the method of Black Pentecostal Breath's analysis is aesthetic in the sense that it uplifts the sensory and enfleshed experience over and against theological and philosophical thinking. Felix Yeager also critiques Crawley for not engaging with Pentecostalism on a more global scale. These distinctions help to illuminate the methodological differences between the two thinkers. Felix Yeager provides a philosophical framework 
that is relativized enough to incorporate the global character of Pentecostalism, while Crawley emphasizes the embodied particularity of certain communities of practice as a critique of any attempt to construct a philosophical framework. And finally, Waraboko in the aesthetics of grace. Unlike the pro 